Charles Ashmore's Trail by Ambrose Bierce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Charles Ashmore's Trail by Ambrose Bierce. The family of Christian Ashmore consisted of his wife, his mother, two grown daughters, and a son of sixteen years. They lived in Troy, New York, were well-to-do, respectable persons, and had many friends, some of whom, reading these lines, will doubtless learn for the first time the extraordinary fate of the young man. From Troy the Ashmores moved in 1871 or 1872 to Richmond, Indiana, and a year or two later to the vicinity of Quincy, Illinois, where Mr. Ashmore bought a farm and lived on it. At some little distance from the farmhouse was a spring with a constant flow of clear, cold water, whence the family derived its supply for domestic use at all seasons. On the evening of the ninth of November, 1878, at about nine o'clock, young Charles Ashmore left the family circle about the hearth, took a tin bucket, and started toward the spring. As he did not return, the family became uneasy, and, going to the door by which he had left the house, his father called without receiving an answer. He then lighted a lantern, and with the eldest daughter, Martha, who insisted on accompanying him, went in search. A light snow had fallen, obliterating the path, but making the young man's trail conspicuous. Each footprint was clearly defined. After going a little more than halfway, perhaps seventy-five yards, the father, who was in advance, halted, and, elevating his lantern, stood peering intently into the darkness ahead. "'What is the matter, father?' the girl asked. This was the matter. The trail of the young man had abruptly ended, and all beyond was smooth, unbroken snow. The last footprints were as conspicuous as any in the line. The very nail marks were distinctly visible. Mr. Ashmore looked upward, shading his eyes with his hat held between them and the lantern. The stars were shining. There was no cloud in the sky. He was denied the explanation which had suggested itself, doubtful as it would have been. A new snowfall with a limit so plainly defined. Taking a wide circuit round the ultimate tracks, so as to leave them undisturbed for further examination, the man proceeded to the spring, the girl following, weak and terrified. Neither had spoken a word of what both observed. The spring was covered with ice, hours old. Returning to the house, they noted the appearance of the snow on both sides of the trail its entire length. No tracks led away from it. The morning light showed nothing more. Smooth, spotless, unbroken, the shallow snow lay everywhere. Four days later the grief-stricken mother herself went to the spring for water. She came back and related that in passing the spot where the footprints had ended, she had heard the voice of her son and had been eagerly calling to him, wandering about the place, as she had fancied the voice to be now in one direction, now in another, until she was exhausted with fatigue and emotion. Questioned as to what the voice had said, she was unable to tell, yet averred that the words were perfectly distinct. In a moment the entire family was at the place, but nothing was heard and the voice was believed to be an hallucination caused by the mother's great anxiety and her disordered nerves. But for months afterwards, at irregular intervals of a few days, the voice was heard by several members of the family, and by others. All declared it was unmistakably the voice of Charles Ashmore. All agreed that it seemed to come from a great distance, faintly, 
yet with entire distinctness of articulation. Yet none could determine its direction, nor repeat its words. The intervals of silence grew longer and longer, the voice fainter and fainter, and by midsummer it was heard no more. If anyone knows the fate of Charles Ashmore, it is probably his mother. She is dead. The End of Charles Ashmore's Trail by Ambrose Bierce The Dead Woman's Photograph From 25 Ghost Stories by W. Bob Holland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Dead Woman's Photograph by W. Bob Holland. Virgil Holt is a photographer's assistant up in St. Paul, and a man of a good deal of taste. He has been in search of the picturesque all over the West and hundreds of miles to the north in Canada, and can speak three or four Indian dialects, and put a canoe through the rapids. That is to say, he is a man of an adventurous sort and no dreamer. He can fight well, and shoot well, and swim well enough to put up a winning race with the Indian boys, and he can sit all day in a saddle, and not dream about it at night. Wherever he goes, he uses his camera, the world, Hoyt is in the habit of saying to those who will sit with him when he smokes his pipe, was created in six days to be photographed. Man, and especially woman, was made for the same purpose. Clouds are not made to give moisture, nor trees to cast shade. We were created for the photographer. In short, Virgil Holt's view of the world is whimsical, and he doesn't like to be bothered with anything disagreeable. That is the reason that he loathes and detests going to a house of mourning to photograph a corpse. The horrible bad taste of it offends him partly, and partly he is annoyed, having to shoulder, even for a few moments, a part of someone's burden of sorrow. He doesn't like sorrow, and would willingly canoe five hundred miles up the cold Canadian rivers to get rid of it. Nevertheless, as assistant photographer, it is often his duty to do this very kind of thing. Not long ago he was sent for by a rich Jewish family at St. Paul to photograph the mother, who had just died. He was very much put out, but he went. He was taken to the front parlor, where the dead woman lay in her coffin. It was evident that there was some excitement in the household, and that a discussion was going on, but Holt wasn't concerned, and so he paid no attention to the matter. The daughter wanted the coffin turned on end, in order that the corpse might face the camera properly. But Holt said he could overcome the recumbent attitude, and make it appear that the face was taken in the position that it would naturally hold in life. And so they went out and left him alone with the dead. The face was a strong and positive one, such as may often be seen among Jewish matrons. Holt regarded it with some admiration, thinking to himself that she was a woman who had been used to having her own way. There was a strand of hair out of place, and he pushed it back from her brow. A bud lifted its head too high from among the roses on her breast, and spoiled the contour of the chin, so he broke it off. He remembered these things later very distinctly, and that his hand touched her bare face two or three times. Then he took the photographs and left the house. He was very busy at the time, and several days elapsed before he was able to develop the plates. He took them from the bath in which they had lain with a number of others, and went to work upon them. There were three plates, he having taken that number merely as a precaution against any accident. They came up well but as they developed he became aware of the existence of something in the photograph which had not been apparent to his eye. 
the mysterious always came under the head of the disagreeable with him and was therefore to be banished so he made only a few prints and put the things away out of sight he hoped that something would intervene to save him from attempting an explanation but it is a part of the general perplexity of life that things do not intervene as they ought and when they ought so one day his employer asked him what had become of those photographs he tried to evade him but it was futile and he got out the finished photographs and showed them to him the older man sat staring at them a long time halt he said at length you're a young man and i suppose you have never seen anything like this before but i have not exactly the same but a similar phenomenon have come my way a number of times since i went into the business and i want to tell you there are things in heaven and earth not dreamt of oh i know all the tommy rot cried holt angrily but when anything happens i want to know the reason why and how it was done all right said his employer then you might explain why and how the sun rises but he humored the young man sufficiently to examine with him the bath in which the plates were submerged and the plates themselves all was as it should be but the mystery was there and could not be done away with holt hoped against hope that the friends of the dead woman would somehow forget about the photographs but of course the wish was unreasonable and one day the daughter appeared and asked to see the photographs of her mother well to tell the truth stammered holt those didn't come out as well as we could have wished but let me see them persisted the lady i'd like to look at them anyway well now said holt trying to be soothing as he believed it was always best to be with women to tell the truth he was an ignoramus where women were concerned i think it would be better if you didn't see them there are reasons why he ambled on like this stupid man that he was and of course the jewess said she would see those pictures without any further delay so poor holt brought them out and placed them in her hand and then ran for the water pitcher and had to be at the bother of bathing her forehead to keep her from fainting for what the lady saw was this over the face and flowers and the head of the coffin fell a thick veil the edges of which touched the floor in some places it covered the features so well that no hint of them was visible there was nothing over my mother's face cried the lady at length not a thing acquiesced hoyt i know because i had occasion to touch her face just before i took the picture i put some of her hair back from her brow what does it mean then asked the lady you know better than i there is no explanation in science perhaps there is some in psychology well said the lady stammering a little and colored mother was a good woman but she always wanted her own way and she always had it too yes and she never would have her picture taken she didn't admire herself she said no one should ever see the pictures of her so said holt meditatively well she's kept her word hasn't she the two stood looking at the pictures for a time then holt pointed to the open blaze in the grate throw them in he commanded don't let your father see them and don't keep them yourself they wouldn't be good things to keep that's true enough said the lady slowly and she threw them in the fire and then virgil hoyt brought out the plates and broke them before her eyes and that was the end of it except that hoyt sometimes tells the story to those who sit beside him when his pipe is lighted the end of the dead woman's photograph by w bob holland The Diary of a Madman by Guy de Maupassant This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Louise J. Bell. The Diary of a Madman by Guy de Maupassant. He was dead. The head of a high tribunal, the upright magistrate, whose irreproachable life was a proverb in all the courts of France. Advocates, young counselors, judges had saluted, bowing low in token of profound respect, remembering that grand face, pale and thin, illumined by two bright, deep-set eyes. He had passed his life in pursuing crime and in protecting the weak. Swindlers and murderers had no more redoubtable enemy, for he seemed to read in the recesses of their soul their most secret thoughts. He was dead now, at the age of eighty-two. Honored by the homage and followed by the regrets of a whole people. Soldiers in red breeches had escorted him to the tomb, and men in white cravats had shed on his grave tears that seemed to be real. But listen to the strange paper found by the dismayed notary in the desk where the judge had kept filed the records of great criminals. It was entitled, Why? June 20th, 1851 I have just left court. I have condemned Blondel to death. Now, why did this man kill his five children? Frequently, one meets with people to whom killing is a pleasure. Yes, yes, it should be a pleasure. The greatest of all, perhaps. For is not killing most like creating? To make and to destroy. These two words contain the history of the universe, the history of all worlds, all that is, all. Why is it not intoxicating to kill? June 25th. To think that there is a being who lives, who walks, who runs. A being? What is a being? An animated thing which bears in it the principle of motion, and a will ruling that principle. It clings to nothing, this thing. Its feet are independent of the ground. It is a grain of life that moves on the earth. And this grain of life, coming I know not whence, one can destroy at one's will. Then nothing, nothing more. It perishes. It is finished. June 26th. Why, then, is it a crime to kill? Yes, why? On the contrary, it is the law of nature. Every being has the mission to kill. He kills to live, and he lives to kill. The beast kills without ceasing, all day, every instant of its existence. Man kills without ceasing to nourish himself. But since, in addition, he needs to kill for pleasure, he has invented the chase. The child kills the insects he finds, the little birds, 
all the little animals that come in his way. But this does not suffice for the irresistible need of massacre that is in us. It is not enough to kill beasts. We must kill man, too. Long ago, this need was satisfied by human sacrifice. Now, the necessity of living in society has made murder a crime. We condemn and punish the assassin. But, as we cannot live without yielding to this natural and imperious instinct of death, we relieve ourselves from time to time by wars. Then a whole nation slaughters another nation. It is a feast of blood, a feast that maddens armies and intoxicates the civilians. Women and children, who read by lamplight at night the feverish story of massacre. And do we despise those picked out to accomplish these butcheries of men? No, they are loaded with honors. They are clad in gold and in resplendent stuffs. They wear plumes on their heads and ornaments on their breasts. And they are given crosses, rewards, titles of every kind. They are proud, respected, loved by women, cheered by the crowd, solely because their mission is to shed human blood. They drag through the streets their instruments of death. And the passerby, clad in black, looks on with envy. For to kill is the great law put by nature in the heart of existence. There is nothing more beautiful and honorable than killing. June 30th. To kill is the law, because nature loves eternal youth. She seems to cry in all her unconscious acts, Quick, quick, quick! The more she destroys, the more she renews herself. July 2nd. It must be a pleasure unique and full of zest, to kill, to place before you a living, thinking being, to make therein a little hole, nothing but a little hole, and to see that red liquid flow which is the blood, which is the life. And then, to have before you only a heap of limp flesh, cold, inert, void of thought. August 5th. I, who have passed my life in judging, condemning, killing by words pronounced, killing by the guillotine those who had killed by the knife. If I should do as all the assassins whom I have smitten have done, I, I, who would know it? August 10th. Who would ever know? Who would ever suspect me? especially if I should choose a being I had no interest in doing away with. August 22nd. I could resist no longer. I have killed a little creature as an experiment, as a beginning. 
Jean, my servant, had a goldfinch in a cage hung in the office window. I sent him on an errand, and I took the little bird in my hand, in my hand where I felt its heart beat. It was warm. I went up to my room. From time to time, I squeezed it tighter. Its heart beat faster. It was atrocious and delicious. I was nearly choking it, but I could not see the blood. Then I took scissors, short nail scissors, and I cut its throat in three strokes, quite gently. It opened its bill. It struggled to escape me. But I held it. Oh, I held it. I could have held a mad dog. And I saw the blood trickle. And then I did as assassins do. Real ones. I washed the scissors and washed my hands. I sprinkled water and took the body, the corpse, to the garden to hide it. I buried it under a strawberry plant. It will never be found. Every day I can eat a strawberry from that plant. How one can enjoy life when one knows how. My servant cried. He thought his bird flown. How could he suspect me? Ah. August 25th. I must kill a man. I must. August 30th. It is done. But what a little thing. I had gone for a walk in the forest of Verne. I was thinking of nothing, literally nothing. See, a child on the road. A little child eating a slice of bread and butter. He stops to see me pass and says, Good day, Mr. President. And the thought enters my head. Shall I kill him? I answer, You are alone, my boy? Yes, sir. All alone in the wood? Yes, sir. The wish to kill him intoxicated me like wine. I approached him quite softly, persuaded that he was going to run away. And suddenly, I seized him by the throat. He held my wrists in his little hands, and his body writhed like a feather on the fire. Then he moved no more. I threw the body in the ditch, then some weeds on top of it. I returned home and dined well. What a little thing it was. In the evening I was very gay, light, rejuvenated, and passed the evening at the prefects. They found me witty. But I have not seen blood. I am not tranquil. 
August 31st. The body has been discovered. They are hunting for the assassin. Ah. September 1st. Two tramps have been arrested. Proofs are lacking. September 2nd. The parents have been to see me. They wept. Ah. October 6th. Nothing has been discovered. Some strolling vagabond must have done the deed. Ah, if I had seen the blood flow, it seems to me I should be tranquil now. October 10th. Yet another. I was walking by the river after breakfast, and I saw, under a willow, a fisherman asleep. It was noon. A spade, as if expressly put there for me, was standing in a potato field nearby. I took it. I returned. I raised it like a club. And with one blow of the edge, I cleft the fisherman's head. Oh, he bled, this one. Rose-colored blood. It flowed into the water quite gently. And I went away with a grave step. If I had been seen. Ah, oh, I should have made an excellent assassin. October 25th. The affair of the fisherman makes a great noise. His nephew, who fished with him, is charged with the murder. October 26th. The examining magistrate affirms that the nephew is guilty. Everybody in town believes it. Ah. Ah. October 27th. The nephew defends himself badly. He had gone to the village to buy bread and cheese, he declares. He swears that his uncle had been killed in his absence. Who would believe him? October 28th. The nephew has all but confessed. So much have they made him lose his head. Ah, justice. November 15th. There are overwhelming proofs against the nephew, who was his uncle's heir. I shall preside at the sessions. January 25th, 1852 To death, to death, to death. I have had him condemned to death. The Advocate General spoke like an angel. Ah, yet another. I shall go to see him executed. March 10th. It is done. They guillotined him this morning. He died very well, very well. That gave me pleasure. How fine it is to see a man's head cut off. Now I shall wait. I can wait. 
it would take such a little thing to let myself be caught. The manuscript contained more pages, but told of no new crime. Alienist physicians, to whom the awful story has been submitted, declare that there are in the world many unknown madmen, as adroit and as terrible as this monstrous lunatic. End of The Diary of a Madman Recording by Louise J. Bell Sebastopol, California An Eye for an Eye by William A. McGarry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. An Eye for an Eye by William A. McGarry An almost imperceptible zephyr from the elm-shaded avenue added through the raised windows of Clayton's beautiful mansion, swaying the silken curtains ever so slightly. A little cloud of pungent powder smoke lazily rose, disintegrated, and was carried away. Clayton, in evening dress, stood stupidly over the prone bodies of Marsden, his lifelong chum, and she who had been his wife. The revolver, given him by the dead man on their first trip after big game, was in his hand. It was an automatic, needing but the slightest pressure to let loose its messengers of death. A pool of blood from the breast of the woman stained the carpet a darker hue. She lay as she had fallen, save her right arm, which, thrown up in protection, had limply relaxed and settled to her side. Her heaving breast had grown still, and no sound but the breathing of Clayton broke the intense stillness. Marsden, his features distorted in the death grin of fear, had not moved. His body lay crumpled as though every bone were broken. A bell clanged somewhere in the house, but Clayton took no heed. It was followed by a crash, and a squad of bluecoats, led by the precinct captain, entered, with drawn revolvers. The automatic was taken from Clayton's unresisting hand, and he was manacled. No questions were asked. They were unnecessary. Time passed unnoticed, and Clayton sat mute and unseeing behind the narrow bars. He slept and ate mechanically. The protestations of friendship and offers of help, which had plenteously at first reached his cell, passed without answer, and now he was left severely alone. Only once did he speak, just before the jury went out. The unwritten law was his defense. He said but little, a word picture of his life as it had been before his one-time friend stepped in, a sketch of his ideals, the feelings that came to him when he saw his home had been destroyed. That was all. Then again he sank into the chair, silent, morose. Presently a stir followed by a death-like hush masked the return of the jury. A deep voice sounded unnecessarily loud in the stifling stillness of the courtroom. Not guilty, it said. As one in a dream, Clayton walked from the place, he submitted passively to congratulations. Dully, without thought, he answered business questions from his lawyer, whose face bore a look of conscious pride at the victory. A taxicab, called by a friend, stopped at the curb to receive him. He was sharply reminded that he had not paid the fare as he left the vehicle before the door of his home. Home. 
the unspoken word jarred his nerves things were sadly out of place why did this picture persist in staring at him why this old japanese chair his last birthday gift to her always bar his way all the house seemed wrapped in an atmosphere of gloom and despair voices called from corners behind chairs and the suddenly lighted electrics revealed no one petulantly he invaded the upper regions of the house a drawer in his small bureau slid open creaking to his pull a blue burnished automatic mate to that other sparkled before his eyes unthinkingly his fingers closed over it as in a dream he wandered back to that room he had left months ago manacled accused he gazed unseeing into the chilly blue barrel of the weapon in his hand his eyes strayed around then fell on the dark stain on the rug he forced himself to look away then he found the stain again before his eyes it seemed to mock him and once he thought he heard a chuckle his blood froze in his veins as it dissolved took shape and showed her face for many minutes he gazed into her eyes they were sad and reproachful perhaps after all he had been wrong hasty he could see her as she looked that first day they met then as she looked on their wedding day and he had killed her perhaps without cause he forgot that the jury of his peers had acquitted him forgot everything except that the fear of death to which he had sent her was on him summoning all his will he tore his gaze away from the dark ominous stain again his eyes fastened on the blued muzzle of the revolver nervously toying with the safety catch his fingers unloosed it the whir of an automobile passing on the avenue grew less distinguishable then it took strength and swelled into an eerie moan of anguish it sounded to him like an accusation again he called on his will and unconsciously his muscles tightened answering the leaping surge of his heart the double grip of the automatic released a spring hidden in its perfect steel heart as quick as thought itself the mechanism obeyed its law an empty shell flew out with a snap and there was a dull thud then silence outside a blue coat idly swinging his club and ruminating on the law which allowed a rich man to go free suddenly stiffened as the hound at bay all sign of laziness left him and he bounded up the steps of the mansion two at a time a whistle sounded for the second time the massive front door was forced open for the second time a squad of police entered the gorgeously furnished parlor of clayton's home an odor of powder smoke met them strong and pungent a rapidly enlarging pool of blood was darkening the outlines of the already dark ugly stain on the rug open-mouthed the blue coat stood tense and silent a rattling of curtain rings boomed almost deafening in their ears silently the captain he who had led that other squad turned and gestured and the men filed out leaving one on guard again all was silent save for the whispering breeze fanning the smoke and rustling the silken curtains the end of an eye for an eye by william a mcgarry The Face That Stared Back at Blaisdell by Edwin Carty Rennick. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. 
The Face That Stared Back at Blaisdell by Edward Carty Rannick. These are the facts in Blaisdell's queer case, taken from a communication addressed to his best friend, Dr. Maynard Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton vouchsafes no explanation, nor do I. Indeed, there are phenomena in this world that cannot be explained, as Hamlet pointed out to Horatio in the much quoted speech. The statements given here were contained in a carefully written paper in Blaisdell's handwriting that was found in Blaisdell's desk by Dr. Hamilton several days after the man's death. From this paper, he has pieced together the extraordinary narrative that follows. 1. Blaisdell thinks it must have been shortly after midnight when he fell asleep. Horrible nightmares racked him as he tossed upon his bed, and one of them was so frightful that he woke up with a scream, or thought he did. At any rate, he suddenly found himself in the center of his bedchamber, dressing with feverish haste. And here is the queer part of the narrative, for he affirms that while he was dressing, another man lay in his bed, an exact counterpart of himself. This other ego lay quietly asleep, his head on his arm. Blaisdell studied him carefully and said he felt as a locust must feel when he looks at his outworn shell. All the time he was dressing, Blaisdell said he seemed to be impelled to haste by queer promptings that were as insistent as if some person were at his elbow saying, Hurry, hurry. He finished his dressing in mad excitement and then hurried out of the room, casting a backward glance over his shoulder at his sleeping counterpart. Once outside his apartment house in Gramercy Park, Blaisdell hurried along, his persistent mentor seeming to walk at his elbow. A puzzling feature of this nocturnal prowl was that he felt a sense of familiarity, a feeling that he was on his way to keep an appointment that could not be postponed. The streets were deserted except for an occasional prowler or a patrolman who made the night echo with sharp blows from his club as he struck a metal post occasionally to remind the unlawful that the law was abroad. On, on, hurried Blaisdell. By this time he had lost all sense of location, but he was aware that he was in a downtown section of New York, a section he had never visited during his waking moments but although he knew that he had never been in this neighborhood during his conscious moments he felt that he was on familiar territory finally he paused in front of an old three-story brownstone front residence in washington square paused with the air of one who has reached his destination he walked up the steps and let himself into the house with a pass key nor did it seem strange to him that he had a pass key for a house that he had never visited during his waking moments. It all seemed ordinary and commonplace. Blaisdell quietly mounted the stairs until he reached the second floor, and there he paused before a closed door, overcome by a suffocating sense of fear and repugnance. He half turned away and then retraced his steps as if fascinated. Something seemed to warn him away from the ominous door, behind which lay a mystery that the everyday Blaisdell millionaire and bon vivant did not care to penetrate but which this nocturnal prowling blaisdell seemed to insist upon then without any conscious volition on his part blaisdell placed his hand on the knob and the door opened noiselessly he found himself in a large square living room tastefully furnished and lined with built-in bookcases full of handsomely bound volumes Everywhere he looked he saw bizarre weapons of defense, and men in Chinese and Japanese armor looked threateningly at him from dim corners of the room. It was either the apartment of an art connoisseur or a globetrotter with a propensity for the unusual. From this room he stepped into a bedchamber and then started back with a little gasp. It was a luxuriously furnished room that appeared to have been transplanted by Aladdin's wonderful lamp straight from the perfume-scented Orient. Blaisdell advanced further into the room, and his feet sank into a wonderful, moss-like carpet. 
to one side of the room was an old-fashioned four-poster bed topped by a crimson canopy in the exact center of this bed lay a man asleep with his mouth open there was something familiar about the sleeper and blaisdell drew closer and gazed at him steadily he was an oldish man with a sallow complexion and a wisp of a beard that was slightly tinged with gray the ghost of a smile lingered upon his lips a cruel smile that sleep could not make gentle or mirthful and as he gazed upon the stranger rage grew in blaisdell's heart a rage so furious that it almost suffocated him without a moment's hesitation he seized the sleeper by the throat and began throttling him the man struggled furiously his eyes popped open and gazed up at blaisdell's with a look of freezing despair a slight froth gathered upon his purpled lips and he squirmed and writhed like a snake in blaisdell's unrelenting grasp god how he struggled blaisdell's fingers sank into the throat as if it were satin and then suddenly there were no more struggles the body fell back inertly as the steel-like fingers relaxed blaisdell pulled the bedclothes over the mask of horror and stole quietly from the room he felt that his errand had been accomplished as he went back over the route that he had just pursued he felt again that weird sense of unfamiliarity that had at first possessed him and this feeling of strangeness increased as he neared his own apartment house he walked in and hurried past the sleeping hall boy without waking him once inside his apartment he rushed into the bedroom but his counterpart was gone blaisdell undressed with fumbling fingers but his head had scarcely touched the pillow before he was sound asleep. Two, A shaft of sunlight fell across Blaisdell's face, and he woke with a shudder. Ugh, what a horrible nightmare, he said aloud. I feel as if I actually did kill that man. Then he yawned and rang for his valet. After a casual breakfast, he was glancing through the newspaper, when he received the shock that changed him from a careless clubman to a nervous wreck queer murder in washington square that was the headline he read and then followed the account of the crime a private policeman while doing his rounds had found the front door of an old brownstone residence open and had investigated on the second floor he had found another door ajar and going in had found a man lying in a queer bed that was overhung by a red canopy he was about to steal quietly out when something in the huddled attitude of the sleeper attracted his attention and he then discovered that the man had been strangled the marks of fingers were plainly visible upon his throat the police investigation had established the fact that the man's name was stephen r rollins a famous traveler and authority on spiritualism he had lived for years in the orient and a monograph of his on occult phenomenon had attracted much attention in scientific circles my god said blaisdell as the paper fell from his trembling hands my god did i go to that man's apartment while i was in the grip of a nightmare and murdered him did i these questions nearly drove him frantic what should he do what course of action was there for him to pursue if he went to the police and told him that he herman blaisdell descended of a fine old new york family had gone forth into the night and killed a man he had never seen before in his sleep what would they think of him they would probably shrug their shoulders and advise him to consult an alienist and yet this man this stephen r rollins was dead and his description and that of his apartment coincided in every detail with the place that blaisdell had visited in his dream but was it a dream and who was the other man that lay in his bed as he went out these questions revolved in his mind like a vicious circle almost driving him insane blaisdell aged after that he looked ten years older 
and his friends were alarmed about him dr hamilton advised a change of environment and rigorous physical exercise otherwise he would not be responsible for the consequences the man jumped at every sound and had a mortal terror of the night he would put off going to bed until the latest possible moment and then always slept with a light in his room sometimes his valet would come quavering to his bedside in the night frightened out of his wits by the frightful screams from blaisdell i didn't do it i didn't do it i couldn't have done it he would scream his eyes staring the thing is impossible the thing is impossible when these spells were upon him he would shake and it would finally be necessary for his valet to give him a sleeping powder these things became noised abroad and he resigned from his clubs and went no more and declined all invitations he was a broken man a hopeless hypochondriac just a morbid victim of nerves or drink said his friends and dropped him things went on like this for months and then one day blaisdell read another item in the newspaper that dumbfounded him it detailed the arrest of a man named franklin sears who was charged with the murder of stephen r rollins but he couldn't have murdered him i murdered him murdered him in my sleep mumbled blaisdell that afternoon one of the sensational newspapers published a picture of franklin sears and blaisdell cried aloud in new fright his valet found him with the newspaper in his hands mouthing and trembling his nerves vibrating like a taut piano wire for the face that stared back at blaisdell from the front page was his own face yet franklin sears name was under it three later sears confessed to the murder he told the police that he and rollins had been chums and college mates rollins had fallen madly in love with sears beautiful sister and had persuaded her to go away with him under promise of marriage they had gone to south america where rollins had amassed a fortune and had then visited the orient she begged rollins to make her his wife but he refused and finally deserted her a serious illness followed and she sent for her brother who promised her that he would not rest until her betrayer had been brought to book she died assured that he would avenge her and he had kept his word although he had to trail rollins all over the world before he finally ran him down in washington square blaisdell followed the developments in the sears case with absorbed attention he read the newspaper feverishly and finally decided that he could stand the suspense no longer he determined to go to the tombs confront his counterpart and tell him the story of the nightmare surely there was an explanation of it all there must be an explanation he had decided to visit sears the next day when the last queer thing happened in the tragic series of happenings on the morning of blaisdell's intended visit dr hamilton read in his morning newspaper that franklin sears the murderer of stephen r rollins had committed suicide in the tombs by hanging himself to one of the bars by his suspenders the paper commented upon the somewhat unusual fact that the prisoner's watch was found on his body and that it had stopped at three o'clock it was just a few minutes past three when the body was discovered still warm dr hamilton had scarcely finished reading this account when his telephone bell rang the excited voice of blaisdell's valet asked him to come at once to his master's apartment as something terrible had happened he responded at once and when he was ushered into blaisdell's bedroom by the white-faced valet he saw at once that he could do nothing further for his friend blaisdell was dead and it was very evident from the stiffness of his body that he had been dead for many hours it ain't his being dead that's so terrible said the trembling valet it's it's well look there he pointed to the throat of the dead man 
there was the distinct mark of a rope upon it and this mark extended clear around his neck he he couldn't have hung himself quavered the valet because i was the first person who saw him and there ain't any rope some unaccountable impulse made dr hamilton pick up blaisdell's watch from the dresser it had stopped running the hands recording the hour of three o'clock the end of the face that stared back at blaisdell by edwin carty rank A Ghost's Tale by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tommy Hersant, Carlsbad, California. A Ghost's Tale by Mark Twain. I took a large room far up Broadway in a huge old building whose upper stories had been wholly unoccupied for years until I came. The place had long been given up to dust and cobwebs, to solitude and silence. I seemed groping among the tombs and invading the privacy of the dead that first night I climbed up to my quarters. For the first time in my life, a superstitious dread came over me, and as I turned a dark angle of the stairway and an invisible cobweb swung its lazy woof in my face and clung there, I shuddered as one who had encountered a phantom. I was glad enough when I reached my room and locked out the mold and the darkness, a cheery fire was burning in the grate, and I sat down before it with a comforting sense of relief. For two hours I sat there, thinking of bygone times, recalling old scenes and summoning half-forgotten faces out of the mists of the past, listening in fancy to voices that long ago grew silent for all time and to once familiar songs that nobody sings now. And as my reverie softened down to a sadder and sadder pathos, the shrieking of the winds outside softened to a wail. The angry beating of the rain against the panes diminished to a tranquil patter, and one by one the noises in the street subsided, until the hurrying footsteps of the last belated straggler died away in the distance and left no sound behind. The fire had burned low. A sense of loneliness crept over me. I arose and undressed, moving on tiptoe about the room, doing stealthily what I had to do, as if I were environed by sleeping enemies whose slumbers it would be fatal to break. I covered up in bed and lay, listening to the rain and wind and the faint creaking of distant shutters, till they lulled me to sleep. I slept profoundly, but how long I do not know. All at once I found myself awake and filled with a shuddering expectancy. All was still, all but my own heart. I could hear it beat. Presently the bedclothes began to slip away, slowly toward the foot of the bed, as if someone were pulling them. I could not stir. I could not speak. Still, the blanket slipped deliberately away till my breast was uncovered. Then, with a great effort, I seized them and drew them over my head. I waited, listened, waited. Once more. That steady pull began, and once more I lay torpid, a century of dragging seconds till my breast was naked again. At last I roused my energies and snatched the covers back to their place and held them with a strong grip. I waited. By and by I felt a faint tug and took a fresh grip. 
The tug strengthened to a steady strain. It grew stronger and stronger. My hold parted, and for the third time, the blanket slid away. I groaned. An answering groan came from the foot of the bed. Beaded drops of sweat stood upon my forehead. I I was more dead than alive. Presently, I heard a heavy footstep in my room. The, The step of an elephant, it seemed to me. It was not like anything human, but it was moving from me. There was relief in that. I heard it approach the door, pass out without moving bolt or lock, and wander away among the dismal corridors, straining the floors and joists till they creaked again as it passed, and then silence reigned once more. When my excitement had calmed, I said to myself, This is a dream, simply a hideous dream. And so I lay thinking it over until I convinced myself that it was a dream. And then a comforting laugh relaxed my lips and I was happy again. I got up and struck a light, and when I found that the locks and bolts were just as I had left them, another soothing laugh welled in my heart and rippled from my lips. I took my pipe and lit it, and was just sitting down before the fire, when down went the pipe out of my nerveless fingers. The blood forsook my cheeks, and my placid breathing was cut short with a gasp. In the ashes on the hearth, side by side with my own bare footprint, was another, so vast that in comparison mine was but an infant's. Then I had had a visitor, and the elephant tread was explained. I put out the light and returned to bed, palsied with fear. I lay a long time, peering into the darkness and listening. Then I heard a grating noise overhead, like the dragging of a heavy body across the floor. Then the throwing down of the body and the shaking of my windows in response to the concussion. In distant parts of the building, I heard the muffled slamming of doors. I heard, at at intervals, stealthy footsteps creeping in and out among the corridors and up and down the stairs. Sometimes these noises approached my door, hesitated, and went away again. I heard the clanking of chains faintly in remote passages and listened while the clanking grew nearer, while it wearily climbed the stairways, marking each move by the loose surplus of chain that fell with an accented rattle upon each succeeding step as the goblin that bore it advanced. I heard muttered sentences half-uttered screams that seemed smothered violently, and the swish of invisible garments, the rush of invisible wings. Then I became conscious that my chamber was invaded, that I was not alone. I heard sighs and breathings about my bed and mysterious whisperings. Three little spheres of soft phosphorescent light appeared on the ceiling directly over my head, clung and glowed there a moment, and then dropped two of them upon my face and one upon the pillow. They spattered liquidly and felt warm. Intuition told me that they had turned to gouts of blood as they fell. I needed no light to satisfy myself of that. 
Then I saw pallid faces, dimly luminous, and white uplifted hands, floating bodiless in the air floating a moment and then disappearing. The whispering ceased, and the voices and the sounds and all a solemn stillness followed. I waited and listened. I felt that I must have light or die. I was weak with fear. I slowly raised myself toward a sitting posture, and my face came in contact with a clammy hand. All strength went from me, apparently, and I fell back like a stricken invalid. Then I heard the rustle of a garment. It seemed to pass to the door and go out. When everything was still once more, I crept out of bed, sick and feeble, and lit the gas with a hand that trembled as if it were aged with a hundred years. The light brought some little cheer to my spirits. I sat down and fell into a dreary contemplation of that great footprint in the ashes. By and by, its outlines began to waver and grow dim. I glanced up, and the broad gas flame was slowly wilting away. In the same moment, I heard that elephantine tread again. I noted its approach nearer and nearer along the musty halls, and dimmer and dimmer the light waned. The tread reached my very door and paused. The light had dwindled to a sickly blue, and all things about me lay in a spectral twilight. The door did not open, and yet... I felt a faint gust of air fan my cheek and presently was conscious of a huge, cloudy presence before me. I watched it with fascinated eyes. A pale glow stole over the thing. Gradually, its cloudy folds took shape. An arm appeared. Then legs, then a body, and last a great sad face looked out of the vapor. Stripped of its filmy housings, naked, muscular, and calmly, the majestic Cardiff giant loomed above me. I said, why, is it nobody but you? Do you know I have been scared to death for the last two or three hours? Oh, I am most honestly glad to see you. I, I wish I had a chair. Here, here, don't try to sit down in that thing. But it was too late. He was in it before I could stop him, and down he went. I never saw a chair shivered so in my life. Stop, stop, you'll ruin it. Too late again. There was another crash, and another chair was resolved into its original elements. Confound it, haven't you got any judgment at all? Do you want to ruin all the furniture on the place? Here, here, you petrified fool. But it was no use. Before I could arrest him, he had sat down on the bed, and it was a melancholy ruin. Now what sort of a way is that to do? First you come lumbering about the place, bringing a legion of vagabond goblins along with you to worry me to death, and then when I overlook an indelicacy of costume, which would not be tolerated anywhere by cultivated people except in a respectable theater, and not even there if the nudity were of your sex, you repay me by wrecking all the furniture you can find to sit down on, and why will you? 
You damage yourself as much as you do me. You have broken off the end of your spinal column and littered up the floor with chips of your arms till the place looks like a marble yard. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You are big enough to know better. Well, I will not break any more furniture. But what am I to do? I have not had a chance to sit down for a century. And the tears came into his eyes. Poor devil, I said. I should not have been so harsh with you. "'And you are an orphan, too, no doubt. "'But sit down on the floor here. "'Nothing else can stand your weight. "'And besides, we cannot be sociable with you "'away up there above me. "'I want you down where I can perch "'on this high counting house stool "'and gossip with you face to face.' So he sat down on the floor and lit a pipe, which I gave him, threw one of my red blankets over his shoulders, inverted my sits bath on his head, helmet fashion, and made himself picturesque and comfortable. Then he crossed his ankles while I renewed the fire and exposed the flat honeycombed bottoms of his prodigious feet to the grateful warmth. What is the matter with the bottom of your feet and the back of your legs that they are gouged up so? Infernal chillblains. Uh, I caught them clear up to the back of my head, and roosting out there under Newell's farm. But I love the place. I love it as one loves his old home. There is no peace for me like the peace I feel when I am there. We talked along for half an hour, and then I noticed that he looked tired and spoke of it. Tired, he said. Well, I should think so. And now I will tell you all about it, since you have treated me so well. I am the spirit of the petrified man that lies across the street there in the museum. I am the ghost of the cart of giant. I can have no rest, no peace, till they have given that poor body burial again. Now, what was the most natural thing for me to do to make men satisfy this wish? Terrify them into it. Haunt the place where the body lay. So I haunted the museum night after night. I even got other spirits to help me. But it did no good, for nobody ever came to the museum at midnight. Then it occurred to me to come over the way and haunt this place a little. I felt that if I ever got a hearing, I must succeed, for I had the most efficient company that perdition could furnish. Night after night we have shivered around through these mildewed halls, dragging the chains, groaning, whispering, tramping up and down stairs, till, to tell you the truth, I am almost worn out. But when I saw a light in your room tonight, I roused my energies again and went at it with a deal of the old freshness. But I am tired out, entirely fagged out. Oh, give me, I beseech you, give me some hope. I lit off my perch in a burst of excitement and exclaimed, This transcends everything, everything that ever did occur. Why, you poor blundering old fossil, you have had all your trouble for nothing. You have been haunting a plaster cast of yourself. The real Cardiff giant is in Albany. 
A fact. The original fraud was ingeniously and fraudfully duplicated and exhibited in New York as the only genuine Cardiff giant to the unspeakable disgust of the owners of the real Colossus at the very same time that the latter was drawing crowds at a museum in Albany. Confound it! Don't you know your own remains? I never saw such an eloquent look of shame, of pitiable humiliation, overspread a countenance before. The petrified man rose slowly to his feet and said, Honestly, is that true? As true as I am sitting here. He took the pipe from his mouth and laid it on the mantel, then stood irresolute a moment, unconsciously from old habit, thrusting his hands where his pantaloon pockets should have been, and meditatively dropping his chin on his breast, and finally said, Well, I never felt so absurd before. The petrified man has sold everybody else, and now the mean fraud has ended by selling its own ghost. My son, if there is any charity left in your heart for a poor friendless phantom like me— Don't let this get out. (sighs) Think how you would feel if you had made such an ass of yourself. I heard his stately tramp die away, step by step down the stairs and out into the deserted street, and felt sorry that he was gone. (laughs) Poor fellow and sorrier still that he had carried off my red blanket and my bathtub. End of A Ghost's Tale A Grammatical Ghost by Elia Wilkinson Petey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Grammatical Ghost There was only one possible objection to the drawing room, and that was the occasional presence of Miss Carew, and only one possible objection to Miss Carew, and that was that she was dead. She had been dead twenty years as a matter of fact and record, and to the last of her life, sacredly preserved the treasures and traditions of her family, a family bound up, as it is quite unnecessary to explain to any one in good society, with all that is most venerable and heroic in the history of the Republic. Miss Carew never relaxed the proverbial hospitality of her house, even when she remained its sole representative. She continued to preside at her table with dignity and state, and to set an example of excessive modesty and gentle decorum to a generation of restless young women. It is not likely that, having lived a life of such irreproachable gentility as this, Miss Carew would have the bad taste to die in any way not pleasant to mention in fastidious society. She could be trusted to the last, not to outrage those friends who quoted her as an exemplar of propriety. She died very unobtrusively of an affection of the heart one June morning while trimming her rose trellis, and her lavender-colored print was not even rumpled when she fell, nor were more than the tips of her little bronze slippers visible. Isn't it dreadful, said the Philadelphians, that the property should go to a very, very distant cousin in Iowa or somewhere else on the frontier, about whom nobody knows anything at all? The Carew treasures were packed in boxes and sent away into the Iowa wilderness. The Carew traditions were preserved by the Historical Society. The Carew property, standing in one of the most umbrageous and aristocratic suburbs of Philadelphia, was rented to all manner of folk, anybody who had money enough to pay the rental, and society entered its doors no more. 
but at last, after twenty years, and when all save the oldest Philadelphians had forgotten Miss Lydia Carew, the very, very distant cousins appeared. He was quite in the prime of life, and so agreeable and unassuming, that nothing could be urged against him save his patronymic, which, being Boggs, did not commend itself to the euphemists. With him were two maiden sisters, ladies of excellent taste and manners, who restored the Carew china to its ancient cabinets, and replaced the Carew pictures upon the walls with additions not out of keeping with the elegance of these heirlooms. Society, with a magnanimity almost dramatic, overlooked the name of Boggs, and called. All was well, at least to an outsider all seemed to be well, but in truth there was a certain distress in the old mansion, and in the hearts of the well-behaved Mrs. Boggses. It came about most unexpectedly. The sisters had been sitting upstairs looking out at the beautiful grounds of the old place, and marveling at the violets, which lifted their heads from every possible cranny about the house, and talking over the cordiality which they had been receiving by those upon whom they had no claim, and they were filled with amiable satisfaction. Life looked attractive. They had often been grateful to Miss Lydia Carew for leaving their brother her fortune. Now they felt even more grateful to her. She had left them a social position, one which, even after twenty years of desuetude, was fit for use. They descended the stairs together, with arms clasped about each other's waists, and as they did so presented a placid and pleasing sight. They entered their drawing-room with the intention of brewing a cup of tea, and drinking it in calm sociability in the twilight. But as they entered the room, they became aware of the presence of a lady who was already seated at their table, regarding their old Wedgwood with the air of a connoisseur. There were a number of peculiarities about this intruder. To begin with, she was hatless, quite as if she were a habitué of the house, and was costumed in a prim, lilac-colored lawn of the style of two decades past. But a greater peculiarity was the resemblance this lady bore to a faded daguerreotype. If looked at one way, she was perfectly discernible. If looked at another, she went out in a sort of blur. Notwithstanding this comparative invisibility, she exhaled a delicate perfume of sweet lavender, very pleasing to the nostrils of the Mrs. Boggses, who stood looking at her in gentle and unprotesting surprise. I beg your pardon, began Miss Prudence, the younger of the Mrs. Boggses, but, but at this moment the daguerreotype became a blur, and Miss Prudence found herself addressing space. The Mrs. Boggses were irritated. They had never encountered any mysteries in Iowa. They began an impatient search behind doors and portieres, and even under sofas, though it was quite absurd to suppose that a lady recognizing the merits of the Carew Wedgwood would so far forget herself as to crawl under a sofa. When they had given up all hope of discovering the intruder, they saw her standing at the far end of the drawing room, critically examining a watercolor marine. The elder Miss Boggs started toward her with stern decision, but the little daguerreotype turned with a shadowy smile, became a blur, and an imperceptibility. Miss Boggs looked at Miss Prudence Boggs. If there were ghosts, said Miss Prudence Boggs, this would be the ghost of Lydia Carew. The twilight was settling into blackness, and Miss Boggs nervously lit the gas, while Miss Prudence ran for other teacups, preferring, for reasons superfluous to mention, not to drink out of the Carew china that evening. The next day, on taking up her embroidery frame, Miss Boggs found a number of old-fashioned cross-stitches added to her Kensington. Prudence, she knew, would never have degraded herself by taking a cross-stitch, and the parlor-maid was above taking such a liberty. Miss Boggs mentioned the incident that night at a dinner given by an ancient friend of the Carews. Oh, that's the work of Lydia Carew, without a doubt, cried the hostess. She visits every new family that moves to the house, but she never remains more than a week or two with anyone. It must be that she disapproves of them, suggested Miss Boggs. I think that's it, said the hostess. She doesn't like their china or their fiction. I hope she'll disapprove of us, added Miss Prudence. The hostess belonged to a very old Philadelphian family, and she shook her head. I should say it was a compliment for even the ghost of Lydia Carew to approve of one, she said severely. 
The next morning, when the sisters entered their drawing room, there were numerous evidences of an occupant during their absence. The sofa pillows had been rearranged so that the effect of their grouping was less bizarre than that favored by the Western women. A hard little Buddhist idol, with its eyes fixed on its abdomen, had been chastely hidden behind a Dresden shepherdess, as unfit for the scrutiny of polite eyes. And on the table where Miss Prudence did work in watercolors after the fashion of the Impressionists lay a prim and impossible composition representing a moss rose and a number of heart's ease colored with that caution which modest spinster artists instinctively exercise. Oh, there's no doubt it's the work of Miss Lydia Carew, said Miss Prudence contemptuously. There's no mistaking the drawing of that rigid little rose. Don't you remember those wreaths and bouquets framed among the pictures we got when the Carew pictures were sent to us? I gave some of them to an orphan asylum and burned up the rest. Hush, cried Miss Boggs involuntarily. If she heard you, it would hurt her feelings terribly. Of course, I mean, and she blushed, it might hurt her feelings, but how perfectly ridiculous. It's impossible. Miss Prudence held up the sketch of the moss rose. That may be impossible in an artistic sense, but it is a palpable thing. Bosh, cried Miss Boggs. But, protested Miss Prudence, how do you explain it? I don't, said Miss Boggs, and left the room. That evening the sisters made a point of being in the drawing room before the dusk came on, and of lighting the gas at the first hint of twilight. They didn't believe in Miss Lydia Carew, but still they meant to be beforehand with her. They talked with unwonted vivacity and in a louder tone than was their custom, but as they drank their tea, even their utmost verbosity could not make them oblivious to the fact that the perfume of sweet lavender was stealing insidiously through the room. They tacitly refused to recognize this odor and all that it indicated, when suddenly, with a sharp crash, one of the old Carew teacups fell from the tea table to the floor and was broken. The disaster was followed by what sounded like a sigh of pain and dismay. I didn't suppose Miss Lydia Carew would ever be as awkward as that, cried the younger Miss Boggs petulantly. Prudence, said her sister with a stern accent, please try not to be a fool. Your theory wouldn't be so bad, said Miss Prudence, half laughing and half crying, if there were any sleeves to my dress, but as you see there aren't. And then Miss Prudence had something as near hysterics as a healthy young woman in the West can have. I wouldn't think such a perfect lady as Lydia Carew, she ejaculated between her sobs, would make herself so disagreeable. You may talk about good breeding all you please, but I call such intrusion exceedingly bad taste. I have a horrible idea that she likes us and means to stay with us. She left those other people because she did not approve of their habits or their grammar. It would be just our luck to please her. Well, I like your egotism, said Miss Boggs. However, the view Miss Prudence took of the case appeared to be the right one. Time went by and Miss Lydia Carew still remained. When the ladies entered their drawing room, they would see the little lady-like daguerreotype revolving itself into a blur before one of the family portraits. Or they noticed that the yellow sofa cushion, toward which she appeared to feel a peculiar antipathy, had been dropped behind the sofa upon the floor. Or that one of Jane Austen's novels, which none of the family ever read, had been removed from the bookshelves and left open upon the table. I cannot be reconciled to it, complained Miss Boggs to Miss Prudence. I wish we had remained in Iowa, where we belong. Of course I don't believe in the thing. No sensible person would, but still, I cannot become reconciled. But their liberation was to come, and in a most unexpected manner. A relative by marriage visited them from the West. He was a friendly man and had much to say, so he talked all through dinner and afterward followed the ladies to the drawing room to finish his gossip. The gas in the room was turned very low, and as they entered, Miss Prudence caught sight of Miss Carew in company attire, sitting in upright propriety in a stiff-backed chair at the extremity of the apartment. Miss Prudence had a sudden idea. We will not turn up the gas, she said with an emphasis intended to convey private information to her sister. It will be more agreeable to sit here and talk in this soft light. Neither her brother nor the man from the West made any objection. Miss Boggs and Miss Prudence, clasping each other's hands, divided their attention between their corporeal and their incorporeal guests. 
Miss Boggs was confident that her sister had an idea and was willing to await its development. As the guest from Iowa spoke, Miss Carew bent a politely attentive ear to what he said. Ever since Richards took sick that time, he said briskly, it seemed like he shared all responsibility. The Mrs. Boggs saw the daguerreotype put up her shadowy head with a movement of doubt and apprehension. The fact of the matter was, Richards didn't seem to scarcely get on the way he might have been expected to. At this conscienceless split of the infinitive and misplacing of the preposition, Miss Carew arose trembling perceptibly. I saw it wasn't no use for him to count on a quick recovery. The Mrs. Boggs lost the rest of the sentence, for at the utterance of the double negative, Miss Lydia Carew had flashed out not in a blur, but with mortal haste as when life goes out at a pistol shot. The man from the West wondered why Miss Prudence should have cried at so pathetic a part of his story. Thank goodness! And their brother was amazed to see Miss Boggs kiss Miss Prudence with passion and energy. It was the end. Miss Carew returned no more. End of A Grammatical Ghost by Elia Wilkinson Petey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Horror of the Heights by Arthur Conan Doyle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. The Horror of the Heights by Arthur Conan Doyle. The idea that the extraordinary narrative which has been called the Joyce Armstrong fragment is an elaborate practical joke evolved by some unknown person, cursed by a perverted and sinister sense of humor, has now been abandoned by all who have examined the matter. The most macabre and imaginative of plotters would hesitate before linking his morbid fantasies with the unquestioned and tragic facts which reinforce the statement. Though the assertions contained in it are amazing and even monstrous, it is nonetheless forcing itself upon the general intelligence that they are true and that we must readjust our ideas to the new situation. This world of ours appears to be separated by a slight and precarious margin of safety from a most singular and unexpected danger. I will endeavor, in this narrative, which reproduces the original document in its necessarily somewhat fragmentary form, to lay before the reader the whole of the facts up to date, prefacing my statement by saying that, if there be any who doubt the narrative of Joyce Armstrong, there can be no question at all as to the facts concerning Lieutenant Myrtle, R.N., and Mr. Hay Connor, who undoubtedly met their end in the manner described. The Joyce Armstrong fragment was found in the field which is called Lower Haycock, lying one mile to the westward of the village of Withiam, upon the Kent and Sussex border. It was on the 15th September last that an agricultural laborer, James Flynn, in the employment of Matthew Dodd, farmer of the Chauntry Farm, Withiam, perceived a briar pipe lying near the footpath which skirts the hedge in Lower Haycock. A few paces farther on, he picked up a pair of broken binocular glasses. Finally, among some nettles in the ditch, he caught sight of a flat canvas-backed book, which proved to be a notebook with detachable leaves, some of which had come loose and were fluttering along the base of the hedge. These he collected, but some, including the first, were never recovered, and leave a deplorable hiatus in this all-important statement. The notebook was taken by the laborer to his master, who in turn showed it to Dr. J. H. Atherton, of Hartfield. This gentleman at once recognized the need for an expert examination, and the manuscript was forwarded to the Aero Club in London, where it now lies. The first two pages of the manuscript are missing. There is also one torn away at the end of the narrative, though none of these affect the general coherence of the story. It is conjectured that the missing opening is concerned with the record of Mr. Joyce Armstrong's qualifications as an aeronaut, which can be gathered from other sources, and are admitted to be unsurpassed among the air pilots of England. For many years he has been looked upon as among the most daring and most intellectual of flying men, a combination which has enabled him to both invent and test several new devices, including the common gyroscopic attachment which is known by his name. 
The main body of the manuscript is written neatly in ink, but the last few lines are in pencil and are so ragged as to be hardly legible, exactly, in fact, as they might be expected to appear if they were scribbled off hurriedly from the seat of a moving aeroplane. There are, it may be added, several stains, both on the last page and on the outside cover, which have been pronounced by the Home Office experts to be blood, probably human, and certainly mammalian. The fact that something closely resembling the organism of malaria was discovered in this blood, and that Joyce Armstrong is known to have suffered from intermittent fever, is a remarkable example of the new weapons which modern science has placed in the hands of our detectives. And now a word as to the personality of the author of this epic-making statement. Joyce Armstrong, according to the few friends who really knew something of the man, was a poet and a dreamer, as well as a mechanic and an inventor. He was a man of considerable wealth, much of which he had spent in the pursuit of his aeronautical hobby. He had four private aeroplanes in his hangars near Devizes, and is said to have made no fewer than 170 ascents in the course of last year. He was a retiring man with dark moods, in which he would avoid the society of his fellows. Captain Dangerfield, who knew him better than anyone, says that there were times when his eccentricity threatened to develop into something more serious. His habit of carrying a shotgun with him in his aeroplane was one manifestation of it. Another was the morbid effect which the fall of Lieutenant Myrtle had upon his mind. Myrtle, who was attempting the height record, fell from an altitude of something over 30,000 feet. Horrible to narrate, his head was entirely obliterated, though his body and limbs preserved their configuration. At every gathering of airmen, Joyce Armstrong, according to Dangerfield, would ask, with an enigmatic smile, "'And where, pray, is Myrtle's head?' On another occasion after dinner, at the mess of the flying school on Salisbury Plain, he started a debate as to what will be the most permanent danger which airmen will have to encounter. Having listened to successive opinions as to air pockets, fall to construction and overbanking, he ended by shrugging his shoulders and refusing to put forward his own views, though he gave the impression that they differed from any advanced by his companions. It is worth remarking that after his own complete disappearance, it was found that his private affairs were arranged with a precision which may show that he had a strong premonition of disaster. With these essential explanations, I will now give the narrative exactly as it stands, beginning at page three of the blood-soaked notebook. Nevertheless, when I dined at Reims with Caselli and Gustave Raymond, I found that neither of them was aware of any particular danger in the higher layers of the atmosphere. I did not actually say what was in my thoughts, but I got so near to it that if they had any corresponding idea, they could not have failed to express it. But then they are two empty, vainglorious fellows with no thought beyond seeing their silly names in the newspaper. It is interesting to note that neither of them had ever been much beyond the 20,000-foot level. Of course, men have been higher than this, both in balloons and in the ascent of mountains. It must be well above that point that the aeroplane enters the danger zone, always presuming that my premonitions are correct. Aeroplaning has been with us now for more than 20 years, and one might well ask, why should this peril be only revealing itself in our day? The answer is obvious. In the old days of weak engines, when a hundred-horsepower gnome or green was considered ample for every need, the flights were very restricted. Now that three hundred horsepower is the rule rather than the exception, visits to the upper layers have become easier and more common. Some of us can remember how, in our youth, Garros made a worldwide reputation by attaining 19,000 feet, and it was considered a remarkable achievement to fly over the Alps. Our standard now has been immeasurably raised, and there are twenty high flights for one in former years. Many of them have been undertaken with impunity. The 30,000-foot level has been reached time after time with no discomfort beyond cold and asthma. What does this prove? A visitor might descend upon this planet a thousand times and never see a tiger. Yet tigers exist, and if he chanced to come down into a jungle, he might be devoured. There are jungles of the upper air, and there are worse things than tigers which inhabit them. I believe in time they will map these jungles accurately out. Even at the present moment I can name two of them. 
One of them lies over the Pau Barrett's district of France. Another is just over my head as I write here in my house in Wiltshire. I rather think there is a third in the Hamburg Wiesbaden district. It was the disappearance of the airmen that first set me thinking. Of course, everyone said that they had fallen into the sea, but that did not satisfy me at all. First, there was Verrier in France. His machine was found near Bayonne, but they never got his body. There was the case of Baxter also, who vanished, though his engine and some of the iron fixings were found in a wood in Leicestershire. In that case, Dr. Middleton of Amesbury, who was watching the flight with a telescope, declares that just before the clouds obscured the view, he saw the machine, which was at an enormous height, suddenly rise perpendicularly upwards in a succession of jerks in a manner that he would have thought to be impossible. That was the last scene of Baxter. There was a correspondence in the papers, but it never led to anything. There were several other similar cases. And then there was the death of Hay Connor. What a cackle there was about an unsolved mystery of the air and what columns in the halfpenny papers. And yet how little was ever done to get to the bottom of the business. He came down in a tremendous volplane from an unknown height. He never got off his machine and died in his pilot seat. Died of what? Heart disease, said the doctors. Rubbish! Hay Connor's heart was as sound as mine is. What did Venables say? Venables was the only man who was at his side when he died. He said that he was shivering and looked like a man who had been badly scared. Died of fright, said Venables, but could not imagine what he was frightened about. Only said one word to Venables, which sounded like monstrous. They could make nothing of that at the inquest, but I could make something of it. Monsters. That was the last word of poor Harry Hay Connor. And he did die of fright just as Venables thought. And then there was Myrtle's head. Do you really believe, does anybody really believe that a man's head could be driven clean into his body by the force of a fall? Well, perhaps it may be possible, but I, for one, have never believed that it was so with Myrtle. And the grease upon his clothes, all slimy with grease, said somebody at the inquest. Queer that nobody got thinking after that. I did. But then I had been thinking for a good long time. I've made three ascents. How Dangerfield used to chaff me about my shotgun, but I've never been high enough. Now with this new light Paul Verona machine and its 175 rober, I should easily touch the 30,000 tomorrow. I'll have a shot at the record. Maybe I shall have a shot at something else as well. Of course, it's dangerous. If a fellow wants to avoid danger, he had best keep out of flying altogether and subside finally into flannel slippers and a dressing gown. But I'll visit the air jungle tomorrow, and if there's anything there, I shall know it. If I return, I'll find myself a bit of a celebrity. If I don't, this notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it. But no drivel about accidents or mysteries, if you please. I chose my Paul Veroner monoplane for the job. There is nothing like a monoplane when real work is to be done. Beaumont found that out in very early days. For one thing, it doesn't mind damp, and the weather looks as if we should be in the clouds all the time. It's a bonny little model, and answers my hand like a tender mouthed horse. The engine is a ten-cylinder rotary rover, working up to 175. It has all the modern improvements, enclosed fuselage, high-curved landing skids, brakes, gyroscopic steadiers, and three speeds, worked by an alteration of the angle of the planes upon the Venetian blind principle. I took a shotgun with me and a dozen cartridges filled with buckshot. You should have seen the face of Perkins, my old mechanic, when I directed him to put them in. I was dressed like an Arctic explorer with two jerseys under my overalls, thick socks inside my padded boots, a storm cap with flaps, and my talc goggles. It was stifling outside the hangars, but I was going for the summit of the Himalayas and had to dress for the part. Perkins knew there was something on and implored me to take him with me. Perhaps I should if I were using the biplane, but a monoplane is a one-man show if you want to get the last foot of life out of it. Of course, I took an oxygen bag. The man who goes for the altitude record without one will either be frozen or smothered or both. 
I had a good look at the planes, the rudder bar, and the elevating lever before I got in. Everything was in order so far as I could see. Then I switched on my engine and found that she was running sweetly. When they let her go, she rose almost at once upon the lowest speed. I circled my home field once or twice just to warm her up, and then with a wave to Perkins and the others, I flattened out my planes and put her on her highest. She skimmed like a swallow downwind for eight or ten miles until I turned her nose up a little and she began to climb in a great spiral for the cloud bank above me. It's all important to rise slowly and adapt yourself to the pressure as you go. It was a close warm day for an English September and there was the hush and heaviness and pending rain. Now and then there came sudden puffs of wind from the southwest. One of them so gusty and unexpected that it caught me napping and turned me half round for an instant. I remember the time when gusts and whirls and air pockets used to be things of danger before we learned to put an overmastering power into our engines. Just as I reached the cloud banks with an altimeter marking 3,000, down came the rain. My word how it poured! It drummed upon my wings and lashed against my face, blurring my glasses so that I could hardly see. I got down onto a low speed, for it was painful to travel against it. As I got higher, it became hail, and I had to turn tail to it. One of my cylinders was out of action, a dirty plug, I should imagine, but still I was rising steadily with plenty of power. After a bit, the trouble passed, whatever it was, and I heard the full, deep-throated purr, the ten singing as one. That's where the beauty of our modern silencers come in. We can at last control our engines by ear, how they squeal and squeak and sob when they are in trouble. All those cries for help were wasted in the old days, when every sound was swallowed up by the monstrous racket of the machine. If only the early aviators could come back and see the beauty and perfection of the mechanism which have been bought at the cost of their lives. About 9.30 I was nearing the clouds. Down below me, all blurred and shadowed with rain, lay the vast expanse of Salisbury Plain. Half a dozen flying machines were doing hack work at the thousand-foot level, looking like little black swallows against the green background. I dare say they were wondering what I was doing up in cloudland. Suddenly a gray curtain drew across beneath me, and wet folds of vapors were swirling round my face. It was clamily cold and miserable, but I was above the hailstorm, and that was something gained. The cloud was as dark and thick as a London fog. In my anxiety to get clear, I cocked her nose up until the automatic alarm bell rang, and I actually began to slide backwards. My sopped and dripping wings had made me heavier than I thought, but presently I was in lighter cloud, and soon had cleared the first layer. There was a second, opal-colored and fleecy, at a great height above my head, a white unbroken ceiling above, and a dark unbroken floor below, with the monoplane laboring upwards upon a vast spiral between them. It is deadly lonely in these cloud spaces. Once a great flight of some small water birds went past me, flying very fast to the westwards. The quick whir of their wings and their musical cry were cheery to my ear. I fancy that they were teal, but I am a wretched zoologist. Now that we humans have become birds, we must really learn to know our brethren by sight. The wind down beneath me whirled and swayed the broad cloud plain. Once a great eddy formed in it. A whirlpool of vapor, and through it as down a funnel I caught sight of the distant world. A large white biplane was passing at a vast depth beneath me. I fancy it was the morning mail service betwixt Bristol and London. Then the drift swirled inwards again and the great solitude was unbroken. Just after ten I touched the lower edge of the upper cloud stratum. It consisted of fine diaphanous vapor drifting swiftly from the westwards. The wind had been steadily rising all this time, and it was now blowing a sharp breeze, twenty-eight an hour by my gauge. Already it was very cold, though my altimeter only marked nine thousand. The engines were working beautifully, and we went droning steadily upwards. The cloud bank was thicker than I had expected, but at last it thinned out into a golden mist before me. And then, in an instant, I had shot out from it, and there was an unclouded sky and a brilliant sun above my head, all blue and gold above, all shining silver below, one vast glimmering plain as far as my eyes could reach. It was a quarter past ten o'clock, and the bar graph needle pointed to 12,800. Up I went and up. 
my ears concentrated upon the deep purring of my motor, my eyes busy always with the watch, the revolution indicator, the petrol level, and the oil pump. No wonder aviators are said to be a fearless race. With so many things to think of, there is no time to trouble about oneself. About this time, I noted how unreliable is the compass when above a certain height from Earth. At 15,000 feet, mine was pointing east and a point south. The sun and the wind gave me my true bearings. I had hoped to reach an eternal stillness in these high altitudes, but with every thousand feet of ascent, the gale grew stronger. My machine groaned and trembled in every joint and rivet as she faced it, and swept away like a sheet of paper when I banked her on the turn, skimming downwind at a greater pace, perhaps, than ever mortal man has moved. Yet I had always to turn again and tack up in the wind's eye, for it was not merely a height record that I was after. By all my calculations, it was above little Wiltshire that my air jungle lay and all my labors might be lost if I struck the outer layers at some farther point. When I reached the 19,000-foot level, which was about midday, the wind was so severe that I looked with some anxiety to the stays of my wings, expecting momentarily to see them snap or slacken. I even cast loose the parachute behind me and fastened its hook onto the ring of my leathern belt, so as to be ready for the worst. Now was the time when a bit of scamped work by the mechanic is paid for by the life of the aeronaut. But she held together bravely. Every cord and strut was humming and vibrating like so many harp strings, but it was glorious to see how, for all the beating and the buffeting, she was still the conqueror of nature and the mistress of the sky. There is surely something divine in man himself that he should rise so superior to the limitations which creation seemed to impose, Rise, too, by such unselfish, heroic devotion as this air conquest has shown. Talk of human degeneration! When has such a story as this been written in the annals of our race? These were the thoughts in my head as I climbed that monstrous inclined plane, with the wind sometimes beating in my face and sometimes whistling behind my ears, while the cloudland beneath me fell away to such a distance that the folds and hummocks of silver had all smoothed out into one flat shining plain. But suddenly I had a horrible and unprecedented experience. I have known before what it is to be in what our neighbors have called a tourbillon, but never on such a scale as this. That huge sweeping river of wind which I have spoken had, as it appears, whirlpools within it, which were as monstrous as itself. Without a moment's warning, I was dragged suddenly into the heart of one. I spun round for a minute or two with such velocity that I almost lost my senses, and then fell suddenly, left wing foremost, down the vacuum funnel in the center. I dropped like a stone and lost nearly a thousand feet. It was only my belt that kept me in my seat, and the shock and breathlessness left me hanging half insensible over the side of the fuselage. But I am always capable of a supreme effort. It is my one great merit as an aviator. I was conscious that the descent was slower. The whirlpool was a cone rather than a funnel. And I had come to the apex. With a terrific wrench, throwing my weight all to one side, I leveled my planes and brought her head away from the wind. In an instant, I had shot out of the eddies and was skimming down the sky. Then, shaken but victorious, I turned her nose up and began once more my steady grind on the upward spiral. I took a large sweep to avoid the danger spot of the whirlpool, and soon I was safely above it. Just after one o'clock, I was 21,000 feet above the sea level. To my great joy, I had topped the gale, and with every hundred feet of ascent, the air grew stiller. On the other hand, it was very cold, and I was conscious of that peculiar nausea which goes with the rarefication of the air. For the first time, I unscrewed the mouth of my oxygen bag and took an occasional whiff of the glorious gas. I could feel it running like a cordial through my veins, and I was exhilarated almost to the point of drunkenness. I shouted and sang as I soared upwards into the cold, still outer world. It is very clear to me that the insensibility which came upon Glacier, and in a lesser degree upon Coxwell, when in 1862 they ascended in a balloon to the height of 30,000 feet, was due to the extreme speed with which a perpendicular ascent is made. 
doing it in an easy gradient and accustoming oneself to the lessened barometric pressure by slow degrees, there are no such dreadful symptoms. At the same great height, I found that even without my oxygen inhaler, I could breathe without undue distress. It was bitterly cold, however, and my thermometer was at zero Fahrenheit. At 1.30, I was nearly seven miles above the surface of the earth and still ascending steadily. I found, however, that the rarefied air was giving markedly less support to my planes, and that my angle of ascent had to be considerably lowered in consequence. It was already clear that even with my light weight and strong engine power, there was a point in front of me where I should be held. To make matters worse, one of my sparking plugs was in trouble again, and there was an intermittent misfiring in the engine. My heart was heavy with the fear of failure. It was about that time that I had a most extraordinary experience. Something whizzed past me in a trail of smoke and exploded with a loud hissing sound, sending forth a cloud of steam. For the instant, I could not imagine what had happened. Then I remembered that the earth is forever being bombarded by meteor stones and would be hardly inhabitable were they not in nearly every case turned to vapor in the outer layers of the atmosphere. Here is a new danger for the high-altitude man. For two others passed me when I was nearing the 40,000-foot mark. I cannot doubt that at the edge of Earth's envelope, the risk would be a very real one. My barograph needle marked 41,300 when I became aware that I could go no farther. Physically, the strain was not as yet greater than I could bear, but my machine had reached its limit. The attenuated air gave no firm support to the wings, and the least tilt developed into a side slip while she seemed sluggish on her controls. Possibly had the engine been at its best, another thousand feet might have been within our capacity, but it was still misfiring, and two out of the ten cylinders appeared to be out of action. If I had not already reached the zone for which I was searching, then I should never see it upon this journey. But was it not possible that I had attained it? Soaring in circles like a monstrous hawk upon the 40,000-foot level, I let the monoplane guide herself, and with my Monheim glass, I made a careful observation of my surroundings. The heavens were perfectly clear. There was no indication of those dangers which I had imagined. I have said that I was soaring in circles. It struck me suddenly that I would do well to take a wider sweep and open up a new air tract. If the hunter entered an earth jungle, he would drive through it if he wished to find his game. My reasoning had led me to believe that the air jungle which I had imagined lay somewhere over Wiltshire. This should be to the south and west of me. I took my bearings from the sun, for the compass was hopeless, and no trace of earth was to be seen, nothing but the distant silver cloud plane. However, I got my direction as best I might and kept her head straight to the mark. I reckoned that my petrol supply would not last for more than another hour or so, but I could afford to use it to the last drop, since a single magnificent volplane could at any time take me to the earth. Suddenly I was aware of something new. The air in front of me had lost its crystal clearness. It was full of long, ragged wisps of something which I could only compare to very fine cigarette smoke. It hung about in wreaths and coils, turning and twisting slowly in the sunlight. As the monoplane shot through it, I was aware of a faint taste of oil upon my lips, and there was a greasy scum upon the woodwork of the machine. Some infinitely fine organic matter appeared to be suspended in the atmosphere. There was no life there. It was inchoate and diffuse, extending for many square acres and then fringing off into the void. No, it was not life, but might it not be the remains of life? Above all, might it not be the food of life, of monstrous life, even as the humble grease of the ocean is the food for the mighty whale? The thought was in my mind when my eyes looked upwards and I saw the most wonderful vision that ever man has seen. Can I hope to convey it to you even as I saw it myself last Thursday? Conceive a jellyfish, such as sails in our summer seas, bell-shaped, and of enormous size, far larger, I should judge, than the dome of St. Paul's. It was of a light pink color, veined with a delicate green, but the whole huge fabric so tenuous that it was but a fairy outline against the dark blue sky. It pulsated with a delicate and regular rhythm. From it there depended two long, drooping green tentacles, which swayed slowly backwards and forwards. 
This gorgeous vision passed gently with noiseless dignity over my head, as light and fragile as a soap bubble, and drifted upon its stately way. I'd have turned my monoplane that I might look after this beautiful creature when, in a moment, I found myself amidst a perfect fleet of them, of all sizes, but none so large as the first. Some were quite small, but the majority about as big as an average balloon and with much the same curvature at the top. There was in them a delicacy of texture and coloring which reminded me of the finest Venetian glass. Pale shades of pink and green were the prevailing tints, but all had lovely iridescence, where the sun shimmered through their dainty forms. Some hundreds of them drifted past me, a wonderful fairy squadron of strange unknown argosies of the sky, creatures whose forms and substance were so attuned to these pure heights that one could not conceive anything so delicate within actual sight or sound of earth. But soon my attention was drawn to a new phenomenon, the serpents of the outer air. These were long, thin, fantastic coils of vapor-like material, which turned and twisted with great speed, flying round and round at such a pace that the eyes could hardly follow them. Some of these ghost-like creatures were twenty or thirty feet long, but it was difficult to tell their girth, for their outline was so hazy that it seemed to fade away into the air around them. These air snakes were of a very light gray or smoke color, with some darker lines within, which gave the impression of a definite organism. One of them whisked past my very face, and I was conscious of a cold, clammy contact, but their composition was so unsubstantial that I could not connect them with any thought of physical danger, any more than the beautiful bell-like creatures which had preceded them. There was no more solidity in their frames than in the floating spume from a broken wave. But a more terrible experience was in store for me. Floating downwards from a great height, there came a purplish patch of vapor, small as I saw at first, but rapidly enlarging as it approached me, until it appeared to be hundreds of square feet in size. Though fashioned in some transparent jelly-like substance, it was nonetheless of much more definite outline and solid consistence than anything which I had seen before. There were more traces, too, of a physical organization, especially two vast shadowy circular plates upon either side, which may have been eyes, and a perfectly solid white projection between them, which was as curved and cruel as the beak of a vulture. The whole aspect of this monster was formidable and threatening, and it kept changing its color from a very light mauve to a dark, angry purple so thick that it cast a shadow as it drifted between my monoplane and the sun. On the upper curve of its huge body there were three great projections which I can only describe as enormous bubbles, and I was convinced as I looked at them that they were charged with some extremely light gas, which served to buoy up the misshapen and semi-solid mass in the rarefied air. The creature moved swiftly along, keeping pace easily with the monoplane, and for twenty miles or more it formed my horrible escort, hovering over me like a bird of prey which is waiting to pounce. Its method of progression, done so swiftly that it was not easy to follow, was to throw out a long, glutinous streamer in front of it, which in turn seemed to draw forward the rest of the writhing body. So elastic and gelatinous was it that never for two successive minutes was it the same shape, and yet each change made it more threatening and loathsome than the last. I knew that it meant mischief. Every purple flush of its hideous body told me so. The vague, goggling eyes which were turned always upon me were cold and merciless in their viscid hatred. I dipped the nose of my monoplane downwards to escape it, as I did so, as quick as a flash, there was shot out a long tentacle from this mass of floating blubber, and it felt as light and sinuous as a whiplash across the front of my machine. There was a loud hiss as it lay for a moment across the hot engine, and it whisked itself into the air again, while the huge flat body drew itself together as if in sudden pain. I dipped to a vole peak, but again a tentacle fell over the monoplane, and it was shorn off by the propeller as easily as it might have cut through a smoke wreath. A long, gliding, sticky, serpent-like coil came from behind and caught me round the waist, dragging me out of the fuselage. 
I tore at it, my fingers sinking into the smooth glue-like surface. For an instant I disengaged myself, but only to be caught round the boot by another coil, which gave me a jerk that tilted me almost onto my back. As I fell over, I blazed off both barrels of my gun, though indeed it was like attacking an elephant with a pea-shooter to imagine that any human weapon could cripple that mighty bulk. And yet I aimed better than I knew, for with a loud report, one of the great blisters upon the creature's back exploded with the puncture of the buckshot. It was very clear that my conjecture was right, that these vast clear bladders were distended with some lifting gas, for in an instant the huge cloud-like body turned sideways, writhing desperately to find its balance, while the white beak snapped and gaped in horrible fury. But already I had shot away on the steepest glide that I dared to attempt, my engine still full on, the flying propeller and the force of gravity shooting me downwards like an arrow light. Far behind me I saw a dull purplish smudge growing swiftly smaller and merging into the blue sky behind it. I was safe out of the deadly jungle of the outer air. Once out of danger, I throttled my engine, for nothing tears a machine to pieces quicker than running on full power from a height. It was a glorious spiral vol plane from nearly eight miles of altitude, first to the level of the silver cloud bank, then to that of the storm cloud beneath it, and finally in beating rain to the surface of the earth. I saw the Bristol Channel beneath me as I broke from the clouds, but having still some petrol in my tank, I got twenty miles inland before I found myself stranded in a field half a mile from the village of Ashcombe. There I got three tins of petrol from a passing motor car, and at ten minutes past six that evening I alighted gently in my own home meadow at Devizes, after such a journey as no mortal upon earth has ever yet taken and lived to tell the tale. I have seen the beauty, and I have seen the horror of the heights, and greater beauty or greater horror than that is not within the ken of man. And now it is my plan to go once again before I give my results to the world. My reason for this is that I must surely have something to show by way of proof before I lay such a tale before my fellow men. It is true that others will soon follow and will confirm what I have said, and yet I should wish to carry conviction from the first. Those lovely iridescent bubbles of the air should not be hard to capture. They drift slowly upon their way, and the swift monoplane could intercept their leisurely course. It is likely enough that they would dissolve in the heavier layers of the atmosphere, and that some small heap of amorphous jelly might be all that I should bring to earth with me. And yet something there would surely be by which I could substantiate my story. Yes, I will go, even if I run a risk by doing so. These purple horrors would not seem to be numerous. It is probable that I shall not see one. If I do, I shall dive at once. At the worst, there is always the shotgun, and my knowledge of... Here, a page of the manuscript is unfortunately missing. On the next page is written in large, straggling writing. 43,000 feet. I shall never see earth again. They are beneath me, three of them. God help me, it is a dreadful death to die. Such, in its entirety, is the Joyce Armstrong statement. Of the man, nothing has since been seen. Pieces of his shattered monoplane have been picked up in the preserves of Mr. Bud Lushington upon the borders of Kent and Sussex, within a few miles of the spot where the notebook was discovered. If the unfortunate aviator's theory is correct, that this air jungle, as he called it, existed only over the southwest of England, then it would seem that he had fled from it at the full speed of his monoplane, but had been overtaken and devoured by these horrible creatures at some spot in the outer atmosphere above the place where the grim relics were found. The picture of that monoplane skimming down the sky with the nameless terrors flying as swiftly beneath it and cutting it off always from the earth while they gradually closed in upon their victim is one upon which a man who valued his sanity would prefer not to dwell. There are many, as I am aware, who still jeer at the facts which I have here set down, but even they must admit that Joyce Armstrong has disappeared, and I would commend to them his own words. This notebook may explain what I am trying to do and how I lost my life in doing it, but no drivel about accidents or mysteries 
if you please. End of The Horror of the Heights In the Dark by Ronald Kayser This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman It was a tale of sheer horror that old Asa Gregg poured into the dictaphone. In the Dark by Ronell Kayser The watchman's flashlight painted a white circle on the frosted glass, black-lettered door. Gregg Chemical Company, Manufacturers. Asa Gregg, President private the watchman's hand closed on the knob rattling the door in its frame queer but tonight the sound had seemed to come from in there but it couldn't be he knew that mr gregg and miss carruthers carried the only keys to the office so any intruder would be forced to smash the lock maybe the sound came from the storage room the watchman clumped along the rubber matted corridor flung his weight against the door it opened hard being of ponderous metal fitted into a cork casing the room was an airtight fireproof vault really his shoes gritted on the concrete floor as he prowled among the big porcelain vats the flashlight bore through the bluish haze to the concrete walls acid fumes escaped under the vat lids made the haze and seared the man's throat he hurried out coughing and wiping his eyes it was damn funny every night he heard the same peculiar noise somewhere in this wing of the building like a body groaning and turning in a restless sleep it was it scared him he didn't mention the mystery to anyone though he was an old man and he didn't want mr gregg to think he was getting too old for the job he should think I was crazy if I told him about it, he mumbled. Inside the office, Asa Gregg heard the muttered words plainly. He sat very still in the big leather cushioned chair, hardly breathing until the scrape of the watchman's feet had thinned away down the hall. There was no light in the room to betray him, only the cherry-colored tip of his cigar, which couldn't be visible through the frosted glass door anyway it'd be an hour before the watchman's rounds brought him past the office again asa gregg had an hour if he could screw up his nerves to use it he took the frayed end of the cigar from his mouth his hand which had wasted to mere skin and bone these past few months groped through the darkness slid open the polished coolness of the dictaphone hood and snapped the switch machinery faintly whirred his fingers found the tube lifted it miss carruthers he snapped then he hesitated surely he could trust mary carruthers he'd never wondered about her before she'd been his secretary for a dozen years lately since he couldn't look after affairs himself as he used to she had practically run the business she was forty sensible unbeautiful and tight-lipped Hell, he had to trust her. His voice plunged into the darkness. What I have to say now is intended for Mrs. Gregg's ears only. She will take the first boat home, of course. Meet that boat and bring her to the office. Since my wife knows nothing about a dictaphone, it will be necessary for you to set this recording running. As soon as you have done so, leave her alone in the room. Make sure she is not interrupted for a half hour that's all he waited a decent interval the invisible needle peeled its thread into the revolving wax cylinder Jeanette muttered Asa Gregg and hesitated again this wasn't going to be easy to say he decided to begin matter-of-factly as you probably know my will and the insurance policies are in the vault at the First National I believe you will find all my papers in excellent order if any questions arise consult miss carruthers what i have to say to you now is purely personal i feel my dear that i owe you an explanation that is 
God, it was harder than he had expected. Jeanette, he started afresh, you remember three years ago when I was in the hospital? You were in Palm Beach at the time. I wired that there had been an accident here at the plant. That wasn't strictly so. The fact is, I'd gotten mixed up with a girl. He paused, shivering. In the darkness, a picture of Dot swam before him. The oval face, framed with gleaming swirls of lemon-tinted hair, had pouting scarlet lips and eyes whose allure was intensified by a violet makeup. The full-length picture of her included a streamlined, full-blossomed, and yet delectably lithe body. A costly, enticing, Broadway chorus orchid. As a matter of fact, that is where he'd found her. I won't make any excuses for myself, Asa Gregg said harshly. I might point out that you were always in Florida, or Bermuda, or France, and that I was a lonely man. But it wasn't just loneliness, and I didn't seek companionship. I thought I was making a last bow to romance. I was successful, sixty, and silly, and I did all the damn fool things. I even wrote letters to her. Popsy wopsy letters. The dictaphone couldn't record the grimace that jerked his lips. She saved them, of course, and by and by she put a price on them. Ten thousand dollars. Dot claimed that one of those filthy tabloids had offered her that much for them, and what was a poor working girl to do? She lied. I knew that. I told her to bring the letters to the office after business hours, and I'd take care of her. I took care of her, all right. I shot her, Jeanette. He mopped his face with a handkerchief that was already damp. Not on account of the money, you understand. It was the thing she said after she had tucked the bills into her purse. Vile things, about the way she had earned it ten times over by enduring my beastly kisses. I really loved that girl, and I'd thought she'd cared for me a little. It was her hate that maddened me, and I got a gun out of my desk drawer. Asa Gregg reached through the darkness for the switch. He fumbled for the bottle which stood on the desk. His hands trembled spilling some of the liquor onto his lap. He drank from the bottle. This part of the story he'd skip. It was too horrible even to think about. He didn't want to remember how the blood pooled inside Dot's fur coat, and how he'd managed to carry the body out of the office without leaking any of her blood onto the floor. He tried to forget the musky sweetness of the perfume on the dead girl, mingled with the other evil blood smell. Especially he didn't want to remember the frightful time he'd had stripping the gold rings from her fingers and the one gold tooth in her head. The horror of it coiled in the blackness about him. His own teeth rattled against the bottle when he gulped the second drink. He snapped the switch savagely, but when he spoke, his voice cringed into the tube. I carried her into the storage room. I got the lid off one of the acid tanks. The vat contained an acid powerful enough to destroy anything, except gold. In fact, the vat itself had to be lined with gold leaf. I knew that in twenty-four hours there wouldn't be a recognizable body left, and in a week there wouldn't be anything at all. No matter what the police suspected, they couldn't prove a murder charge without a corpus delecti. I had committed the perfect crime, except for one thing. I didn't realize there'd be a splash when she went into the vat. Greg laughed, not pleasantly. His wife might think it had been a sob when she heard this record. Now you understand why I went to the hospital, he jerked. Possibly you'd call that poetic justice. Oh, God. His voice broke again. He thumbed off the switch and mopped his face with the damp linen. The rest... How could he explain the rest of it? He spent a long minute arranging his thoughts. You haven't any idea, he resumed. No one has any idea of how I have been punished for the thing I did. I don't mean the sheer physical agony, 
but the fear that I'd taught coming out of the ether at the hospital. The fear that she'd been traced to my office, I'd simply hidden her rings away expecting to drop them into the river, or that she might have confided in her lover. Yes, she had one. Or suppose a whopping big order came through and the tank was emptied the very next day. And I couldn't ask any questions. I didn't even know what was in the papers. However, that part of it was gradually cleared up. I quizzed Miss Carruthers and learned that an unidentified female body had been fished out of the East River a few days after Dot disappeared. That's how the police solved the crime. I got rid of her rings. I ordered the vat left alone. The other thing began about six months ago. A spasm contorted his face. His fingers ached their grip into the dictaphone tube. Jeanette, you remember how I began to object to the radio? How I'd shout at you to turn it off in the middle of the program? You thought I was ill and worried about business. You were wrong. The thing that got me was hearing her voice. He gripped the cold cigar, chewed it. It's very strange that you didn't notice it. No matter what station we dialed to, always the same voice came stealing into the room. But perhaps you did notice. You said, once or twice, that all those blues singers sound alike. And she was a blues singer. It was she, all right, somewhere out there in the ether, reminding me. The next thing was, well, at first, when I noticed it in the office, I thought Miss Carruthers had suddenly taken up with young ideas. You see, I kept smelling perfume. And he smelled it now. It was like a miasma in the dark. It isn't anything that Carruthers wears, he grated. It comes from, yes, the storage room. I realized that about a month ago, just after you sailed. One night I stayed late at the office, and I went in there. It seemed to be strongest around the vat, her vat. And I lifted the lid. The sweet, sticky, musty smell hit me like a blow in the face. And that isn't all. Terror stalked in this room. Asa Gregg crouched in his chair, felt the weight of fear on him, like a submarine pressure. His cigar pitched on his knees, dropped to the floor. You wouldn't believe this, Jeanette. He hammered the words like nails into the darkness in front of him. You will say that it's impossible. I know that. It is impossible. And it is physiologically absurd. It contradicts the laws of natural science. But I saw something on the bottom of that vat. He groped for the bottle. His wife would hear a low gurgle and then a coughing gasp. The vat was nearly full of this transparent, oily acid, he went on. What I saw was a lot of sediment on the golden floor. And there shouldn't have been any sediment. The stuff utterly dissolves animal tissue, bone, even the common ores keeps them in suspension. It didn't look like sediment either. It looked like a heap of mold, grave mold. I replaced the lid. I spent a week convincing myself that it was all impossible, that I couldn't have seen anything of the sort. Then I went to the vat again. Silence hung in the darkness while he sucked air into his lungs. And the words burst, separate, yammering shrieks. I looked, night after night, for hours at a time, I watched the change. Did you ever see a body decompose? Of course not. Neither have I. But you must know in a general way what the process is. Well, this has been the exact opposite. First, I stared at the heap of grave mold as it shaped itself into bones, a skeleton. I watched the coming of hair a yellow tangle of it sprouting from the bare round skull until oh god the flesh began to make itself before my eyes i couldn't bear any more i stayed away didn't come to the office for five days the tube slipped from his sweating slick fingers panting asa gregg fumbled in the dark until he found it exhaustion not self-control flattened his voice to a dead monotone. I tried to think of a way out. 
if I could fish the corpse out of the tank. But I couldn't smuggle it out of the plant alone. You know that, and so do I. Besides, what would be the use? If the acid can't kill her, nothing can. That's why I can't have the lid cemented on. It wouldn't do any good either. Until three days ago, she hadn't the least color, looking as white as a ghost in the vat. A naked ghost, because there's been no resurrection for her clothing. I've watched her limbs grow rosy. Her lips are scarlet. Her eyes are bright. They opened yesterday. And her breasts were rising and falling. Oh, almost imperceptibly. But that was last night. And tonight, I swear it, her lips moved. She muttered my name. She turned. She'd been lying on her side, over onto her back. The record would be badly blurred. His hand shook violently, bobbling the tube against his lips. Greg braced his elbow against the desk. She isn't dead, he choked. She's only asleep, not very soundly asleep. She's waking up. The invisible needle quivered as it traced several noises. There was his tortured breathing, and the clawing of his fingernails rattling over the desk. The drawer clicked as it opened. A loud click was the cocking of the revolver. Soon she's going to get out of that vat, Greg bleated. Jeanette, forgive me. God, forgive me. For I will not, I cannot, I dare not stay here and see her then. The sound of the shot brought the watchman stumbling along the corridor. He crashed against the office door. It banged open in a shower of falling, frosted glass. The watchman's flashlight severed the darkness and printed its white circle on the face of Asa Gregg. He had fallen back into the chair, a blackish gout of blood running from the hole in his temple. He stared sightlessly into the light with his eyes that were two gnarls of shrunken brown flesh, like knots in a pine board. Asa Gregg was blind, had been since that night three years past, when the acid splashed. The End of In the Dark by Ronald Kayser The Last of Mrs. De Brew by H. Sivia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Louise J. Bell The Last of Mrs. De Brew by H. Sivia Let he, Mr. De Brew remarked between long puffs on his meerschaum, You've been a fine maid. You've served Mrs. De Brew and me for most of fifteen years. Now, I haven't much more time in this life, and I want you to know that after Mrs. De Brew and I are gone, you will be well taken care of. Letty stopped her dusting of the chairs in Mr. De Brew's oak-paneled study. She sighed and turned toward the man, who sat on a heavy sofa, puffing on his pipe and gazing across the room into nothingness. "'You mustn't talk that way, Mr. De Brew, she said. "'You know you're a long time from the dark ways yet.' She paused, and then went on dusting and talking again. And me? <laughs> I've only done what any ordinary human would do for such a kind employer as you, sir. Especially after all you've done for me. He didn't say anything, and she went on with her work. Of course, she liked to work for him. She had adored the kindly old man since first she had met him in an agency fifteen years before. 
a person couldn't ask for a better master. But there was the mistress, Mrs. de Brew. It was she who gave Letty cause for worry. What with her nagging tongue and her sharp rebukes, it was a wonder Letty had not quit long before. She would have quit, too, but there had been the terrible sickness she had undergone and conquered with the aid of the ablest physicians Mr. de Brew could engage. She couldn't quit after that, no matter what misery Mrs. de Brew heaped on her. And so she went about her work at all hours, never tiring, always striving to please. She left the study, closing the great door silently behind her, for old Mr. de Brew had sunk deeper into the sofa, into the realms of peaceful sleep, and she did not wish to disturb him. Letty! came the shrill cry of Mrs. de Brew from down the hall. Get these pictures and take them to the attic at once and tell Mr. de Brew to come here. Letty went for the pictures. Mr. de Brew is asleep, she said, explaining why she was not obeying the last command. Well, I'll soon fix that. Lazy old man. Sleeps all day with that smelly pipe between his teeth. If he had an ounce of pep about him, he'd get out and work the flowers. Sleeps too much anyway. Not good for him. She stamped out of the room and down the hall, and Letty heard her open the door of the study and scream at her husband. Hector de Brew, wake up! There was a silence, during which Letty wondered what was going on. Then she heard the noisy clop-clop of Mrs. de Brew's slippers on the hardwood floor of the study, and she knew the woman was going to shake the daylights out of Mr. de Brew and frighten him into wakefulness. She could even imagine she heard Mrs. de Brew grasp the lapels of her husband's coat and shake him back and forth against the chair. Then she heard the scream. It came quite abruptly from Mrs. de Brew in the study, and it frightened Letty out of her wits momentarily. After that, there was the thud of a falling body and the clatter of an upset piece of furniture. Letty hurried out of the room into the hall and through the open door of the study. She saw Mrs. de Brew slumped on the floor in a faint and beside her an upset ashtray. But her eyes did not linger on the woman nor the tray. Instead, they focused on the still form of Mr. de Brew in the sofa. He was slumped down, his head twisted to one side, and his mouth hanging open from the shaking Mrs. de Brew had given him. The meerschaum had slipped from between his teeth and the cold ashes were scattered on his trousers. Even then, before the sea of tears began to flow from her eyes, Letty knew the old man was dead. She knew what he had meant by the speech he had said to her only a few minutes before. His heart, was the comment of the doctor, who arrived a short time later and pronounced the old man dead. He had to go. Today? Tomorrow? Soon. After that, he put Mrs. de Brew to bed 
and turned to Letty. Mrs. de Brew is merely suffering from a slight shock. There is nothing more that I can do. When she awakens, see that she stays in bed for the rest of the day. He left then, and Letty felt a strange coldness about the place, something that had not been there while Mr. de Brew was alive. She went downstairs and made several telephone calls, which she knew would be necessary. Later, when Mrs. de Brew was feeling better, other arrangements could be made. She straightened the furniture in the study, pushing the familiar sofa back in place from where Mr. de Brew invariably moved it. Then she knocked the ashes from the meerschaum, wiped it off, and placed it carefully in the little glass cabinet on the wall where he always kept it. Times would be different now, she knew. She remembered what he had said. You will be well taken care of. But there had been something else. After Mrs. de Brew and I are gone, Letty could no longer hold back the tears. She fell into a chair, and they poured forth. But time always passes, and with it goes a healing balm for most all sorrows. First there was the funeral, then came other arrangements, and there was the will, which Mrs. de Brew never mentioned. His things would have fallen into decay but for the hands of Letty. Always her dust cloth made his study immaculate. Always the sofa was in place, and the pipe, clean and shining, in the cabinet. There was a different hardness about Mrs. de Brew. No longer was she content with driving Letty like a slave day in and day out. She became even more unbearable. There were little things, like taking away her privilege of having Saturday afternoons off, and the occasional forgetting of Letty's weekly pay. Once, Letty thought of leaving during the night, of packing her few clothes and going forever from the house. But that was foolish. There was no place to go, and she was getting too old for maid service. Besides, hadn't Mr. de Brew said she would be taken care of? After Mrs. de Brew and I are gone, perhaps she would not live much longer. And then one morning, Mrs. de Brew called Letty in to talk with her. It was the hour Letty had been awaiting and dreading. There was a harsh, gloating tone in Mrs. de Brew's voice as she spoke. She was the master now. There was no Hector to think of. Letty, she said, for some time now I have been considering closing the house. I'm lonely here. I intend to go to the city and live with my sister. So you see, I shan't be needing you any longer. I'll be leaving within the next two days. I'm sorry. Letty was speechless. She had expected something terrible, but not this. 
this wasn't so. Mrs. DeBrew was lying. It was the will she was afraid of. Letty remembered Mr. DeBrew's promise. She did not complain, however. Her only words were, I'll leave tomorrow. That night, she packed her things. She had no definite plans, but she hoped something would turn up. Sleep would not come easy, so Letty lay in bed and thought of old Mr. DeBrew. She imagined he was before her in the room, reclining on the sofa, puffing long on the meerschaum. She even saw, in fancy, the curling wisps of gray smoke drifting upward, upward. It was sleep. Then, with a start, she was suddenly wide awake. She had surely heard a scream. But no. And then, as soft and as silent as the night wind, came the whisper, Letty. It drifted slowly off into silence, and a cool breeze crossed her brow. She suddenly felt wet with perspiration. She listened closely, but the whisper was not repeated. Then, noiselessly, she got out of bed, stepped into slippers, and drew a robe about her. Just as silently, she left her room and walked down the hall to Mrs. DeBrew's bedroom. She rapped softly on the door, fearing the wrath of the woman within at being awakened in the middle of the night. There was no answer. No sound from inside the room. Letty hesitated, wondering what to do. And once more she felt that cool, death-like breeze and heard the faintest of whispers, fainter even than the sighing of the night wind. Letty. She opened the door and switched on the light. Mrs. DeBrew lay in the bed as in sleep, but Letty knew, as she had known about Mr. DeBrew, that it was more than sleep. She quickly called the doctor, and sometime much later he arrived his eyes heavy from lack of sleep. Dead, he remarked after looking at the body. Probably had a shock. Fright. Nightmare. Or something her heart couldn't stand. I always thought she would have died first. Letty walked slowly from the room down the stairs, still in her robe and slippers. The doctor followed and passed her, going through the door into the outside. She walked, as though directed by some unseen force, into Mr. DeBrew's study. She switched on a lamp beside the sofa on which he had always sat, and she noticed that it was moved, slightly out of place. There was something else about the room, some memory of old days. First, 
she saw some sort of legal document on the table and wondered at its being there. The title said, Last Will and Testament of Hector A. de Brew. It was brief. She read it through and found that Mr. de Brew had spoken truthfully in his promise to her. Beside the will on the table was another object, and she knew then what the something else in the room was. The Meerschaum. It lay there beside the document, and a thin spiral of grayish smoke rose upward from it toward the ceiling. No longer did Letty wonder about anything. End of The Last of Mrs. De Brew. Recording by Louise J. Bell. Sebastopol, California. The Last Throw by Aluzio Azevedo. Translated from the Portuguese by Joseph E. Agin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Last Throw by Aluzio Azevedo. Tan Louis. They were all he had left. These few coins were all that remained of a large, famous fortune that had been handed down a line of noble ancestors to him, the last of his family. Tan Louis. Dom Felipe jingled the glittering gold pieces in his hand as he walked slowly toward the spot where half an hour before he had abandoned the roulette. Leaning against the back of his still vacant chair, he glanced down at the green table with cold, indifferent eyes. The numbers were buried in the gold and silver of other players. He remained motionless for a long time and stared with unseeing eyes at the silver wheel. His senses were concentrated on a single thought that burned in his brain. He must recover that squandered fortune, or at least a part of it. With a hundred thousand francs, a mere hundred thousand, he could save himself the disgrace of ruin. With a hundred thousand francs, he would hasten to Paris and pay his debts of honor. Then, under some pretext or other, possibly that of health, he would pretend a trip to Switzerland and sail for America with what money he had left. In America, fortunes were contagious. One discovered fabulous dowries. If he were finally obliged to work, he would work. He did not know what work he would do, but the new world swam before his credulous eyes in a golden haze. No definite plan or idea accompanied this hope. He believed in America, as he believed in cards or the roulette. It was a gambler's last hope. It was a blind leap in the dark. Would not America also be a green table piled high with California gold? It was a card flung in a last desperate play? He would go. And afterwards? How fine it would be to return to Europe many times a millionaire and, still young, to revel unrestrained. While these air castles mounted higher and higher in his feverish imagination, the wheel spun swiftly and silently, and heaps of gold and silver poured along the table before his distracted eyes. But if I should lose, he asked himself, he dare not imagine the situation that this question's answer would make inevitable. He felt that he had compromised his honor by the very thought. Nevertheless, if he lost that miserable handful of coins, what remained for him but suicide? What remained for him in this world if it were not ridicule and humiliation? He saw himself penniless, creeping like a shadow through the dark streets, his head on his breast, 
his hands plunged into his pockets fleeing from the sight of everyone and conscious that his abject misery made him as abhorrent as though he had a contagious disease a cold sweat oozed over his skin and he shivered cowardly means of salvation that stole into his distracted mind recalling rich friends and questionable resources were repelled instantly by his pride which still remained unbroken fate vast you messieurs cried the banker Dom Philippe smiled a sad, resigned smile, as if in response to the inner voice that appealed to his courage, and after shaking the ten gold pieces once more, he opened his delicate, useless hand, and with an air haughtier and more indifferent than ever, threw them on the red section, which was nearest him. Rien va plus. A vertigo threatened his feigned calm. The small ivory sphere sprang from the banker's dexterous fingers and whirled around the top of the bowl the silence of death reigned in the room if on that throw instead of red black should come up the wretched gambler reflected any beggar on the streets would be richer than he the ball began to slacken its speed and hovered above the circle of numbers ready to fall the noble slid into a chair and rested his head in his rigid bloodless hands the ball dropped red dom philippe's ten louis became twenty he made not the slightest gesture but awaited the next throw apparently indifferent the table was swept clean and covered again with glittering stakes the banker closed the bets the ball shot out fell red again Dom Philippe did not remove his hands from his face. On his twenty louis were placed another twenty. The game continued in silence. In the midst of the mute anguish that reigned in the hearts of all who played, a third red number doubled the stakes of Dom Philippe, who continued immobile as stone. Nonetheless, so pronounced was the rise and fall of his breast that his whole body accompanied the pulsation of his heart red eighty louis were poured upon the eighty in front of the silent player red the gold began to form a heap red again the pile of gold was on a towering level with the enigmatic face which gradually retreated behind those two white hands with their delicately traced blue veins red still that imperturbable face now seemed petrified behind the stiff thin fingers he seemed to be laughing sardonically at the other players the immobility and the luck of this singular companion in vice again attracted attention red by this time the other men and women could not take their eyes from that mysterious individual whose face none of them had recognized yet so absorbed had each been in his own game red red the mountain of gold kept rising and rising before those two hands that seemed each moment whiter stiffer more firmly planted against the unknown gambler's face red 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 the coins crept under his arms fell to his lap through his legs and rolled across the floor with a ringing sound red the others abandoned their own games to watch this remarkable player hoping that the two marble hands would be lowered that the mocking mask would fall revealing his identity each throw doubled the wealth filed before this death-like figure in vain a beautiful sobriquet at his aid leaned against him suggestively in vain did a group of women form behind his chair talking loudly and betting at each new lucky throw whether or not he would stake everything again now when red was announced by the banker's tremulous voice a roar of astonishment would rise in the room a tympan clamored continuously for attention and order but the comments redoubled about that mute statue some protested against his impertinent madness begging for a black number as deserved punishment 
Others applauded him enthusiastically and shouted bravo at each turn of the wheel. Still others calculated the accumulated gold by counting the plays. Each time the ball dropped, there rose a chorus of conflicting emotions, of approval and disappointment. Finally, the banker, pale and trembling, swayed against the edge of the table and moaned in a despairing voice of a drowning shipwrecked sailor, The bank has gone to glory. But not even then did the mysterious player make the slightest gesture, although around him gathered the curious debauchers of both sexes and all nations, forming a nosy, tempestuous wall. They shouted at him from all sides, in all languages, and in all tones. He did not move. They tapped his shoulders. They touched his head. To no avail. They shook his chair. The statue remained motionless. Then two men, each taking one of the noble's hands, tore them away from his face, and a third raised his head, which was sunken on his breast. A cry of horror rose from the onlookers. He who had broken the bank and played in silence all night, enticed by the women and envied by the men, was a frozen corpse with wide staring eyes, half open mouth, and on his stiffened cheeks two silent tears. The three men drew back in terror, and the dead gambler fell against the table burying his face and hands in the gold, as if to defend his gains against the greed of the surviving players, who were already protesting in loud voices against the legitimacy of his possession. The End of The Last Throw by Aluzio Azevedo Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow by Thomas de Quincey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Lavana and Our Ladies of Sorrow by Thomas de Quincey. Oftentimes at Oxford I saw Lavana in my dreams. I knew her by her Roman symbols. Who is Lavana, reader that do not pretend to have much leisure, for very much scholarship? You will not be angry with me for telling you. Lavana was the Roman goddess that performed for the newborn infant the earliest office of ennobling kindness, typical by its mode of that grandeur which belongs to man everywhere, and of that benignity in powers invisible which even in pagan worlds sometimes descends to sustain it. At the very moment of birth, just as the infant tasted, for the first time, the atmosphere of our troubled planet, it was laid on the ground. But immediately, lest so grand a creature should grovel there for more than one instant, either the paternal hand as proxy for the goddess Lavana, or some near kinsman as proxy for the father, raised it upright, bade it look erect as the king of all this world, and presented its forehead to the stars, saying, perhaps, in his heart, Behold what is greater than yourselves. This symbolic act represented the function of Lavana. And that mysterious lady, who never revealed her face except to me in dreams, but always acted by delegation, had her name from the Latin verb, as still it is the Italian verb, lavare to raise aloft. This is the explanation of Lavana, and hence it has arisen that some people have understood by Lavana the tutelary power that controls the education of the nursery, she that would not suffer at his birth even a prefigurative or mimic degradation for her awful ward, far less could be supposed to suffer the real degradation attaching to the non-development of his powers. She therefore watches over human education. Now the word educo, with the penultimate short, was derived by a process often exemplified in the crystallization of languages from the word educo, with the penultimate long, 
whatever adduces or develops, educates. By the education of Lavana, therefore, is meant not the poor machinery that moves by spelling books and grammars, but by that mighty system of central forces hidden in the deep bosom of human life, which by passion, by strife, by temptation, by the energies of resistance, works for ever upon children resting, not night or day, any more than the mighty wheel of day and night themselves, whose moments, like restless spokes, are glimmering for ever as they revolve. If, then, these are the ministries by which Lavana works, how profoundly must she reverence the agencies of grief? But you, reader, think that children are not liable to such grief as mine. There are two senses in the word generally. The sense of Euclid, where it means universally, or in the whole extent of the genus, and in a foolish sense of this word, where it means usually. Now, I am far from saying that children universally are capable of grief like mine, but there are more than you ever heard of who die of grief in this island of ours. I will tell you a common case. The rules of Eton require that a boy on the foundation should be there twelve years. He is superannuated at eighteen, consequently he must come at six. Children torn away from mothers and sisters at that age not unfrequently die. I speak of what I know. The complaint is not entered by the registrar as grief, but that it is. Grief of that sort, and at that age, has killed more than have ever been counted amongst its martyrs. Therefore it is that Lavana often communes with the powers that shake a man's heart. Therefore it is that she dotes on grief. These ladies, said I softly to myself on seeing the ministers with whom Lavana was conversing, these are the sorrows, and they are three in number, as the graces are three, who dress man's life with beauty, the passe are three, who weave the dark arras of man's life in their mysterious loom, always with colours sad in part, sometimes angry with tragic crimson and black. The furies are three, who visit with retribution, called from the other side of the grave, offences that walk upon this, and once even the muses were but three, who fit the harp, the trumpet, or the lute, to the great burdens of man's impassioned creations. These are the sorrows, all three of whom I know. The last words I say now, but in Oxford I said, one of whom I know, and others too surely I shall know. For already in my fervent youth I saw, dimly relieved upon the dark background of my dreams, the imperfect lineaments of the awful sisters. These sisters, by what name shall we call them? If I say simply, the sorrows, there will be a chance of mistaking the term. It might be understood of individual sorrow, separate cases of sorrow. Whereas I want a term expressing the mighty abstractions that incarnate themselves in all individual sufferings of man's heart. And I wish to have these abstractions presented as impersonations, that is, clothed with human attributes of life and with functions pointing to flesh. Let us call them, therefore, our ladies of sorrow. I know them thoroughly, and have walked in all their kingdoms. Three sisters they are, of one mysterious household, and their paths are wide apart, but of their dominion there is no end. Them I saw often conversing with Lavana, and sometimes about myself. Do they talk, then? Oh, no! Might a phantoms like these disdain the infirmities of language? They may utter voices through the organs of man when they dwell in human hearts, but amongst themselves there is no voice nor sound. Eternal silence reigns in their kingdoms. They spoke not as they talked with Lavana. They whispered not. They sang not, though oftentimes, methought, they might have sung for I upon earth, had heard their mysteries oftentimes deciphered by harp and timbrel, by dulcimer and organ. Like God, whose servants they are, they utter their pleasure, not by sounds that perish or by words that go astray, but by signs in heaven, by changes on earth, by pulses in secret rivers, 
heraldry is painted on darkness, and hieroglyphs written on the tablets of the brain. They wheeled in mazes, I spelled the steps, they telegraphed from afar, I read the signals, they conspired together, and on the mirrors of darkness, my eye traced the plots, theirs were the symbols, mine are the words. What is it the sisters are? What is it that they do? Let me describe their form and their presence, if form it were that still fluctuated in its outline, or presence it were that forever advanced to the front, or forever receded amongst shades. The eldest of the three is named Mater Lacrimarum, Our Lady of Tears. She it is that night and day raves and moans, calling for vanished faces. She stood in Rama, where a voice was heard of lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted. She it was that stood in Bethlehem on the night when Herod's sword swept its nurseries of innocence, and the little feet were stiffened for ever, which, heard at times as they tottered along floors overhead, woke pulses of love in household hearts that were not unmarked in heaven. Her eyes are sweet and subtle, wild and sleepy by turns, oftentimes rising to the clouds, oftentimes challenging the heavens. She wears a diadem round her head, and I knew by childish memories that she could go abroad on the winds, when she heard the sobbing of litanies, or the thundering of organs, and when she beheld the mustering of summer clouds. This sister, the eldest, it is, that carries keys, more than papal, at her girdle, which open every cottage and every palace. She, to my knowledge, sat all last summer by the bedside of the blind beggar, him that so often and so gladly I talked with, whose pious daughter, eight years old, with sunny countenance, resisted the temptations of play and village mirth to travel all day long on dusty roads with her afflicted father. For this did God send her a great reward. In the springtime of the year, and whilst yet her own spring was budding, he recalled her to himself. But her blind father mourns for ever over her. Still he dreams at midnight that the little guiding hand is locked within his own. And still he wakens to a darkness that is now, within a second and a deeper darkness. This Mater Lacrimarum has also been sitting all this winter of 1844-85 within the bedchamber of the Tsar, bringing before his eyes a daughter no less pious, that vanished to God not less suddenly, and left behind her a darkness not less profound. By the power of the keys it is that our Lady of Tears glides a ghostly intruder into the chambers of sleepless men, sleepless women, sleepless children, from Ganges to Nile, from Nile to Mississippi, and her, because she is the firstborn of her house, and has the widest empire, let us honour with the title of Madonna. The second sister is called Mater Suspiriorum, Our Lady of Sighs. She never scales the clouds, nor walks abroad upon the winds. She wears no diadem, and her eyes, if they were ever seen, would be neither sweet nor subtle. No man could read their story. They would be found filled with perishing dreams and with wrecks of forgotten delirium. But she raises not her eyes. Her head, on which sits a dilapidated turban, droops for ever, and for ever fastens on the dust. She weeps not. She groans not. But she sighs inaudibly at intervals. Her sister Madonna is oftentimes stormy and frantic, raging in the highest against heaven, and demanding back her darlings, but... Our Lady of Sighs never clamours, never defies, dreams not of rebellious aspirations. She is humble to abjectness. Hers is the meekness that belongs to the hopeless. Murmur she may, but it is in her sleep. Whisper she may, but it is to herself in the twilight. Mutter she does at times, but it is in solitary places that are desolate, as she is desolate, in ruined cities, and when the sun has gone down to his rest. This sister is the visitor of the pariah, of the Jew, of the bondsman to the oar in the Mediterranean galleys, and of the English criminal in Norfolk Island. 
blotted out from the books of remembrance in sweet far-off england of the baffled penitent reverting his eyes for ever upon a solitary grave which to him seems the altar overthrown of some past and bloody sacrifice on which altar no oblations can now be availing whether towards pardon that he might implore or towards repatriation that he might attempt every slave that at noonday looks up to the tropical sun with timid reproach as he points with one hand to the earth our general mother but for him a stepmother as he points with his other hand to the bible our general teacher but against him sealed and sequestered every woman sitting in darkness without love to shelter her head or hope to illumine her solitude because the heaven-born instincts kindling in her nature germs of holy affections which god implanted in her womanly bosom have been stifled by social necessities now burn sullenly to waste like sepulchral lamps amongst the ancients every nun defrauded of her unreturning maytime by wicked kinsmen whom god will judge every captive in every dungeon all that are betrayed and all that are rejected outcasts by traditionary law and children of hereditary disgrace all these walk with our lady of sighs she also carries a key but she needs it little for her kingdom is chiefly amongst the tents of shem and the houseless vagrant of every clime yet in the very highest walks of man she finds chapels of her own and even in glorious england there are some that to the world carry their heads as proudly as the reindeer who yet secretly have received her mark upon their foreheads but the third sister who is also the youngest hush whisper whilst we talk of her her kingdom is not large or else no flesh should live but within that kingdom all power is hers her head turreted like that of Sibel, rises almost beyond the reach of sight she droops not and her eyes rising so high might be hidden by distance but being what they are they cannot be hidden through the treble veil of crape which she wears the fierce light of a blazing misery that rests not for matins or for vespers for noon of day or noon of night for ebbing or for flowing tide may be read from the very ground she is the defier of god she is also the mother of lunacies and the suggestress of suicides deep lie the roots of her power but narrow is the nation she rules for she can approach only those in whom a profound nature has been upheaved by central convulsions in whom the heart trembles and the brain rocks under conspiracies of tempest from without and tempest from within madonna moves with uncertain steps fast or slow but still with tragic grace our lady of sighs creeps timidly and stealthily but this youngest sister moves with incalculable motions bounding and with tiger's leaps she carries no key for though coming rarely amongst men she storms all doors at which she is permitted to enter at all and her name is mater tenebrarum our lady of darkness these were the semni theae or sublime goddesses these were the eumenides or gracious ladies so called by antiquity in shuddering appropriation of my oxford dreams madonna spoke she spoke by her mysterious hand touching my head she said to our lady of sighs and what she spoke translated out of the signs which except in dreams no man reads was this lo here is he whom in childhood i dedicated to my altars this is he that once i made my darling him i led astray him i beguiled and from heaven i stole away his young heart to mine through me did he become idolatrous and through me it was by languishing desires that he worshipped the worm and prayed to the wormy grave holy was the grave to him lovely was its darkness saintly its corruption him this young idolater i have seasoned for thee dear gentle sister of sighs do thou 
take him now to thy heart and season him for our dreadful sister and thou turning to the mater tenebrorum she said wicked sister that temptest and hatest do thou take him from her see that thy sceptre lie heavy on his head suffer not woman and her tenderness to sit near him in his darkness banish the frailties of hope wither the relenting of love scorch the fountain of tears curse him as only thou canst curse so shall he be accomplished in the furnace so shall he see the things that ought not to be seen sights that are abominable and secrets that are unutterable so shall he read elder truths sad truths grand truths fearful truths so shall he rise again before he dies and so shall our commission be accomplished which from god we had to plague his heart until we had unfolded the capacities of his spirit end of lavana and our ladies of sorrow recording by timothy ferguson gold coast australia Lord Beden's Motor by John Harris Burland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rafe Ball. Lord Beden's Motor by John Harris Burland. A hard man was Ralph Strang, 7th Earl of Beden. Seventy years of age on his last birthday, but still upright as a dart, with hair white as snow, but with the devilry of youth still sparkling in his keen, dark eyes. He was, indeed, able to follow the hounds with the best of us, and there were few men, even among the youngest and most hot-headed of our riders, who cared to follow him over all the jumps he put his horse at. When I first came to Upston Way as a doctor, I thought it strange that so good a sportsman should be so unpopular. As a rule, a man can do pretty well anything in a sporting county, so long as he rides straight to hounds. But before I had been in the place a month, I attended him after a fall in the hunting field, and I saw that a man like that would be unpopular even if he gave all his goods to the poor and lived the life of St. Francis of Assisi. Not that he was harsh, or even unpleasant, but he had the knack of making one feel foolish and uncomfortable, and there was something in the expression of his eyes that made one unable to look him squarely in the face. His manners, indeed, were perfect, and he retained all the old-world courtliness which seems to have been permanently abandoned by this generation, but I could not help feeling that underneath all his politeness and even hospitality lay a solid substratum of contempt. It was doubtless this impression which had earned him his unpopularity, for I never heard a single one of his enemies lay anything definite to his charge, beyond the fact that his elder brother had died in a lunatic asylum, and that Lord Beden was in some vague way held responsible for this unfortunate event. But it was not until Lord Beden purchased a twelve-horsepower Napier motor-car that the villagers really began to consider him possessed of a devil, and certainly his spirit of devilry seemed to have found a worthy plaything in that grey mass of snorting machinery, which went through the lanes like a whirlwind, enveloped in a cloud of dust, and scattering every living thing close back against the hedges as a steamer dashes the waves against the banks of a river. I had often heard people whisper that he bore a charmed life in the hunting field, and that another, and better man would have been killed years ago, and he certainly carried the same spirit of dash and foolhardiness, and also the same good fortune, into a still more dangerous pursuit. It was the purchase of this car that brought me into closer contact with him. I had had some experience of motors, and he was sufficiently humble to take some instructions from me, and also to let me accompany him on several occasions. At first, I drove the car myself, and tried to inculcate a certain amount of caution by example, but after the third lesson he knew as much about it as I did, and, resigning the steering gear into his hands, I took my place by his side with some misgivings. 
I must confess that he handled it splendidly. The man had a wonderful nerve, and when an inch to one side or the other would probably have meant death, his keen eye never made a mistake, and his hand on the wheel was as steady as a rock. This inspired confidence, and though the strain on my nerves was considerable, I found, after a time, a certain pleasurable excitement in these rides. And it was excitement, I can tell you. No twelve miles an hour for Lord Beden, no precautionary breaks downhill, no wide curves for corners. He rode, as he did to hounds, straight and fast. Sometimes we had six inches to spare, but never more, and often as not another half-inch would have shot us both out of the car. We always seemed to come round a sharp corner on two wheels. It was certainly exhilarating, but there was something about it I did not quite like. I don't think I was physically afraid, but I recalled certain stories about Lord Beden's mad exploits in the hunting field, and it almost seemed to me as though he might be purposely riding for a fall. Then all at once my invitations to ride with him ceased. I thought at first that I had offended him, but I could think of no possible cause of offence, and, besides, his manner towards me had not changed in any way, and I dined with him more than once at Beden Hall, where he was as courteous and irritating as usual. However, he offered no explanation, and I certainly did not intend to ask for one. I watched him narrowly when we talked about the motor, but he made no mystery about his rides. I noticed, however, that he looked older and more careworn, and that his dark eyes burned now with an almost unnatural brilliancy. I met him two or three times on the road when I was going my rounds in the trap, and he appeared to be driving his machine more furiously and fearlessly than ever. I was almost glad that his invitations had ceased. Strangely enough, I always encountered him on the same road, one which led straight to Oxminster, a town about twenty miles away. One evening, however, late in August, while I was finishing my dinner in solitude, I heard a familiar hum and rattle along the road in the distance. In less than a minute I saw the flash of bright lamps through my open window and heard the jar of a brake. Then there was a ring at the bell, and Lord Beden was announced. "'Good evening, Scott,' he said, taking off his glasses. "'Lovely night, isn't it? Would you care to come for a ride?' He looked very pale, and was covered with dust from head to foot. "'A ride, Lord Beden,' I replied thoughtfully. "'Well, I hardly know what to say. Will you have some coffee and a cigar?' He nodded assent and sat down. I poured him out some coffee, and noticed that his hand shook as he raised the cup to his lips. But driving a motor car at a rapid rate might easily produce this effect. Then I handed him a cigar and lit one for myself. Rather late for a ride, isn't it? I said after a slight pause. Not a bit, not a bit, he answered hastily. It is as bright as day and the road's clear of traffic. Come, it will do you good. We can finish our cigars in the car. Yes, I replied thoughtfully, or at any rate the draft will finish them for us. "'Look here, Scott,' he continued in a lower voice, leaning over the table and looking me straight in the eyes. "'I particularly want you to come. In fact, you must come, to oblige me. I want you to see something which I have seen. I am a little doubtful of its actual existence.' I looked at him sharply. His voice was cold and quiet, but his eyes were certainly a bit too bright. I should say that he was in a state of intense excitement, yet with all his nerves well under control. I laughed a little uneasily. "'Very well, Lord Beden,' I replied, rising from my chair. "'I will come. But you will excuse me saying that you don't look well tonight. I think you are rather overdoing this motor business. It shakes the system up a good deal, you know.' "'I am not well, Scott,' he said. "'But you cannot cure me.' I said no more and left the room to put on my glasses and an overcoat. We set off through the village at about ten miles an hour. It was a glorious night, and the moon shone clear in the sky, but I noticed a bank of heavy black clouds in the west, and thought it not unlikely that we should have a thunderstorm. 
The atmosphere had been suffocating all day, and it was only the motion of the car that created the cool and pleasant breeze which blew against our faces. When we came to the church, we turned sharp to the right onto the Oxminster Road. It ran in a perfectly straight white line for three miles, then it began to wind and ascend the Oxbourne Hills, finally disappearing in the darkness of some woods which extend for nearly five miles over the summit in the direction of Oxminster. "'Where are we going to?' I asked, settling myself firmly in my seat. "'Oxminster,' he replied rather curtly. "'Please keep your eyes open and tell me if you see anything on the road.' As he spoke, he pulled the lever farther towards him, and the great machine shot forward with a sudden plunge which would have unseated me if I had not been prepared for something of the sort. We quickly gathered up speed. Hedges and trees went past us like a flash. The dust whirled up into the moonlight like a silver cloud, and before five minutes had elapsed, we were at the foot of the hills and were tearing up the slope at almost the same terrific pace. As we ascended, the foliage began to thicken and close in upon us on either side, then the moon disappeared, and only our powerful lamps illuminated the darkness ahead of us. The car was a magnificent hill-climber, but the gradient soon became so steep that the pace slackened down to about eight miles an hour. Lord Beden had not spoken a word since he told me where we were going to, but he had kept his eyes steadily fixed on the broad circle of light in front of the car. I began to find the silence and darkness oppressive, and, to say the truth, was not quite comfortable in my own mind about my companion's sanity. I took off my glasses and tried to pierce the darkness on either side. The moon filtered through the trees and made strange shadows in the depths of the woods, but there was nothing else to be seen, and ahead of us there was only a white streak of road disappearing into blackness. Then suddenly my companion let go of the steering gear with one hand and clutched me by the arm. "'Listen, Scott!' he cried. "'Do you hear it?' I listened attentively, and at first heard nothing but the throb of the motor and a faint rustling among the trees as a slight breeze began to stir through the wood. Then I noticed that the beat of the piston was not quite the same as usual. It sounded jerky and irregular, faint and loud alternately, and I had an idea that it had considerably quickened in speed. "'I hear nothing, Lord Beden,' I replied except that the engine sounds a little erratic. It ought not to make such a fuss over this hill. If you listen more carefully, he said, you will understand. That sound is the beat of two pistons, and one of them is some way off. I listened again. He was right. There was certainly another engine throbbing in the distance. I cannot see any lights. I answered, looking first in front of us and then into the darkness behind. But it's another motor, I suppose. It does not appear to me to be anything out of the way. He did not reply, but replaced his hand on the steering gear and peered anxiously ahead. I began to feel a bit worried about him. It was strange that he should get so excited about the presence of another motor car in the neighbourhood. I was not reassured either when, in rearranging the rug about my legs, I touched something hard in his pocket. I passed my fingers lightly over it, and had no doubt whatever that it was a revolver. I began to be sorry I had come. A revolver is not a necessary tool for the proper running of a motor car. We were nearly at the top of the hill now, and still in the shadow of the trees. The road here runs for more than a mile along the summit before it begins to descend, and halfway along the level another road crosses it at right angles, leading one way down a steep slope to Little Stanway, and the other along the top of the Oxbourne Hills to Kelston and Rutherton, two small villages some miles away on the edge of the moors. We had scarcely reached the level when a few heavy drops of rain began to fall, and, looking up, I saw that the moon was no longer visible through the branches overhead. A minute later there was a low roll of thunder in the distance, and for an instant the scenery ahead of us flashed bright and faded into darkness. I turned up the collar of my coat. The car was now moving almost at full speed, but to my surprise, before we had gone a quarter of a mile, Lord Beden slowed it down, and finally brought it to a full stop with the brake. 
Then he appeared to be listening attentively for something, but the rising wind and pouring rain had begun to make an incessant noise among the trees, and the thunder had become more loud and continuous. I strained my sense of hearing to the utmost, but I could hear nothing beyond the sounds of the elements. "'What is the matter?' I queried impatiently. "'Are we going to stop here?' "'Yes,' he replied curtly. "'That is to say, if you have no objection. There is a certain amount of shelter.' I drew a cigar from my pocket and, after several attempts, managed to light it. To say the truth, I was in hopes that we should go no farther. The downward descent, three quarters of a mile ahead of us, was about one in ten, and I did not feel much inclined to let my companion take me down a hill of that sort. Then, for a few seconds, the rustling of the wind and pattering of the rain ceased among the trees, and once more I could distinctly hear the thud, thud, thud of an engine. It might have been a motor car, but it certainly sounded to me more like the noise a traction engine would make. As we listened, the sound came nearer and nearer, and appeared to be on our left, still some distance down the hill. Then the storm broke out again with fresh fury, and we could hear nothing else. Lord Beden pulled the lever towards him, and we ran slowly forward, until we were within thirty yards of the crossroads, when he again brought the machine to a standstill. The noise had become much louder now, and was even audible above the roar of the wind and rain. It certainly came from somewhere on our left. I looked down through the trees, and thought I saw a faint red glow some way down the hill. Lord Beden saw it too, and pointed to it with a trembling hand. "'Looks like a fire in the wood,' I said carelessly. I did not very much care what it was. "'Don't be a fool,' he replied sharply. "'Can't you see it's moving?' Yes, he was right. It was certainly moving, and in a few seconds it was hidden by a thicker mass of foliage. I did not, however, see anything very noticeable about it. It was evidently coming up the road to our left, and was probably a belated traction engine returning home from the reaping. I was more than ever convinced of my companion's insanity, and wished that I was safe at home. I had half a mind to get off the car and walk, but he had by now managed to infect me with some of his own fear and excitement, and I did not quite fancy being left with no swifter mode of progression than my feet. The thumping sound came nearer and nearer, and, as we heard it more distinctly, was even more suggestive of a traction engine. Then I saw a red light through the trees, like the glow of a furnace, and not more than fifty yards away from us. My companion laid his left hand on the lever and stared intently at the corner. Then a rather peculiar thing happened. Whatever it was that had been lumbering slowly up the hill like a gigantic snail suddenly shot across the road in front of us like a streak of smoke and flame, and through the trees to our right I could see the red glow spinning up the road to Kelston at over thirty miles an hour. Almost simultaneously Lord Beden pulled down the lever and I instinctively clutched the seat with both hands. We shot forward took the corner with about an inch to spare between us and the ditch, and dashed off along the road in hot pursuit. But the red glow had got at least a quarter of a mile start, and I could not see what it proceeded from. A flash of lightning, however, showed a dark mass flying before us in a cloud of smoke. It looked something like a large wagon, with a chimney sticking out of it, and sparks streamed out of the back of it until they looked like the tail of a comet. "'What the deuce is it?' I said. "'You'll see when we come up to it,' the Earl answered between his teeth. "'We shall go faster in a few minutes.' We were, however, going quite fast enough for me, and though I have ridden on many motors since, and occasionally at a greater speed, I shall never forget that ride along the Kelston Road. The powerful machine beneath us trembled as though it were going to fall to pieces, the rain lashed our faces like the thongs of a whip, the thunder almost deafened us, the lightning first blinded us with its flashes and then left us in more confusing darkness, and, to crown all, a dense volume of smoke poured from the machine in front and hid the light of our own lamps. 
it would be hard to imagine worse conditions for a motor ride and a man who could keep a steady hand on the steering gear under circumstances like these was a man indeed i should not have cared to try it even in the daytime but lord beden's luck was with him still and we moved as though guided by some unseen hand you will find a small lever by your side scott he said after a long pause pull it towards you until it gives a click it is an invention of my own i found the handle and following out his instructions saw the arc of light from our lamps shoot another fifty yards ahead leaving the ground immediately in front of the car in darkness we had gained considerably the light just impinged on the streaming tail of sparks at last my companion muttered he has always had half a mile start before and the oil has given out before i could catch him but he cannot escape us now what is it lord beden i'm glad you see it he replied i thought before tonight that it was a fancy of my brain of course i see it i said sharply i'm not blind but what is it he did not answer but a flash of lightning showed me his face and i did not repeat the question mile after mile we spun along the lonely country road but never gaining another inch we dashed through kelston like a streak of light it was fortunate that all the inhabitants were in bed then we shot out onto a road leading across the open moor which stretches from here to the sea twenty miles away and i remembered that eight miles from kelston there was a deep descent into the valley of the store and it was scarcely possible that we could escape destruction i quickly made up my mind to overpower lord beden and gain control of the machine then we suddenly began to sweep down a long and gentle gradient and second after second our speed increased until the arc of light shone on the machine ahead of us and i could see what manner of thing it was that we pursued it was i suppose a kind of motor-car but unlike anything i had ever seen before and bearing no more resemblance to a modern machine than a bone-shaker of twenty years ago does to the modern free-wheel it appeared to be built of iron and was painted a dead black in the forepart of the structure a five-foot flywheel spun round at a terrific speed and various bars and beams moved rapidly backwards and forwards the chimney was quite ten feet in height and poured out a dense volume of smoke on a small platform behind railed in by a stout iron rail stood a tall man with his back to us his dark hair which must have reached nearly to his shoulders streamed behind him in the wind in each hand he grasped a huge lever and he was apparently gazing steadily into the darkness before him though it seemed to me that he might just as well have shut his eyes for the machine had no lamps and the only light in the whole concern streamed out from the half-open furnace door then to my amazement i saw the man take his hands off the levers and coolly proceed to shovel coal into the roaring fire I held my breath, expecting to see the flying mass of iron shoot off the side of the road and turn head over heels down the sloping grass. But nothing happened. The machine apparently required no guidance and proceeded on its way as smoothly and swiftly as before. I took hold of my companion's arm and called his attention to this somewhat strange circumstance. He only laughed. "'Look at the smoke!' he cried that is rather strange too i looked up and saw it pouring over our heads in a long straight cloud but i did not notice anything odd about it and i said so can you smell it he continued i sniffed and noticed for the first time that there had been no smell of smoke at all though in the earlier part of the journey we had been half blinded with it i began to feel uncomfortable there was certainly something unusual about the machine in front of us and i came to the conclusion that we had had about enough of this kind of sport i think we will go back lord beden i remarked pleasantly moving one hand towards the lever you will go back to perdition scott he answered quietly if you meddle with me we shall be smashed to pieces 
We are going forty miles an hour, and if you distract my attention for a single instant, I won't answer for the consequences. I felt the truth of what he said, and put my hand ostentatiously in my pocket. It was quite evident that I couldn't interfere with him, and equally evident that if we went on as we were going now, we should be dashed to pieces. My only hope was that we should speedily accomplish whatever mad purpose Lord Beden had in his mind, although by now I began to think that he had no other object than suicide. The valley of the store was only two miles off. But we had been gaining inch by inch down the slope, and were now not more than thirty yards from the machine in front of us. Showers of sparks whirled into our faces, and I kept one arm before my eyes. I soon found, however, that, for some reason or other, the sparks did not burn my skin, and I was able to resume a more comfortable position and study the occupant of the car. His figure somehow seemed strangely familiar to me, and I tried hard to recollect where I had seen those square shoulders and long, lean limbs before. I wished I could see the man's face, for I was quite certain that I should recognise it. But he never looked back, and appeared to be absolutely unconscious of our presence so close behind him. Nearer we crept, and still nearer, until our front wheels were not more than ten feet from the platform. The glow of the furnace bathed my companion's face in crimson light, and the figure of the man in front of us stood out like a black demon toiling at the eternal fires. "'Be careful, Lord Beaton!' I cried. "'We shall be into it!' He turned to me with a smile of triumph, and I thought I saw the light of madness in his eyes. "'Do you know what I'm going to do?' he said in a low voice, putting his lips close to my ear. "'I'm going to break it to bits. We have a little speed in hand yet, and when we get to the slope of the store valley, I shall break the cursed thing to bits!' "'For heaven's sake!' I cried. "'Put the brake on, Lord Beden. Are you mad?' And I gripped him by the arm. He shook my hand off, and I clung to my seat with every muscle of my body strained to the utmost, for as I spoke there was a flash of lightning, and I saw the road dipping, 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 and far below the gleam of water among dark trees, and on the height above a large building with many spires and towers— I idly called to mind that it was the Rockshire County Asylum. Our speed quickened horribly, and the car began to sway from side to side. I saw my companion pull the lever an inch nearer to him and grip the steering wheel with both hands. Then suddenly the road seemed to fall away beneath us. We sprang off the ground and dropped downward and forward like a stone flung from a precipice. We were going to smash clean through the machine in front of us. For five seconds I held my breath, only awaiting the awful crash of splintering wood and iron and the shock that would fling us fifty feet from our seats. But we only touched the ground with a sickening thud an inch behind the other machine, and then a wonderful thing happened. We began to slowly pierce the rail and platform in front of us, until the man seemed to be almost touching our feet, and at last... I saw his face, a wild, dark face with madness in the eyes, and the face of Lord Beden, as I had seen a portrait of him in Beden Hall taken thirty years ago. My companion rose on his seat and grappled with his own likeness, but he seemed to be only clutching the air, and neither car nor occupant appeared to have any tangible substance. Steadily and silently, we bored our way clean through the machine, inch by inch, foot by foot, through the blazing furnace, through the framework of the boiler, through bolt and bar and stanchion, through whirring flywheel and pulsing shaft and piston, until there was nothing beyond us but the dip of the white road, and, looking back, I saw the whole dark mass running behind our back wheels. Lord Beden was still standing and tearing at the air with his fingers. Our car was running without guidance, and I sprang to the steering wheel and reversed the lever. But it was too late. We struck something at the side of the road, and the whole machine made a leap from the ground. 
There was a rush of air, an awful shock and crash, and then... Darkness! A week afterwards, in the hospital, they told me Lord Beden was dead. He had fallen on a large piece of scrap iron by the roadside, and nearly every bone in his body had been broken. I myself had had a miraculous escape by falling into a thick clump of gorse and had gotten off with a broken arm and dislocated collarbone, but I was not able to get about for two months. I said nothing of what had happened, and the accident required but little explanation. Motorcar accidents are common enough, especially on slopes like that of the Store Valley. When I was able to get about, however, I visited the scene of the disaster. A friend of mine, one of the doctors at the County Lunatic Asylum, called for me and drove me over to the place. The smash had occurred nearly halfway down the hillside, close to a ruined shed. The ground was covered with gorse and bracken, but here and there huge pieces of rusty iron were scattered about. Some of them were sharp and brown and ugly, but many were overgrown with creeping convolvulus. They looked as if they had once been parts of some great machine. "'Curious coincidence,' said my companion, as we drove away from the place. "'What do you mean?' I have been told, he continued, that thirty years ago this old shed was used by the late Earl's elder brother. He was a mechanical genius, and they say that his efforts to work out some particular invention in a practical form drove him off his head. He was allowed to have this place as a workshop, and, under the supervision of two keepers, worked on his invention till the day of his death. It was thought that, perhaps, he would recover his reason if ever he accomplished the task. But in some mysterious way his plans were stolen from him no fewer than three times, and after the third time the poor fellow lost heart and destroyed himself. I have heard it whispered by one of my colleagues up yonder that the late Earl was not altogether ignorant of these thefts, but this is probably only gossip. All the fragments of iron you saw lying about were parts of the machine. Heaven knows what it was. I did not venture any suggestion on this point, but I think I could have done so. End of Lord Beedon's Motor Recording by Rafe Bull The Parrot by Guy de Maupassant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. The Parrot by Guy de Maupassant. 1. Everybody in Ficamp knew Mother Patin's story. She had certainly been unfortunate with her husband, for in his lifetime he used to beat her, just as wheat is threshed in the barn. He was a master of a fishing bark and had married her formerly because she was pretty, although poor. Patin was a good sailor, but brutal. He used to frequent Father Aubin's inn, where he would usually drink four or five glasses of brandy, on lucky days eight or ten glasses and even more according to his mood. The brandy was served to the customers by Father Aubin's daughter, a pleasing brunette who attracted people to the house only by her pretty face, for nothing had ever been gossiped about her. Patin, when he entered the inn, would be satisfied to look at her and to compliment her politely and respectfully. After he had had his first glass of brandy, he would already find her much nicer. At the second, he would wink. At the third, he would say, If you were only willing, Mademoiselle Desiree, without ever finishing his sentence. At the fourth, he would try to hold her back by her skirt in order to kiss her. And when he went as high as ten, it was Father Aubin who brought him the remaining drinks. The old innkeeper, who knew all the tricks of the trade, made Desiree walk about between the tables in order to increase the consumption of drinks, and Desiree, who was a worthy daughter of Father Aubin, flitted around among the benches and joked with them, her lips smiling and her eyes sparkling. Patin got so well accustomed to Desiree's face that he thought of it even while at sea, when throwing out his nets, in storms or in calms, on moonlit or dark evenings. 
He thought of her while holding the tiller in the stern of his boat, while his four companions were slumbering with their heads on their arms. He always saw her, smiling, pouring out the yellow brandy with a peculiar shoulder movement and then exclaiming as she turned away, There, now are you satisfied? He saw her so much in his mind's eye that he was overcome by an irresistible desire to marry her, and not being able to hold out any longer, he asked for her hand. He was rich, owned his own vessel, his nets, and a little house at the foot of the hill on the retinue, whereas Father Aubin had nothing. The marriage was therefore eagerly agreed upon, and the wedding took place as soon as possible, as both parties were desirous for the affair to be concluded as early as convenient. Three days after the wedding, Patin could no longer understand how he had ever imagined Desiree to be different from other women. What a fool he had been to encumber himself with a penniless creature who had undoubtedly inveigled him with some drug which she had put in his brandy. He would curse all day long, break his pipe with his teeth and maul his crew. After he had sworn by every known term at everything that came his way, he would rid himself of his remaining anger on the fish and lobsters which he pulled from the nets and threw into the baskets amid oaths and foul language. When he returned home, he would find his wife, Father Aubin's daughter, within reach of his mouth and hand, and it was not long before he treated her like the lowest creature in the world. As she listened calmly, accustomed to paternal violence, he grew exasperated at her quiet, and one evening he beat her. Then life at his home became unbearable. For ten years, the principal topic of conversation on the retinue was about the beatings that Patin gave his wife and his manner of cursing at her for the least thing. He could, indeed, curse with a richness of vocabulary and a roundness of tone unequaled by other men in Facamp. As soon as his ship was sighted at the entrance of the harbor returning from the fishing expedition, every one awaited the first volley he would hurl from the bridge as soon as he perceived his wife's white cap. Standing at the stern, he would steer, his eye fixed on the bows and on the sail, and, notwithstanding the difficulty of the narrow passage and the height of the turbulent waves, he would search among the watching women and try to recognize his wife, Father Aubin's daughter, the wretch. Then, as soon as he saw her, notwithstanding the noise of the wind and the waves, he would let loose upon her with such power and volubility that everyone would laugh, although they pitied her greatly. When he arrived at the dock, he would relieve his mind while unloading the fish in such an expressive manner that he attracted around him all the loafers of the neighborhood. The words left his mouth sometimes like shots from a cannon, short and terrible, sometimes like peals of thunder which roll and rumble for five minutes, such a hurricane of oaths that he seemed to have in his lungs one of the storms of the Eternal Father. When he left his ship and found himself face to face with her, surrounded by all the gossips of the neighborhood, he would bring up a new cargo of insults and bring her back to their dwelling, she in front, he behind, she weeping, he yelling at her. At last, when alone with her behind closed doors, he would thrash her on the slightest pretext. The least thing was sufficient to make him raise his hand, and when he had once begun he did not stop, but he would throw into her face the true motive for his anger. At each blow he would roar, There, you beggar! There, you wretch! There, you pauper! What a bright thing I did when I rinsed my mouth with your rascal of a father's apology for brandy! The poor woman lived in continual fear, in a ceaseless trembling of body and soul, in everlasting expectation of outrageous thrashings. This lasted ten years. She was so timorous that she would grow pale whenever she spoke to anyone, and she thought of nothing but the blows with which she was threatened, and she became thinner, more yellow and drier than a smoked fish. 2. One night, when her husband was at sea, she was suddenly awakened by the wild roaring of the wind. She sat up in her bed, trembling, but as she heard nothing more, she lay down again. Almost immediately there was a roar in the chimney which shook the entire house. It seemed to cross the heavens like a pack of furious animals, snorting and roaring. Then she arose and rushed to the harbor. Other women were arriving from all sides, carrying lanterns. The men were also gathering, and all were watching the foaming crests of the breaking wave. The storm lasted fifteen hours. Eleven sailors never returned. Patin was among them. In the neighborhood of Dieppe, the wreck of his bark, the Jeune Amélie, was found. 
The bodies of his sailors were found near saint Valery, but his body was never recovered. As his vessel seemed to have been cut in two, his wife expected and feared his return for a long time, for if there had been a collision, he alone might have been picked up and carried afar off. Little by little she grew accustomed to the thought that she was rid of him, although she would start every time that a neighbor, a beggar, or a peddler would enter suddenly. One afternoon, about four years after the disappearance of her husband, while she was walking along the Rue aux Juifs, she stopped before the house of an old sea captain who had recently died and whose furniture was for sale. Just at that moment, a parrot was at auction. He had green feathers and a blue head and was watching everybody with a displeased look. Three francs!' cried the auctioneer. "'A bird that can talk like a lawyer. Three francs!' A friend of the Patin woman nudged her and said, "'You ought to buy that, you who are rich. It would be good company for you. That bird is worth more than thirty francs. Anyhow, you can always sell it for twenty or twenty-five. Patin's widow added fifty centimes, and the bird was given her in a little cage which she carried away. She took it home, and as she was opening the wire door in order to give it something to drink, he bit her finger and drew blood. Oh, how naughty he is, she said. Nevertheless, she gave it some hemp seed and corn and watched it pruning its feathers as it glanced warily at its new home and its new mistress. On the following morning, just as day was breaking, the Patin woman distinctly heard a loud, deep, roaring voice calling, Are you going to get up, Carrion? Her fear was so great that she hid her head under the sheets, for when Patin was with her as soon as he would open his eyes, he would shout those well-known words into her ears. Trembling, rolled into a ball, her back prepared for the thrashing which she already expected, her face buried in the pillows, she murmured, Good Lord, he is here, good Lord, he is here, good Lord, he has come back. Minutes passed. No noise disturbed the quiet room. Then, trembling, she stuck her head out of the bed, sure that he was there, watching, ready to beat her. Except for a ray of sun shining through the window, she saw nothing, and she said to herself, He must be hidden. She waited a long time, and then, gaining courage, she said to herself, I must have dreamed it, seeing there is nobody here. A little reassured, she closed her eyes, when from quite near a furious voice, the thunderous voice of the drowned man, could be heard crying, Say, when in the name of all that's holy are you going to get up, you b She jumped out of bed, moved by obedience, by the passive obedience of a woman accustomed to blows and who still remembers and always will remember that voice. She said, Here I am, Patin, what do you want? But Patin did not answer. Then, at a complete loss, she looked around her, then in the chimney and under the bed, and finally sank into a chair, wild with anxiety, convinced that Patin's soul alone was there, near her, and that he had returned in order to torture her. Suddenly she remembered the loft, in order to reach which one had to take a ladder. Surely he must have hidden there in order to surprise her. He must have been held by savages on some distant shore, unable to escape until now, and he had returned worse than ever. There was no doubting the quality of that voice. She raised her head and asked, Are you up there, Patin? Patin did not answer. Then, with a terrible fear which made her heart tremble, she climbed the ladder, opened the skylight, looked, saw nothing, entered, looked about, and found nothing. Sitting on some straw, she began to cry, but while she was weeping, overcome by a poignant and supernatural terror, she heard Patin talking in the room below. He seemed less angry, and he was saying, Nasty weather, fierce wind, nasty weather, I haven't eaten, damn it. She cried through the ceiling, Here I am, Patin, I am getting your meal ready, don't get angry. She ran down again. There was no one in the room. She felt herself growing weak as if death were touching her, and she tried to run and get help from the neighbors when a voice near her cried out, I haven't had my breakfast, by g And the parrot in his cage watched her with his round, knowing, wicked eye. She, too, looked at him wildly, murmuring, Ah, so it's you. He shook his head and continued, Just you wait, I'll teach you how to loaf. What happened within her? She felt, she understood that it was he, the dead man, who had come back, who had disguised himself in the feathers of this bird in order to continue to torment her, that he would curse as formerly all day long and bite her and swear at her in order to attract the neighbors and make them laugh. Then she rushed for the cage and seized the bird, which scratched and tore her flesh with its claws and beak. 
but she held it with all her strength between her hands. She threw it on the ground and rolled over it with the frenzy of one possessed. She crushed it and finally made of it nothing but a little green flabby lump which no longer moved or spoke. Then she wrapped it in a cloth, as in a shroud, and she went out in her nightgown, barefoot. She crossed the dock, against which the choppy waves of the sea were beating, and she shook the cloth and let drop this little dead thing which looked like so much grass. Then she returned, threw herself on her knees before the empty cage, and, overcome by what she had done, kneeled and prayed for forgiveness, as if she had committed some heinous crime. End of The Parrot The Reaper by Dorothy Easton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Reaper by Dorothy Easton Millgate was a rich farmer, owning his own machines, not like those poorer, smaller men who hired an engine from a neighbor. He has his reaping machine, a red and yellow Walter Wood Cleveland brand. Every morning now, as soon as it's dry enough, about nine o'clock, the engine starts, and from the farmer's manor house, its heavy, drowsy sounds are heard. For those on the machine, the noise is harder. The only human sound that penetrates it is the old conductor's oi to the driver if the canvas sticks or if weeds are making a block. Then the young man in front slows his engine down and wipes his forehead with his hand. Reaping goes on until nine at night. No strange man sits on the reaper, but one of Millgate's best men the most trustworthy, the most faithful, the wagoner. A man well over sixty, with side whiskers, gray eyes, a long nose, and a forehead and chin carved out of granite. On his head a flat, wide-awake hat. On his bent back a white jacket. When he speaks his mouth moves sideways first. There's always a spot of dried blood on his lip. When he smiles, a tooth stump appears like an ancient fossil. He talks slowly, stopping to spit now and then. Every day of his life, he gets up at half past three. Now, mounted on the high iron seat, a crumpled sack for a saddle, he rides like some old charioteer, a Hercules with great bowed back, head jutting out chin straight, a hard, weathered look about his face, and in his heart disgust. This year, for the first time, they are using a motor engine to pull a reaper around instead of horses. He lived for his horses. He's the wagoner, and they are his job. If one falls ill, he sleeps with it. He believes in horses, but speaking of the motor, he says, She's all right when she's all right with a look that ends the sentence for him in his youth he had reaped with a scythe this walter wood is a neat arrangement you can't deny that one bit of the mechanism works as a divider while a big light kind of wooden windmill arrangement continually revolving beats the corn down into a flat pan from which it's carried on a canvas slide up an incline, then shot over and down the other side in a continual long flat stream, like yellow matting. And then the needle, the threadle, as he calls it, nips in somewhere, binding the flat masses into separate, neat, round sheaves, pitched out every few moments with perfect precision by a three pronged iron fork. Above the one big, heavy central wheel, the charioteer is shaken and jolted from nine till nine. In front, on another iron seat by the box-like engine, the driver works. Behind runs a red-faced laborer, clearing corners. 
the motor has to run out the full length of its cogged iron wheel bands before it can turn and the sheaves dropped on the last round get in the way so at every corner they have to be lifted and set back the laborer clears then runs after the machine now halfway up the field stops at the next corner stoops once more to lift and shift three sheaves then runs again this laborer was a man of forty with a face as naive as a boy of fifteen though getting bald his eyes were young his mouth loose untrained as a child's he's touched as we say and had never really grown up he slept in the attic ate in the kitchen and worked but was not responsible he was always given light jobs walking with the clappers weeding cleaning styes clearing his greatest friend was a boy of twelve on sundays they'd laugh for an hour at nothing going to the coast for the first time last year he was so taken by a punch and judy show that he never saw the sea his smile was the most ridiculous thing in the world he blushed continually panted grinned like some boy caught kissing and was always apologetic lightning made him hide his head and he was afraid of engines their regularity upset him running behind the reaper this quick-moving noisy thing smelling of oil made up of sliding chains appalled him there were five wheels at an angle and all the time an oil-wet black flat chain band ran around over them underneath the heavy central wheel ran round and round to the imbecile the wagoner's courage appeared supernatural there should have been another man to take two corners but all hands were wanted so the laborer had to run all day it was hot no wind no shade if he looked up for a moment the hills and distant elms appeared bright blue the big field itself was ablaze with color wheat like brown burnt amber poppies small white daisies thistles when the engines stopped the only sounds were plaintive anxious bird calls from the center of the field sometimes a rabbit or hare looked out then bolted back once five graceful sleek brown pheasants ran out toward the hedge then lost their nerve turned and went running back the sun shone steadily sheaves picked up by the laborer made his hands smell oily their string band raised a blister on his forefinger very often he grabbed hold of nettles and sharp thistles and the backs of his hands were swollen and covered with stings blue butterflies twirled in front of his face pale moths flew out when his hat fell off he had no time to get it the sweat ran down his egg-shaped forehead to his long square hairy chin though he could shave himself on sundays he looked a little like a monkey when the engine stuck the wagoner asked in his slow flat voice won't she speak she's not coming out was the youth's reply once the driver was thrown up a foot when the motor went over a hole he yelled men are often killed by the reaper the imbecile got the startled look of a child seeing snakes at the zoo each time the engine snorted or the wagoner called out oi a spurt of water ran down his spine the blood was beating in his head the sun shone mercilessly on his pale bald patch the field began to bounce before his eyes bloodshot from stooping when the yards of bindweed shackled the machinery the wagoner just turned his head a sign for the laborer who had to run had to catch and tear away the long green chains full of small pink flowers by four o'clock they were overtaking him before he got round the driver had to turn more sharply the canvas stuck don't you do that again the old wagoner scolded with stern eye you'll turn us over 
The engine stuck when they tried to start it again. For half an hour the young driver tinkered with the tools from the box, unscrewing small oily nuts, testing wires, feeling levers, and in desperation wiped his black dripping hands on his hair. Twenty times he turned the starting handle, but she wouldn't speak. Then suddenly, with a sound like a pistol shot, the engine fired. The machine ran backward, upsetting the laborer, and before he could move, the central wheel ran over his ankles. When the imbecile came to himself, they were still at the corner. His feet were tied up in a jacket. He was suffering horribly, yet seemed unable to focus it. But seeing the red and yellow reaper standing close beside his head, some memory soaked his face with sweat. He fainted. Brandy was fetched. They lifted him onto a hurdle when he recovered again. The whole group were still at the corner. His employer stood there, stout, well-dressed, and anxious, in his gray felt hat, dark coat and trousers. The driver stood there, too, and the old wagoner. Corn was still up in the middle of the field. The laborer looked surprised at seeing sky before him. As a rule, when he started, he saw fields. He turned his face. The men watching saw his round, boyish eyes project at sight of something red and wet and sticky, like the mess they made out sheep-killing, splashing on the stubble, while two broken boots lay oozing the same stuff in a large pool of it. Following this look, the old wagoner said slowly, Er, my boy, them are yours. Tears were running down his stiff, dry cheeks. How do you feel? asked the farmer. His laborer blushed, then whispered to the wagoner. What's happening, Mr. Collard? Why, you've lost your feet. For yet another minute the imbecile lay panting, shy, self-conscious, under his master's eye, until the idea struck him. Once more whispering to the wagoner, he said, Help me up. I'll go home, Willie. You can't walk, said the old man simply. You can't walk no more. The black hair stiffened suddenly on the idiot's chin. He had understood that in those bleeding, mangled boots his feet were lying. He began to cry. And then, catching sight of his master, smiled as though to apologize. The End of The Reaper by Dorothy Easton The Signal Man by Charles Dickens This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shreya Sethi The Signal Man by Charles Dickens Hello! Below there! When he heard a voice calling thus to him, he was standing at the door of his box with a flag in his hand, furled round its short pole. One would have thought, considering the nature of the ground, that he could not have doubted from what quarter the voice came. But instead of looking up to where I stood on the top of the steep cutting nearly over his head, he turned himself about and looked down the line. There was something remarkable in his manner of doing so, though I could not have said for my life what. But I know it was remarkable enough to attract my notice even though his figure was foreshortened and shadowed down in the deep trench and mine was high above him, so steeped in the glow of an angry sunset that I had shaded my eyes with my hand before I saw him at all. Hello, below. From looking down the line, he turned himself about again and raising his eyes, saw my figure high above him. Is there any path by which I can come down and speak to you? 
He looked up at me without replying, and I looked down at him without pressing him too soon with the repetition of my idle question. Just then, there came a vague vibration in the earth and air, quickly changing into a violent pulsation and an oncoming rush that caused me to start back as though it had forced to draw me down. When such vapour as rose to my height from this rapid train that passed me and was skimming away over the landscape, I looked down again and saw him refurling the flag he had shown while the train went by. I repeated my inquiry after a pause, during which he seemed to regard me with fixed attention. He motioned with his rolled-up flag towards a point on my level, some two or three hundred yards distant. I called down to him, All right, and made for that point. There, by dint of looking closely about me, I found a rough zigzag descending path notched out, which I followed. The cutting was extremely deep and unusually precipitate. It was made through a clammy stone that became oozier and wetter as I went down. For these reasons, I found the way long enough to give me time to recall a singular air of reluctance or compulsion with which he had pointed out the path. When I came down low enough upon the zigzag descent to see him again, I saw that he was standing between the rails on the way by which the train had lately passed in an attitude as if he were waiting for me to appear. He had his left hand at his chin and that his left elbow rested on his right hand, crossed over his breast. His attitude was one of such expectation and watchfulness that I stopped a moment, wondering at it. I resumed my downward way and stepping out upon the level of the railroad and drawing nearer to him, saw that he was a dark, sallow man with a dark beard and rather heavy eyebrows. His post was in as solitary and dismal a place as ever I saw. On either side, a dripping wet wall of jagged stone, including all view but a stripe of sky, the perspective one way only, only a crooked prolongation of this great dungeon the shorter perspective in the other direction terminating into a gloomy red light and the gloomier entrance of a black tunnel, in whose massive architecture there was a barbarous, depressing and forbidding air. So little sunlight ever found its way to this spot that it had an earthy, deadly smell, and so much cold wind rushed through it that it struck chill to me as if I had left the natural world. Before he stirred, I was near enough to him to have touched him. Not even then removing his eyes from mine, he stepped back one step and lifted his hand. This was a lonely post to occupy, I said, and it had riveted my attention when I looked down from up yonder. A visitor was a rarity, I should suppose. Not an unwelcome rarity, I hoped. In me, he merely saw a man who had been shut up within narrow limits all his life and who, being at last set free, had a newly awakened interest in these great works. To such purpose, I spoke to him, but I am far from sure of the terms I used, for besides that I am not happy in opening any conversation. There was something in the man that taunted me. He directed a most curious look towards the red light near the tunnel's mouth and looked all about it, as if something were missing from it, and then looked at me. That light was part of his charge, was it not? He answered in a low voice, Don't you know it is? The monstrous thought came into my mind as I perused the fixed eyes and the saturnine face that this was a spirit, not a man. I have speculated since whether there may have been infection in his mind. In my turn, I stepped back, but in making the action, I detected in his eyes some latent fear of me. This put the monstrous thought to flight. You look at me, I said, forcing a smile, 
as if you had a dread of me. I was doubtful, he returned, whether I had seen you before. Where? He pointed to the red light he looked at. There, I said. Intently watchful of me, he replied, but without sound. Yes. My good fellow, what should I do there? However, be that as it may, I was never there, you may swear. I think I may, he rejoined. Yes, I am sure I may. His manner cleared like my own. He replied to my marks with readiness and in well-chosen words. Had he much to do there? Yes, that was to say he had enough responsibility to bear, but exactness and watchfulness were what was required of him, and of actual work. Manual labour, he had next to none. To change that signal, to trim those lights, and to turn this iron handle now and then, was all he had to do under that head. Regarding those many long and lonely hours of which I seemed to make so much, he could only say that the routine of his life had shaped itself into that form, and he had grown used to it. He had taught himself a language down here, if only to know it by sight and to have performed his own crude ideas of its pronunciation could be called learning it. He had also worked at fractions and decimals and tried a little algebra, but he was and had been as a boy a poor hand at figures. Was it necessary for him when on duty always to remain in that channel of damp air and could he never rise into the sunshine from between those high stone walls? Why that depended upon times and circumstances, and as some conditions there would be less upon the line than under others, and the same held good as to certain hours of the day and night. In bright weather, he did choose occasions for getting a little over these lower shadows, but, being at all times liable to be called by his electric bell, and at such times listening for it with redoubled anxiety, the relief was less than I suppose. He took me into his box, where there was a fire, a desk for an official book in which he had to make certain entries, a telegraphic instrument with its dial, face and needles, and the little bell of which he had spoken. On my trusting that he would excuse the remark that he had been well-educated, and I hoped I might say without offence, perhaps educated above that station, he observed that instances of slight incongruity in such wise would rarely be found wanting among large bodies of men, that he had heard it, was so in workhouses, in the police force, even in that last desperate resource, the army, and that he knew it was so, more or less, in any great railway staff. He had been, when young, if I could believe it, sitting in that hut, he scarcely could, a student of natural philosophy, and had attended lectures, but he had run wild, misused his opportunities, gone down, and never risen again. He had no complaint to offer about that. He had made his bed, and he lay upon it. It was far too late to make another. All that I have here condensed, he said, in a quiet manner, with his grave, dark regards divided between me and the fire. He threw in the word sir from time to time, and especially when he referred to his youth, as though to request me to understand that he claimed to be nothing but what I found him. He was several times interrupted by the little bell, and had to read off messages and send replies. Once, he had to stand without the door and display a flag as a train passed and make some verbal communication to the driver. In the discharge of his duties, I observed him to be remarkably exact and vigilant, breaking off his discourse at a syllable and remaining silent until what he had to do was done. In a word, I should have set this man down as one of the safest of men to be employed in that capacity but for the circumstance that, while he was speaking to me, he twice broke off with a fallen colour 
turned his face towards the little bell when it did not ring, opened the door of the hut, which was kept shut to exclude the unhealthy damp, and looked out towards the red light near the mouth of the tunnel. On both of those occasions, he came back to the fire with the inexplicable air upon him, which I had remarked, without being able to define when we were so far asunder. Said I, when I rose to leave him, You almost make me think that I have met with a contented man. I am afraid I must acknowledge that I said it to lead him on. I believe I used to be so, he rejoined in the low voice in which he had first spoken. But I am troubled, sir. I am troubled. He would have recalled the words if he could. He had said them, however, and I took them up quickly. With what? What is your trouble? It is very difficult to impart, sir. It is very, very difficult to speak of. If ever you make me another visit, I will try to tell you. But I expressly intend to make you another visit. Say, when shall it be? I go off early in the morning, and I shall be on again at ten tomorrow night, sir. I will come at eleven. He thanked me and went out at the door with me. I'll show you my white light, sir, he said in his peculiar low voice, till you have found the way up. When you have found it, don't call out. And when you are at the top, don't call out. His manner seemed to make the place strike colder to me, but I said no more than, Very well. And when you come out tomorrow night, don't call out. Let me ask you a parting question. What made you cry hello below there tonight? Heaven knows, said I. I cried something to that effect. Not to that effect, sir. Those were the very words. I know them well. Admit those were the very words. I said them, no doubt, because I saw you below. For no other reason? What other reason could I possibly have? You had no feeling that they were conveyed to you in any supernatural way? No. He wished me good night and held up his light. I walked by the side of the down line of rails with a very disagreeable sensation of a train coming behind me until I found the path. It was easier to mount than to descend and I got back to my inn without any adventure. Punctual to my appointment, I placed my foot on the first notch of the zigzag next night. As the distant clocks were striking eleven, he was waiting for me at the bottom with his white light on. I have not called out, I said, when we came close together. May I speak now? By all means, sir. Good night, then, and here's my hand. Good night, sir, and here's mine. With that, we walked side by side to his box, entered it, closed the door, and sat down by the fire. I have made up my mind, sir. He began bending forward as soon as we were seated and speaking in a tone but a little above a whisper that you shall not have to ask me twice what troubles me. I took you for someone else yesterday evening. That troubles me. That mistake? No, that's someone else. Who is it? I don't know. Like me? I don't know. I never saw the face. The left arm is across the face and the right arm is waved, violently waved, this way. I followed his action with my eyes and it was the action of an arm gesticulating with the utmost passion and vehemence. For God's sake, clear the way. One moonlight night, said the man, I was sitting here when I heard a voice cry, Hello below there. I started up looked from that door and saw this someone else is standing by the red light near the tunnel, waving as I just showed you. The voice seemed hoarse with shouting and it cried, Look out! Look out! And then again, 
Hello, below there, look out. I caught up my lamp, turned it on red, and ran towards the figure calling. What's wrong? What has happened? Where? It stood just below the blackness of the tunnel. I advanced so close upon it that I wondered at its keeping the sleeve above its eyes. I ran right up at it and had my hand stretched out to pull the sleeve away when it was gone. Into the tunnel, said I. No, I ran on into the tunnel five hundred yards. I stopped and held my light above my head and saw that the figures of the measured distance and saw the wet stains stealing down the walls and trickling through the arch. I ran out again, faster than I had run in, for I had a mortal abhorrence of the place upon me, and I looked all around the red light with my own red light, and I went up the iron ladder to the gallery atop of it, and I came down again, and I ran and ran back here. I telegraphed both ways. An alarm has been given. Is anything wrong? The answer came back both ways, all well. Resisting the slow touch of a frozen finger tracing out my spine, I showed him how that this figure must be a deception of his sense of sight, and how that figures, originating in disease of the delicate nerves that minister to the functions of the eye, were known to have often troubled patients, some of whom had become conscious of the nature of their affliction, and had even proved it by experiments upon themselves. As to an imaginary cry, said I, do but listen for a moment to the wind in this unnatural valley while we speak so low, and to the wild harp it makes of the telegraph wires. That was all very well, he returned, after we had sat listening for a while, and he ought to know something of the wind and the wires. He who so often passed long winter nights here, alone and watching, but he would beg to remark that he had not finished. I asked his pardon, and he slowly added these words, touching my arm. Within six hours after the appearance, the memorable accident on this line happened, and within ten hours, the dead and wounded were brought along through the tunnel over the spot where the figure had stood. A disagreeable shudder crept over me, but I did my best against it. It was not to be denied, I rejoined, that this was a remarkable coincidence, calculated deeply to impress his mind. But it was unquestionable that remarkable coincidences did continually occur, and that they must be taken into account in dealing with such a subject. Though to be sure, I must admit, I added, for I thought I saw that he was going to bring the objection to bear upon me. Men of common sense did not allow much for coincidences in making the ordinary calculations of life. He again begged to remark that he had not finished. I again begged for his pardon for being betrayed into interruptions. This, he said, again laying his hand upon my arm and glancing over his shoulder with hollow eyes, was just a year ago. Six or seven months passed, and I had recovered from the surprise and shock when one morning, as the day was breaking, I, standing at the door, looked towards the red light and saw the spectre again. He stopped with a fixed look at me. Did it cry out? No, it was silent. Did it wave its arm? No, it leaned against the shaft of the light with both hands before the face, like this. Once more, I followed his actions with my eyes. It was an action of mourning. I have seen such an attitude in, st in stone figures on tombs. Did you go up to it? I came in and sat down, partly to collect my thoughts, partly because it had turned me faint. When I went to the door again, daylight was above me and the ghost was gone. But nothing followed. Nothing came of this. He touched me on the arm with his forefinger twice or thrice, giving a ghastly nod each time. That very day, 
as a train came out of the tunnel, I noticed at a carriage window on my side what looked like a confusion of hands and heads and something waved. I saw it just in time to signal the driver, stop! He shut off and put his brake on, but the train drifted past here a hundred and fifty yards or more. I ran after it, and as I went along, heard terrible screams and cries. A beautiful young lady had died instantaneously in one of the compartments and was brought in here and laid down on this floor between us. Involuntarily, I pushed my chair back as I looked from the boards at which he pointed to himself. True, sir, true. Precisely as it happened, so I tell it to you. I could think of nothing to say to any purpose and my mouth was very dry. The wind and the wires took up the story with a long, lamenting wail. He resumed, Now, sir, mark this and judge how my mind is troubled. The spectre came back a week ago. Ever since, it has been there, now and again, by fits and starts. At the danger light. What does it seem to do? He repeated, if possible, with increased passion and vehemence, that former gesticulation of, For God's sake, clear the way. Then he went on, I have no peace or rest for it. It calls to me for many minutes together in an agonized manner. Below there, look out, look out. It stands waving to me. It rings my little bell. I caught at that. Did it ring your bell yesterday evening when I was here and you went to the door? Twice. Why see, said I, how your imagination misleads you. My eyes were on the bell and my ears were open to the bell. And if I am a living man, it did not ring at those times. No, nor at any other time except when it was rung in the natural course of physical things by the station communicating with you. He shook his head. I have never made a mistake as to that yet, sir. I have never confused the spectre's ring with the man's. The ghost's ring is a strange vibration in the bell that it derives from nothing else, and I have not asserted that the bell stirs to the eye. I don't wonder that you failed to hear it, but I heard it. And did the spectre seem to be there when you looked out? It was there. Both times, he repeated firmly, both times. Will you come to the door with me and look for it now? He bit his underlip as though he were somewhat unwilling, but arose. I opened the door and stood on the step while he stood in the doorway. There was the danger light. There was the dismal mouth of the tunnel. There were the high, wet stone walls of the cutting. There were the stars above them. Do you see it? I asked him, taking particular note of his face. His eyes were prominent and strained, but not very much more so, perhaps, than my own had been when I had directed them earnestly towards the same spot. No, he answered. It is not there. Agreed, said I. We went in again, shut the door, and resumed our seats. I was thinking how best to improve this advantage if it might be called one, when he took up the conversation in such a matter-of-course way, so assuming that there could be no serious question of fact between us, that I felt myself placed in the weakest of positions. By this time, you will fully understand, sir, he said, that what troubles me so dreadfully is the question, what does the spectre mean? I was not sure, I told him, that I did fully understand. What is its warning against, he said, ruminating with his eyes on the fire and only by times turning them on me. What is the danger? Where is the danger? There is danger overhanging somewhere on the line. Some dreadful calamity will happen. It is not to be doubted this third time after what has gone before, but surely this is a cruel haunting of me. What can I do? He pulled out his handkerchief and wiped the drops from his heated forehead. If I telegraph danger on either side of me or on both, I can give no reason for it, 
he went on, wiping the palms of his hands. I should get into trouble and do no good. They would think I was mad. This is the way it would work. Message. Danger. Take care. Answer. What danger? Where? Message. Don't know. But for God's sake, take care. They would displace me. What else could they do? His pain of mind was most pitiable to see. It was the mental torture of a conscientious man, oppressed beyond endurance by an unintelligible responsibility involving life. When it first stood under the danger light, he went on, putting his dark hair back from his head and drawing his hand outward across and across his temples in an extremity of feverish distress. Why not tell me where that accident was to happen? If it must happen, why not tell me how it could be averted, if it could have been averted? When on its second coming it hid its face, why not tell me instead? She is going to die. Let them keep her at home. If it came on those two occasions, only to show me that its warnings were true, and so to prepare me for the third, why not warn me plainly? And I, Lord help me, a mere poor signal man on its on this solitary station. Why not go to somebody with credit to be believed and power to act? When I saw him in this state, I saw that for the poor man's sake, as well as for the public safety, what I had to do for the time was to compose his mind. Therefore, setting aside all question of reality or unreality between us, I represented to him what whoever thoroughly discharged his duty must do well and that at least it was his comfort that he understood his duty, though he did not understand these confounding appearances. In this effort, I succeeded far better than in the attempt to reason him out of his conviction. He became calm. The occupations incidental to his post as the night advanced began to make larger demands of his attention, and I left him at two in the morning. I had offered to stay through the night, but he would not hear of it. That I, more than once, looked back at the red light as I ascended the pathway, that I did not like the red light, and that I should have slept but poorly if my bed had been under it, I see no reason to conceal. Nor did I like the two sequences of the accident and the dead girl. I see no reason to conceal that either. But what ran most in my thoughts was the consideration how ought I to act. Having become the recipient of this disclosure, I had proved the man to be intelligent, vigilant, painstaking and exact, but how long might he remain so in his state of mind? Though in a subordinate position, but he held a most important trust, and would I, for instance, like to stake my own life on the chances of his continuing to execute it with precision? Unable to overcome a feeling that there would be something treacherous in my communicating what he had told me to his superiors in the company without first being plain with himself and proposing a middle course to him, I ultimately resolved to offer to accompany him, otherwise keeping his secret for the present, to the wisest medical practitioner we could hear of in those parts, and to take his opinion. A change in his time of duty would come round next night, he had apprised me, and he would be off an hour or two after sunrise and on again soon after sunset. I had appointed to return accordingly. Next evening was a lovely evening, and I walked out early to enjoy it. The sun was not yet quite down when I traversed the field path near the top of the deep cutting. I would extend my walk for an hour, I said to myself, half an hour on and half an hour back, and it would then be time to go to my signal man's box. Before pursuing my stroll, I stepped to the brink and mechanically looked for the point from which I had first seen him. I cannot describe the thrill that seized upon me, when close at the mouth of the tunnel, I saw the appearance of a man with his left sleeve across his eyes, passionately waving his right arm. The nameless horror that oppressed me passed in a moment, for in a moment I saw that this appearance of a man was a man indeed, 
and that there was a little group of other men standing at a short distance to whom he seemed to be rehearsing the gesture he made. The danger light was not yet lighted. Against its shaft, a little low hut, entirely new to me, had been made of some wooden supports and tarpaulin. It looked no bigger than a bed. With an irresistible sense that something was wrong, with a flashing self-reproachful fear that fatal mischief had come of my leaving the man there and causing no one to be sent to overlook or correct what he did, I descended the notched path with all the speed I could make. What is the matter? I asked the men. Signalman killed this morning, sir. Not the man belonging to that box? Yes, sir. Not the man I know. You will recognize him, sir, if you knew him, said the man who spoke for the others, solemnly uncovering his own head and raising an end of the tarpaulin, for his face is quite composed. Oh, how did this happen? How did this happen? I asked, turning from one to another as the hut closed in again. He was cut down by an engine, sir. No man in England knew his work better, but somehow he was not clear of the outer rail. It was just at broad day. He had struck the light and had the lamp in his hand. As the engine came out of the tunnel, his back was towards her and she cut him down. That man drove her and was showing how it happened. Show the gentleman, Tom. The man, who wore a rough dark dress, stepped back to his former place at the mouth of the tunnel. Coming round the curve in the tunnel, sir, he said. I saw him at the end, like as if I saw him down a perspective glass. There was no time to check speed and I knew him to be very careful. As he didn't seem to take heed of the whistle, I shut it off when we were running down upon him and called to him as loud as I could. What did you say? I said, below there, look out, look out. For God's sake, clear the way. I started. Ah, oh, it was a dreadful time, sir, and never left off calling to him. I put this arm before my eyes not to see, and I waved this arm to the last. But it was no use. Without prolonging the narrative to dwell on any one of its curious circumstances more than any other, I may, in closing it, point out the coincidences that the warning of the engine driver included, not only the words which the unfortunate signalman had repeated to me as haunting him, but also the words which I myself, not he, had attached and only in my own mind to the gesticulation he had imitated. End of the Signal Man Recording by Shreya Sethi St. John's Eve by Nikolai Gogol This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org St. John's Eve a story told by the sacristan of the Dekanka Church. Toma Grigorovich had one very strange eccentricity. To the day of his death, he never liked to tell the same thing twice. There were times when, if you asked him to relate a thing afresh, he would interpolate new matter or alter it so that it was impossible to recognize it. Once upon a time, one of those gentlemen who, like the usurers at our yearly fairs, clutch and beg and steal every sort of frippery and issue mean little volumes no thicker than an ABC book every month or even every week, wormed this same story out of Toma Grigorovich, and the latter completely forgot about it. But that same young gentleman in the pea-green kaftan came from Poltava, bringing with him a little book, and opening it in the middle, showed it to us. Toma Grigorovich was on the point of setting his spectacles astride of his nose, but recollected that he had forgotten to wind thread about them and stick them together with wax. So he passed it over to me. As I understand nothing about reading and writing, and do not wear spectacles, I undertook to read it. 
I had not turned two leaves when all at once he caught me by the hand and stopped me. Stop! Tell me first what you are reading. I confess that I was a trifle stunned by such a question. What? What am I reading, Toma Grigorovitch? Why, your own words. Who told you that they were my words? Why, what more would you have? Here it is printed, related by such and such a sacristan. Spit on the head of the man who printed that. He lies, the dog of a Moscow peddler. Did I say that? Twas just the same as though one hadn't his wits about him. Listen, I'll tell the tale to you on the spot. We moved up to the table, and he began. My grandfather, the kingdom of heaven be his, may he eat only wheat and rolls and poppy seed cakes with honey in the other world, could tell a story wonderfully well. When he used to begin a tale, you could not stir from the spot all day, but kept on listening. He was not like the storyteller of the present day, with a tongue, as though he had had nothing to eat for three days, so that you snatch your cap and flee from the house. I remember my old mother was alive then, and in the long winter evenings when the frost was crackling out of doors and had sealed up hermetically the narrow panes of our cottage, she used to sit at her wheel, drawing out a long thread in her hand, rocking the cradle with her foot, and humming a song which I seem to hear even now. The lamp quivering and flaring up as though in fear of something lighted up our cottage, the spindle hummed, and all of us children collected in a cluster listened to Grandfather, who had not crawled off the stove for more than five years owing to his great age. But the wondrous tales of the incursions of the Zaporozhian Cossacks and the Poles, the bold deeds of Podgova, of Poltar Kozhuch and Segedachny, did not interest us so much as the stories about some deed of old, which always sent a shiver through our frames and made our hair rise upright on our heads. Sometimes such terror took possession of us in consequence of them, that from that evening forward heaven knows how wonderful everything seemed to us. If one chanced to go out of the cottage after nightfall for anything, one fancied that a visitor from the other world had lain down to sleep in one's bed, and I have often taken my own smock at a distance as it lay at the head of the bed, for the evil one rolled up into a ball. But the chief thing about Grandfather's stories was that he never lied in all his life, and whatever he said was so, was so. I will now tell you one of his wonderful tales. I know that there are a great many wise people who copy in the courts and can even read civil documents, but who, if you were to put into their hand a simple prayer book, could not make out the first letter in it and would show all their teeth in derision. These people laugh at everything you tell them. Along comes one of them and doesn't believe in witches. Yes, glory to God that I have lived so long in the world, I have seen heretics to whom it would be easier to lie in confession than it would be to our brothers and equals to take snuff, and these folk would deny the existence of witches. But let them just dream about something, and they won't even tell what it was. There, it is no use talking about them. No one could have recognized the village of ours a little over a hundred years ago. It was a hamlet, the poorest kind of a hamlet, half a score of miserable farmhouses, unplastered and badly thatched, were scattered here and there about the fields. There was not a yard or decent shed to shelter animals or wagons. That was the way the wealthy lived. And if you had looked for our brothers, the poor, why, a hole in the ground, that was a cabin for you. Only by the smoke could you tell that a God-created man lived there. You ask why they lived so? It was not entirely through poverty. Almost everyone led a raiding Cossack life and gathered not a little plunder in foreign lands. It was rather because it was little use building up a good wooden house. Many folk were engaged in raids all over the country, Crimeans, Poles, Lithuanians. It was quite possible that their own countrymen might make a descent and plunder everything. Anything was possible. 
In this hamlet a man, or rather a devil in human form, often made his appearance. Why he came and whence no one knew. He prowled about, got drunk, and suddenly disappeared as if into the air, leaving no trace of his existence. Then, behold, he seemed to have dropped from the sky again, and when flying about the street of the village of which no trace now remains, and which was not more than a hundred paces from Dikanka, he would collect together all the Cossacks he met. Then there were songs, laughter, and cash in plenty, and vodka flowed like water. He would address the pretty girls, and give them ribbons, earrings, strings of beads, more than they knew what to do with. It is true that the pretty girls rather hesitated about accepting his presence. God knows, perhaps, what unclean hands they had passed through. My grandfather's aunt, who kept at that time a tavern in which Basavriuk, as they called this devil man, often caroused, said that no consideration on the earth would have induced her to accept a gift from him. But then again, how to avoid accepting? Fear seized on every one when he knit his shaggy brows and gave a sidelong glance which might send your feet God knows whither. Whilst if you did accept, then the next night some fiend from the swamp, with horns on his head, came and began to squeeze your neck if there was a string of beads upon it, or bite your finger if there was a ring upon it, or drag you by the hair if ribbons were braided in it. God have mercy, then, on those who held such gifts. But here was the difficulty. It was impossible to get rid of them. If you threw them into the water, the diabolical ring or necklace would skim along the surface and into your hand. There was a church in the village, St. Pantalei, if I remember rightly. There lived there a priest, Father Athanasi, of blessed memory. Observing that Basavriuk did not come to church even at Easter, he determined to reprove him and impose penance upon him. Well, he hardly escaped with his life. Hark ye, sir, he thundered in reply. Learn to mind your own business instead of meddling in other people's if you don't want that throat of yours stuck with boiling kutya. Footnote, kutya, a dish of rice or wheat flour with honey and raisins, which is brought to the church on the celebration of memorial masses. End of footnote. What was to be done with the unrepentant man? Father Athanasi contented himself with announcing that anyone who should make the acquaintance of Basavriuk would be counted a Catholic, an enemy of Christ's Orthodox Church, not a member of the human race. In this village there was a Cossack named Korj, who had a laborer whom people called Peter the Orphan, perhaps because no one remembered either his father or mother. The church elder, it is true, said that they had died of the pest in his second year, but my grandfather's aunt would not hear of that, and tried with all her might to furnish him with parents, although poor Peter needed them about as much as we needed last year's snow. She said that his father had been in Zaporozhye and had been taken prisoner by the Turks, amongst whom he underwent God only knows what tortures, until having, by some miracle, disguised himself as a eunuch, he made his escape. Little cared the black-browed youths and maidens about Peter's parents. They merely remarked that if he only had a new coat, a red sash, a black lambskin cap with a smart blue crown on his head, a Turkish sabre by his side, a whip in one hand and a pipe with handsome mountings in the other, he would surpass all the young men. But the pity was that the only thing poor Peter had was a grey gabardine with more holes in it than there are gold pieces in a Jew's pocket. But that was not the worst of it. Korj had a daughter, such a beauty as I think you can hardly have chance to see. My grandfather's aunt used to say, and you know that it is easier for a woman to kiss the evil one than to call anyone else a beauty, that this Cossack maiden's cheeks were as plump and fresh as the pinkest poppy when, bathed in God's dew, it unfolds its petals and coquettes with the rising sun.
that her brows were evenly arched over her bright eyes like black cords such as are maidens by nowadays for their crosses and ducats off the Moscow peddlers who visit the villages with their baskets, that her little mouth, at sight of which the youths smacked their lips, seemed made to warble the songs of nightingales, that her hair, black as the raven's wing and soft as young flax, fell in curls over her shoulders, for our maidens did not then plait their hair in pigtails interwoven with pretty bright-hued ribbons, Eh, hey, may I never intone another alleluia in the choir if I would not have kissed her in spite of the grey which is making its way through the old wool which covers my pate and of the old woman beside me like a thorn in my side. Well, you know what happens when young men and maidens live side by side. In the twilight the heels of red boots were always visible in the place where Padorka chatted with her Peter. But Korj would never have suspected anything out of the way. Only one day, it is evident that none but the evil one could have inspired him. Peter took into his head to kiss the maiden's rosy lips with all his heart, without first looking well about him. And that same evil one made the son of a dog dream of the Holy Cross, cause the old grey beard like a fool to open the cottage door at that same moment. Korj was petrified, dropped his jaw and clutched at the door for support. Those unlucky kisses completely stunned him. Recovering himself, he took his grandfather's hunting whip from the wall and was about to belabor Peter's back with it when Pedorka's little six-year-old brother Ivas rushed up from somewhere or other and, grasping his father's leg with his little hand, screamed out, Daddy, Daddy, don't beat Peter! What was to be done? A father's heart is not made of stone. Hanging the whip again on the wall, he led Peter quietly from the house. If you ever show yourself in my cottage again, or even under the windows, look out, Peter, for by heaven your black moustache will disappear, and your black locks, though wound twice about your ears, will take leave of your pate, or my name is not Terenti Korj. So saying, he gave him such a taste of his fist in the nape of his neck that all grew dark before Peter, and he flew headlong out of the place. So there was an end of their kissing. Sorrow fell upon our turtle doves, and a rumor grew rife in the village that a certain pole, all embroidered with gold, with moustaches, sabres, spurs, and pockets jingling like the bells of the bag with which our sacristan Taras goes through the church every day, had begun to frequent Korja's house. Now it is well known why a father has visitors when there is a black-browed daughter about. So one day Pedorka burst into tears and caught the hand of her brother Ivas. Ivas, my dear, Ivas, my love, fly to Peter, my child of gold, like an arrow from a bow. Tell him all. I would have loved his brown eyes. I would have kissed his fair face. But my fate decrees otherwise. More than one handkerchief have I wet with burning tears. I am sad and heavy at heart, and my own father is my enemy. I will not marry the Pole, whom I do not love. Tell him they are making ready for a wedding, but there will be no music at our wedding. Priests will sing instead of pipes and vials. I shall not dance with my bridegroom. They will carry me out. Dark, dark will be my dwelling of maple wood, and instead of chimneys, a cross will stand upon the roof. Peter stood petrified, without moving from the spot when the innocent child lisped out Padorka's words to him. And I, wretched man, had thought to go to the Crimea and Turkey to win gold in return to thee, my beauty, but it may not be. We have been overlooked by the evil eye. I too shall have a wedding, dear one, but no ecclesiastics will be present at that wedding. The black crow instead of the pope will caw over me. The bare plain will be my dwelling, the dark blue cloud my roof tree. The eagle will claw out my brown eyes. The rain will wash my Cossack bones, and the whirlwinds dry them. But what am I? Of what should I complain? Tis clear God willed it. So, if I am to be lost, then so be it. And he went straight to the tavern. 
My late grandfather's aunt was somewhat surprised at seeing Peter at the tavern at an hour when good men go to morning mass, and stared at him as though in a dream when he called for a jug of brandy, about half a pailful. But the poor fellow tried in vain to drown his woe. The vodka stung his tongue like nettles and tasted more bitter than wormwood. He flung the jug from him upon the ground. You have sorrowed enough, Cossack, growled a bass voice behind him. He looked round. It was Basavriuk. Ugh, what a face! His hair was like a brush, his eyes like those of a bull. I know what you lack. Here it is. As he spoke, he jingled a leather purse which hung from his girdle and smiled diabolically. Peter shuddered. Ha, ha, ha! How it shines! he roared, shaking out ducats into his hands. Ha, ha, ha! How it jingles! And I only ask one thing for a whole pile of such shiners. It is the evil one, exclaimed Peter. Give me them. I'm ready for anything. They struck hands upon it, and Basavriuk said, You are just in time, Peter. Tomorrow is St. John the Baptist's day. Only on this one night in the year does the fern blossom. I will await you at midnight in the bear's ravine. I do not believe that chickens await the hour when the housewife brings their corn with as much anxiety as Peter awaited the evening. He kept looking to see whether the shadows of the trees were not lengthening, whether the sun was not turning red towards setting, and the longer he watched, the more impatient he grew, how long it was. Evidently God's day had lost its end somewhere, but now the sun has set, the sky is red only on one side, and it is already growing dark. It grows colder in the fields, it gets gloomier and gloomier, and at last quite dark. At last, with heart almost bursting from his bosom, he set out and cautiously made his way down through the thick woods into the deep hollow called the Bear's Ravine. Basavriuk was already waiting there. It was so dark that you could not see a yard before you. Hand in hand they entered the ravine, pushing through the luxuriant thorn bushes and stumbling at almost every step. At last they reached an open spot. Peter looked about him. He had never chanced to come there before. Here Basavrio halted. Do you see before you three hillocks? There are a great many kinds of flowers upon them. May some power keep you from plucking even one of them. But as soon as the fern blossoms, seize it, and look not round, no matter what may seem to be going on behind thee. Peter wanted to ask some questions, but behold, Basavriuk was no longer there. He approached the three hillocks. Where were the flowers? He saw none. The wild steppe grass grew all around and hid everything in its luxuriance. But the lightning flashed, and before him was a whole bed of flowers, all wonderful, all strange, whilst among them there was also the simple fronds of fern. Peter doubted his senses and stood thoughtfully before them, arms akimbo. What manner of prodigy is this? Why... One can see these weeds ten times a day. What is there marvellous about them? Devil's face must be mocking me. But behold, the tiny flower bud of the fern reddened and moved as though alive. It was a marvel in truth. It grew larger and larger and glowed like a burning coal. The tiny stars of light flashed up. Something burst softly, and the flower opened before his eyes, like a flame lighting the others about it. Now is the time, thought Peter, and extended his hand. He saw hundreds of hairy hands reach also for the flower from behind him, and there was a sound of scampering in his rear. He half closed his eyes and plucked sharply at the stalk, and the flower remained in his hand. 
all became still. Upon a stump sat Basavriuk, quite blue like a corpse. He did not move so much as a finger. His eyes were movably fixed on something visible to him alone. His mouth was half open and speechless. Nothing stirred around. Ugh, it was horrible. But then... A whistle was heard which made Peter's heart grow cold within him, and it seemed to him that the grass whispered, and the flowers began to talk among themselves in delicate voices like little silver bells, while the trees rustled in murmuring contention. Basavriuk's face suddenly became full of life, and his eyes sparkled. The witch has just returned, he muttered between his teeth. Hearken, Peter, a charmer will stand before you in a moment. Do whatever she commands. If not, you are lost forever. Then he parted the thorn bushes with a knotty stick, and before him stood a tiny farmhouse. Basavriuk smote it with his fist, and the wall trembled. A large black dog ran out to meet them, and with a whine transformed itself into a cat, and flew straight at his eyes. Don't be angry, you old Satan, said Basavriuk, employing such words as would have made a good man stop his ears. Behold, instead of a cat, an old woman, all bent into a bow, with a face wrinkled like a baked apple, and a nose and chin like a pair of nutcrackers. A fine charmer, thought Peter, and cold chills ran down his back. The witch tore the flower from his hand, stooped, and muttered over it for a long time, sprinkling it with some kind of water. Sparks flew from her mouth, and foam appeared on her lips. Throw it away, she said, giving it back to Peter. Peter threw it, but what wonder was this? The flower did not fall straight to the earth, but for a long while twinkled like a fiery ball through the darkness, and swam through the air like a boat. At last it began to sink lower and lower, and fell so far away that the little star, hardly larger than a poppy seed, was barely visible. There, croaked the old woman in a dull voice, and Basavriuk, giving him a spade, said, Dig here, Peter, you will find more gold than you or Korsh ever dreamed of. Peter spat on his hands, seized the spade, pressed his foot on it, and turned up the earth a second, a third, a fourth time. The spade clinked against something hard and would go no further. Then his eyes began to distinguish a small, iron-bound coffer. He tried to seize it, but the chest began to sink into the earth, deeper, farther, and deeper still, whilst behind him he heard a laugh like a serpent's hiss. No, you shall not have the gold until you shed human blood, said the witch, and she led up to him a child of six, covered with a white sheet, and indicated by a sign that he was to cut off his head. Peter was stunned, a trifle indeed to cut off a man's or even an innocent child's head for no reason whatever. In wrath he tore off the sheet enveloping the victim's head, and behold, before him stood Ivas. The poor child crossed his little hands and hung his head. Peter flew at the witch with the knife like a madman and was on the point of laying hands on her. What did you promise for the girl? thundered Basavriuk, and like a shot he was on his back. The witch stamped her foot. A blue flame flashed from the earth and illumined all within it. The earth became transparent as if moulded of crystal, and all that was within it became visible as if in the palm of the hand. Ducats, precious stones in chests and pots, were piled in heaps beneath the very spot they stood on. Peter's eyes flashed, his mind grew troubled. He grasped the knife like a madman, and the innocent blood spurted into his eyes. Diabolical laughter resounded on all sides. Misshapen monsters flew past him in flocks. The witch, fastening her hands in the headless trunk like a wolf, drank its blood. 
His head whirled, collecting all his strength. He set out to run. Everything grew red before him. The trees seemed steeped in blood and burned and groaned. The sky glowed and threatened. Burning points like lightning flickered before his eyes. Utterly exhausted, he rushed into his miserable hovel and fell to the ground like a log. A death-like sleep overpowered him. Two days and two nights did Peter sleep without once awakening. When he came to himself on the third day, he looked long at all the corners of his hut, but in vain did he endeavor to recollect what had taken place. His memory was like a miser's pocket from which you cannot entice a quarter of a kopeck. Stretching himself, he heard something clash at his feet. He looked. There were two bags of gold. Then only, as if in a dream, he recollected that he had been seeking for treasure and that something had frightened him in the woods. Korge saw the sacks and was mollified. Ah, fine fellow Peter, quite unequaled, yes. And did I not love him? Was he not to me as my own son? And the old fellow repeated this fiction until he wept over it himself. Fedorka began to tell Peter how some passing gypsies had stolen Ivas, but he could not even recall him to such a degree had the devil's influence darkened his mind. There was no reason for delay. The pole was dismissed, and the wedding feast prepared. Rolls were baked, towels and handkerchiefs embroidered. The young people were seated at table. The wedding loaf was cut. Guitars, cymbals, pipes, vials sounded, and pleasure was rife. A wedding in the olden times was not like one of the present day. My grandfather's aunt used to tell how the maidens in festive headdresses of yellow, blue, and pink ribbons, above which they bound gold braid in thin chemisettes, embroidered on all the seams with red silk and strewn with tiny silver flowers in Morocco shoes with high iron heels, danced the Gorlitza as swimmingly as peacocks and as wildly as the whirlwind. How the youths, with their ship-shaped caps upon their heads, the crowns of gold brocade, and two horns projecting one in front and another behind, of the very finest black lambskin, in tunics of the finest blue silk with red borders, stepped forward one by one, their arms akimbo in stately form, and executed the gopak, how the lads, in tall Cossack caps and light cloth gabardines, girt with silver embroidered belts, their short pipes in their teeth, skipped before them and talked nonsense. Even Korge, as he gazed at the young people, could not help getting gay in his old age. Guitar in hand, alternately puffing at his pipe and singing, a brandy glass upon his head, the grey beard began the national dance amid loud shouts from the merrymakers. What will not people devise in merry mood? They even began to disguise their faces till they did not look like human beings, on such occasions one would dress himself as a Jew, another as the devil. They would begin by kissing each other and end by seizing each other by the hair. God be with them, you laughed till you held your sides. They dressed themselves in Turkish and Tartar garments. All upon them glowed like a conflagration, and then they began to joke and play pranks. An amusing thing happened to my grandfather's aunt, who was at this wedding. She was wearing an ample tartar robe, and, wine glass in hand, was entertaining the company. The evil one instigated one man to pour vodka over her from behind. Another, at the same moment, evidently not by accident, struck a light and held it to her. The flame flashed up, and poor aunt, in terror, flung her dress off before them all. Screams, laughter, jests arose as if at a fair. In a word, the old folks could not recall so merry a wedding. Pedorka and Peter began to live like a gentleman and lady. There was plenty of everything, and everything was fine. But honest folk shook their heads when they marked their way of living. 
from the devil no good can come, they unanimously agreed. Whence, except from the tempter of orthodox people, came this wealth? Where else could he have got such a lot of gold from? Why, on the very day that he got rich, did Basavriuk vanish as if into thin air? Say, if you can, that people only imagine things. A month had not passed, and no one would have recognized Peter. He sat in one spot, saying no word to anyone, but continually thinking and seemingly trying to recall something. When Pedorka succeeded in getting him to speak, he appeared to forget himself and would carry on a conversation and even grow cheerful. But if he inadvertently glanced at the sacks, stop, stop, I have forgotten, he would cry, and again plunge into reverie and strive to recall something. Sometimes, when he sat still a long time in one place, it seemed to him as though it were coming, just coming back to mind. But again, all would fade away. It seemed as if he was sitting in the tavern. They brought him vodka. Vodka stung him. Vodka was repulsive to him. Someone came along and struck him on the shoulder, but beyond that everything was veiled in darkness before him. The perspiration would stream down his face, and he would sit exhausted in the same place. What did not Padorka do? She consulted the sorceresses, and they poured out fear and brewed a stomach ache, but all to no avail. Footnote. To pour out fear refers to a practice resorted to in case of fear. When it is desired to know what caused this, melted lead or wax is poured into water, and the object whose form it assumes is the one which frightened the sick person. After this, the fear departs. Sonia Schnitza is brewed for giddiness and pain in the bowels. To this end, a bit of stump is burned, thrown into a jug, and turned upside down into a bowl filled with water, which is placed on the patient's stomach. After an incantation, he is given a spoonful of this water to drink. End of footnote. And so the summer passed. Many a Cossack had mowed and reaped. Many a Cossack, more enterprising than the rest, had set off upon an expedition. Flocks of ducks were already crowding the marshes, but there was not even a hint of improvement. It was red upon the steppes. Ricks of grain, like Cossacks' caps, dotted the fields here and there. On the highway were to be encountered wagons loaded with brushwood and logs. The ground had become more solid, and in places was touched with frost. Already had the snow begun to fall, and the branches of the trees were covered with rime, like rabbit skin. Already on frosty days the robin redbreast hopped about on the snow heaps like a foppish Polish nobleman, and picked out grains of corn and children with huge sticks played hockey upon the ice, while their fathers lay quietly on the stove, issuing forth at intervals with lighted pipes in their lips to growl in regular fashion at the orthodox frost, or to take the air and thresh the grain spread out in the barn. At last the snow began to melt, and the ice slipped away. But Peter remained the same, and the more time went on, the more morose he grew. He sat in the cottage as though nailed to the spot, with the sacks of gold at his feet. He grew averse to companionship, his hair grew long, he became so terrible to look at. And still he thought of but one thing, still he tried to recall something, and got angry and ill-tempered because he could not. Often, rising wildly from his seat, he gesticulated violently and fixed his eyes on something as though desirous of catching it, his lips moving as though desirous of uttering some long-forgotten word, but remaining speechless. Fury would take possession of him. He would gnaw and bite his hands like a man half crazy, and in his vexation would tear out his hair by the handful until, calming down, he would relapse into forgetfulness, as it were, and then would again strive to recall the past and be again seized with fury and fresh tortures. What visitation of God was this? Pedorka! 
was neither dead nor alive. At first it was horrible for her to remain alone with him in the cottage, but in course of time the poor woman grew accustomed to her sorrow. But it was impossible to recognize the Padorka of former days. No blushes, no smiles. She was thin and worn with grief, and had wept her bright eyes away. Once, someone who took pity on her advised her to go to the witch who dwelt in the bear's ravine and enjoyed the reputation of being able to cure every disease in the world. She determined to try that last remedy and finally persuaded the old woman to come to her. This was on St. John's Eve as it chanced. Peter lay insensible on the bench and did not observe the newcomer. Slowly he rose and looked about him. Suddenly he trembled in every limb, as though he were on the scaffold. His hair rose upon his head, and he laughed a laugh that filled Pedorka's heart with fear. I have remembered, remembered, he cried in terrible joy, and swinging a hatchet round his head, he struck at the old woman with all his might. The hatchet penetrated the oaken door. Nearly four inches, the old woman disappeared, and a child of seven, covered in a white sheet, stood in the middle of the cottage. The sheet flew off. Ivas! cried Padorka and ran to him, but the apparition became covered from head to foot with blood and illumined the whole room with red light. She ran into the passage in her terror, but, on recovering herself a little, wished to help Peter. In vain, the door had slammed to behind her, so that she could not open it. People ran up and began to knock. They broke in the door as though there were but one mind among them. The whole cottage was full of smoke, and just in the middle, where Peter had stood, was a heap of ashes, whence smoke was still rising. They flung themselves upon the sacks. Only broken potsherds lay there instead of ducats. The Cossacks stood with staring eyes and open mouths, as if rooted to the earth, not daring to move a hair. Such terror did this wonder inspire in them. I do not remember what happened next. Pedorka made a vow to go upon a pilgrimage, collected the property left by her father, and in a few days it was as if she had never been in the village. Whither she had gone, no one could tell. Officious old women would have dispatched her to the same place whither Peter had gone. But a Cossack from Kiev reported that he had seen in a cloister a nun withered to a mere skeleton who prayed unceasingly. Her fellow villagers recognized her as Pedorka by the tokens that no one heard her utter a word and that she had come on foot and had brought a frame for the picture of God's mother set with such brilliant stones that all were dazzled at the sight. But this was not the end, if you please. On the same day that the evil one made away with Peter, Basavriuk appeared again, but all fled from him. They knew what sort of a being he was, none else than Satan, who had assumed human form in order to unearth treasures. And since treasures do not yield to unclean hands, he seduced the young. That same year, all deserted their earthen huts and collected in a village. But even there, there was no peace on account of that accursed Basavriuk. My late grandfather's aunt said that he was particularly angry with her because she had abandoned her former tavern and tried with all his might to revenge himself upon her. Once the village elders were assembled in the tavern, and, as the saying goes, were arranging the precedence at the table, in the middle of which was placed a small roasted lamb, shame to say, they chattered about this, that, and the other, among the rest about various marvels and strange things. Well, they saw something. It would have been nothing if only one had seen it, but all saw it, and it was this. The sheep raised his head, his goggling eyes became alive and sparkled, and the black bristling mustache, which appeared for one instant, made a significant gesture at those present. 
all at once recognize Basavriuk's countenance in the sheep's head. My grandfather's aunt thought it was on the point of asking for vodka. The worthy elders seized their hats and hastened home. Another time, the church elder himself, who was fond of an occasional private interview with my grandfather's brandy glass, had not succeeded in getting to the bottom twice when he beheld the glass bowing very low to him. Satan take you! Let us make the sign of the cross over you! And the same marvel happened to his better half. She had just begun to mix the dough in a huge kneading trough when suddenly the trough sprang up. Stop! Stop! Where are you going? Putting its arms akimbo with dignity, it went skipping all about the cottage. You may laugh, but it was no laughing matter to our grandfathers. And in vain did Father Athanasi go through all the village with holy water and chase the devil through all the streets with his brush. My late grandfather's aunt long complained that as soon as it was dark, someone came knocking at her door and scratching at the wall. Well, all appears to be quiet now in the place where our village stands, but it was not so very long ago my father was still alive that I remember how a good man could not pass the ruined tavern which a dishonest race had long managed for their own interest. From the smoke-blackened chimneys, smoke poured out in a pillar, and rising high in the air, rolled off like a cap, scattering burning coals over the step. And Satan, the son of a dog should not be mentioned, sobbed so pitifully in his lair that the startled ravens rose in flocks from the neighboring oak wood and flew through the air with wild cries. End of St. John's Eve by Nikolai Gogol. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Terrible Old Man by H. P. Lovecraft. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz. THE TERRIBLE OLD MAN by H. P. Lovecraft It was the design of Angelo Ricci and Joe Zanuck and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on Water Street near the sea, and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble which forms a situation very attractive to men of the professions of Messrs. Ricci, Zanuck, and Silva, for that profession was nothing less dignified than a robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say and think many things about the terrible old man which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricci and his colleagues despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode. He is, in truth, a very strange person, believed to have been a captain of East India clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young, and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal upon the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folks say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, in each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, 
the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations as if in answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Zanuck and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of that new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless gray beard, who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane, and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. They were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow, whom everybody shunned and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his few necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Messrs. Ricci, Zanuck, and Silva selected the night of April 11th for their call. Mr. Ricci and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman, whilst Mr. Zanuck waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street, by the gate in the tall rear wall of their host's grounds. Desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostentatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterward. Messrs. Ricci and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate, and although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of the gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for aged sea captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Messrs. Ricci and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can be easily muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window and heard the terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather-stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Zanuck, as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden and a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Zanuck did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out of that sinister house which loomed so close behind. But when he looked, he did not see what he had expected for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Zanuck had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer 
about the three unidentifiable bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses, and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels, which the tide washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or certain especially inhuman cries, probably of a stray animal or migratory bird, heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. End of the Terrible Old Man Story of the Vanishing Patient by Elia Wilkinson Peedy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Story of the Vanishing Patient There had always been strange stories about the house, but it was a sensible, comfortable sort of a neighborhood, and people took pains to say to one another that there was nothing in these tales. Of course not. Absolutely nothing. How could there be? It was a matter of common remark, however, that, considering the amount of money the Nethertons had spent on the place, it was curious they lived there so little. They were nearly always away, up north in the summer and down south in the winter, and over to Paris or London now and then, and when they did come home it was only to entertain a number of guests from the city. The place was either plunged in gloom or gaiety. The old gardener, who kept house by himself in the cottage at the back of the yard, had things much his own way by far the greater part of the time. Dr. Block and his wife lived next door to the Nethertons, and he and his wife, who were so absurd as to be very happy in each other's company, had the benefit of the beautiful yard. They walked there mornings when the leaves were silvered with dew, and evenings they sat beside the lily pond and listened for the whippoorwill. The doctor's wife moved her room over to that side of the house, which commanded a view of the yard, and thus made the honeysuckles and laurel and clematis and all the masses of tossing greenery her own. Sitting there day after day with her sewing, she speculated about the mystery which hung impalpably yet undeniably over the house. It happened one night, when she and her husband had gone to their room and were congratulating themselves on the fact that he had no very sick patients and was likely to enjoy a good night's rest, that a ring came at the door. If it's anyone wanting you to leave home, warned his wife, you must tell them you are all worn out. You've been disturbed every night this week, and it's too much. The young physician went downstairs. At the door stood a man, whom he had never seen before. "'My wife is lying very ill next door,' said the stranger. "'So ill that I fear she will not live till morning. "'Will you please come to her at once?' "'Next door,' cried the physician. "'I didn't know the Nethertons were home. "'Please hasten,' begged the man. "'I must go back to her. "'Follow as quickly as you can.' "'The doctor went back upstairs to complete his toilet. "'How absurd!' protested his wife when she heard the story. "'There is no one at the Nethertons. "'I sit where I can see the front door, "'and no one can enter without my knowing it, "'and I have been sewing by the window all day. "'If there were anyone in the house, "'the gardener would have the porch lantern lighted. "'It is some plot. "'Someone has designs on you. "'You must not go.' "'But he went. "'As he left the room, his wife placed a revolver in his pocket. "'The great porch of the mansion was dark.' but the physician made out that the door was open, and he entered. A feeble light came from the bronze lamp at the turn of the stairs, and by it he found his way, his feet sinking noiselessly in the rich carpets. At the head of the stairs the man met him. The doctor thought himself a tall man, but the stranger topped him by half a head. He motioned the physician to follow him, and the two went down the hall to the front room. The place was flushed with a rose-colored glow from several lamps. On a silken couch in the midst of pillows lay a woman dying with consumption. She was like a lily, white, shapely, graceful, with feeble yet charming movements. She looked at the doctor appealingly. Then, 
Seen in his eyes the involuntary verdict that her hour was at hand, she turned toward her companion with a glance of anguish. Dr. Block asked a few questions. The man answered them, the woman remaining silent. The physician administered something stimulating, and then wrote a prescription, which he placed on the mantel shelf. The drugstore is closed tonight, he said, and I fear the druggist has gone home. You can have the prescription filled the first thing in the morning, and I will be over before breakfast. After that, there was no reason why he should not have gone home. Yet, oddly enough, he preferred to stay. Nor was it professional anxiety that prompted this delay. He longed to watch those mysterious persons who, almost oblivious of his presence, were speaking their mortal farewells in their glances, which were impassioned and of unutterable sadness. He sat as if fascinated. He watched the glitter of rings on the woman's long white hands. He noted the waving of light hair about her temples. He observed the details of her gown of soft white silk, which fell about her in voluminous folds. Now and then the man gave her of the stimulant which the doctor had provided. Sometimes he bathed her face with water. Once he paced the floor for a moment till a motion of her hand quieted him. After a time, feeling that it would be more sensible and considerate of him to leave, the doctor made his way home. His wife was awake, impatient to hear of his experiences. She listened to his tale in silence, and when he had finished, she turned her face to the wall and made no comment. You seem to be ill, my dear, he said. You have a chill. You are shivering. I have no chill, she replied sharply, but I... Well, you may leave the light burning. The next morning, before breakfast, the doctor crossed the dewy sward to the Netherton house. The front door was locked, and no one answered to his repeated ringings. The old gardener chanced to be cutting the grass near at hand, and he came running up. What you ringing that doorbell for, doctor? said he. The folks ain't come home yet. There ain't nobody there. Yes, there is, Jim. I was called here last night. A man came for me to attend his wife. They must both have fallen asleep that the bell is not answered. I wouldn't be surprised to find her dead, as a matter of fact. She was a desperately sick woman. Perhaps she is dead and something has happened to him. You have the key to the door, Jim. Let me in. But the old man was shaking in every limb and refused to do as he was bid. Don't you never go in there, doctor, whispered he with chattering teeth. Don't you go for to tend no one. You just come tell me when you sent for that way. No, I ain't going in, doctor, no how. It ain't part of my duties to go in. That's been stipulated by Mr. Netherton. It's my business to look after the garden. Argument was useless. Dr. Block took the bunch of keys from the old man's pocket and himself unlocked the front door and entered. He mounted the steps and made his way to the upper room. There was no evidence of occupancy. The place was silent, and so far as living creature went, vacant. The dust lay over everything. It covered the delicate damask of the sofa where he had seen the dying woman. It rested on the pillows. The place smelled musty and evil, as if it had not been used for a long time. The lamps of the room held not a drop of oil, but on the mantel shelf was the prescription which the doctor had written the night before. He read it, folded it, and put it in his pocket. As he locked the outside door, the old gardener came running to him. Don't you never go up there again, will you? he pleaded. Not unless you see all the Netherton's home and I come for you myself. You won't, doctor? No, said the doctor. When he told his wife, she kissed him and said, Next time when I tell you to stay at home, you must stay. End of Story of the Vanishing Patient by Elia Wilkinson Peaty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The White Dog by Fyodor Sologub. Translated by John Kornos. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The White Dog. Everything grew irksome for Alexandra Ivanovna in the workshop of this out-of-the-way town. The patterns, the clatter of machines, the complaints of the customers. It was the shop in which she had served as apprentice, and now for several years as cutter. Everything irritated Alexandra Ivanovna. She quarreled with everyone and abused the innocent apprentice. 
among others to suffer from her outbursts of temper was Tanechka, the youngest of the seamstresses, who only lately had been an apprentice. In the beginning, Tanechka submitted to her abuse in silence. In the end, she revolted and, addressing herself to her assailant, said quite calmly and affably, so that everyone laughed, Alexandra Ivanovna, you are a downright dog. Alexandra Ivanovna felt humiliated. You are a dog yourself, she exclaimed. Tanechka sat there sewing. She paused now and then from her work and said in a calm, deliberate manner, You always whine. Certainly you are a dog. You have a dog's snout and a dog's ears and a wagging tail. The mistress will soon drive you out of doors because you are the most detestable of dogs, a poodle. Tanechka was a young, plump, rosy-cheeked girl with an innocent, good-natured face, which revealed, however, a trace of cunning. She sat there so demure, barefooted, still dressed in her apprentice clothes. Her eyes were clear, and her brows were highly arched on her fine, curved, white forehead, framed by straight, dark chestnut hair, which in the distance looked black. Tanechka's voice was clear, even, sweet, insinuating, and if one could have heard its sound only and not given heed to the words, it would have given the impression that she was paying Alexandra Ivanovna compliments. The other seamstresses laughed, the apprentices chuckled, they covered their faces with their black aprons and cast side glances at Alexandra Ivanovna. As for Alexandra Ivanovna, she was livid with rage. Wretch, she exclaimed, I will pull your ears for you. I won't leave a hair on your head. Tanechka replied in a gentle voice, The paws are a trifle short. The poodle bites as well as barks. It may be necessary to buy a muzzle. Alexandra Ivanovna made a movement toward Tanechka, but before Tanechka had time to lay aside her work and get up, the mistress of the establishment, a large, serious-looking woman, entered rustling her dress. She said sternly, Alexandra Ivanovna, what do you mean by making such a fuss? Alexandra Ivanovna, much agitated, replied, Irina Petrovna, I wish you would forbid her to call me a dog. Tanechka in her turn complained, She is always snarling at something or other, always quibbling at the smallest trifles. But the mistress looked at her sternly and said, Tanechka, I can see through you. Are you sure you didn't begin? You needn't think that because you are a seamstress now you are an important person. If it weren't for your mother's sake, Tanechka grew red but preserved her innocent and affable manner. She addressed her mistress in a subdued voice. Forgive me, Irina Petrovna. I will not do it again, but it wasn't altogether my fault. Alexandra Ivanovna returned home almost ill with rage. Tanechka had guessed her weakness. A dog. Well, then I am a dog, thought Alexandra Ivanovna, but it is none of her affair. Have I looked to see whether she is a serpent or a fox? It is easy to find one out, but why make a fuss about it? Is a dog worse than any other animal? The clear summer night languished inside. A soft breeze from the adjacent fields occasionally blew down the peaceful streets. The moon rose clear and full, that very same moon which rose long ago at another place, over the broad desolate steppe, the home of the wild, of those who ran free and whined in their ancient earthly travail, the very same as then and in that region. And now, as then, glowed eyes sick with longing, and her heart, still wild, not forgetting in town the great spaciousness of the steppe, felt oppressed. Her throat was troubled with a tormenting desire to howl like a wild thing. She was about to undress, but what was the use? She could not sleep anyway. She went into the passage. The warm planks of the floor bent and creaked under her, and small shavings and sand which covered them tickled her feet not unpleasantly. She went out on the doorstep. There sat the babushka Stepanida, a black figure in her black shawl, gaunt and shriveled. She sat with her head bent, and it seemed as though she were warming herself in the rays of the cold moon. Alexandra Ivanovna sat down beside her. She kept looking at the old woman sideways. The large curved nose of her companion seemed to her like the beak of an old bird. A crow? Alexandra Ivanovna asked herself. She smiled, forgetting for the moment her longing and her fears. 
Shrewd as the eyes of a dog, her own lighted up with the joy of her discovery. In the pale green light of the moon, the wrinkles of her faded face became altogether invisible, and she seemed once more young and merry and light-hearted, just as she was ten years ago, when the moon had not yet called upon her to bark and bay of nights before the windows of the dark bathhouse. She moved closer to the old woman and said affably, Babushka Stepanida, there's something I have been wanting to ask you. The old woman turned to her, her dark face furrowed with wrinkles, and asked in a sharp, oldish voice that sounded like a call, Well, my dear, go ahead and ask. Alexandra Ivanovna gave a repressed laugh. Her thin shoulders suddenly trembled from a chill that ran down her spine. She spoke very quietly. Babushka Stepanida, it seems to me, tell me, is it true, I don't know how exactly to put it, but you, Babushka, please don't take offense. It is not from malice that I... Go on, my dear, never fear, say it, said the old woman. She looked at Alexandra Ivanovna with glowing, penetrating eyes. It seems to me, Babushka, please now, don't take offense, as though you, Babushka, were a crow. The old woman turned away. She was silent and merely nodded her head. She had the appearance of one who had recalled something. Her head, with its sharply outlined nose, bowed and nodded, and at last it seemed to Alexandra Ivanovna that the old woman was dozing, dozing and mumbling something under her nose, nodding her head and mumbling some old forgotten words, old magic words. An intense quiet reigned out of doors. It was neither light nor dark, and everything seemed bewitched with the inarticulate mumbling of old forgotten words. Everything languished and seemed lost in apathy. Again a longing oppressed her heart, and it was neither a dream nor an illusion. A thousand perfumes, imperceptible by day, became subtly distinguishable, and they recalled something ancient and primitive, something forgotten in the long ages. In a barely audible voice, the old woman mumbled, Yes, I am a crow, only I have no wings. But there are times when I call, and I call, and tell of woe. And I am given to forebodings, my dear. Each time I have one, I simply must call. People are not particularly anxious to hear me. And when I see a doomed person, I have such a strong desire to call. The old woman suddenly made a sweeping movement with her arms, and in a shrill voice cried out twice, Car! Car! Alexandra Ivanovna shuddered and asked, Babushka, at whom are you calling? The old woman answered, At you, my dear, at you. It had become too painful to sit with the old woman any longer. Alexandra Ivanovna went to her own room. She sat down before the open window and listened to two voices at the gate. It simply won't stop whining, said a low and harsh voice. And uncle, did you see? asked an agreeably young tenor. Alexandra Ivanovna recognized in this last the voice of the curly-headed, somewhat red, freckled-faced lad who lived in the same court. A brief and depressing silence followed. Then she heard a hoarse and harsh voice say suddenly, Yes, I saw. It's very large and white, lies near the bathhouse, and bays at the moon. The voice gave her an image of the man, of his shovel-shaped beard, his low, furrowed forehead, his small, piggish eyes, and his spread-out fat legs. "'And why does it bay, uncle?' asked the agreeable voice. And again the hoarse voice did not reply at once. "'Certainly to no good purpose, and where it came from is more than I can say.' "'Do you think, uncle, it may be a werewolf?' asked the agreeable voice. I should not advise you to investigate, replied the hoarse voice. She could not quite understand what these words implied, nor did she wish to think of them. She did not feel inclined to listen further. What was the sound and significance of human words to her? The moon looked straight into her face and persistently called her and tormented her. Her heart was restless with a dark longing, and she could not sit still. 
Alexandra Ivanovna quickly undressed herself. Naked, all white, she silently stole through the passage. She then opened the outer door. There was no one on the step or outside, and ran quickly across the court and the vegetable garden, and reached the bathhouse. The sharp contact of her body with the cold air and her feet with the cold ground gave her pleasure, but soon her body was warm. She lay down in the grass on her stomach, then, raising herself on her elbows, she lifted her face toward the pale brooding moon and gave a long, drawn-out whine. Listen, uncle, it is whining, said the curly-haired lad at the gate. The agreeable tenor voice trembled perceptibly. Whining again, the accursed one, said the hoarse, harsh voice slowly. They rose from the bench. The gate latch clicked. They went silently across the courtyard and the vegetable garden, the two of them. The old man, black-bearded and powerful, walked in front, a gun in his hand. The curly-headed lad followed tremblingly and looked constantly behind. Near the bathhouse, in the grass, lay a huge white dog, whining piteously. Its head, black on the crown, was raised to the moon, which pursued its way in the cold sky. Its hind legs were strangely thrown back, while the front ones, firm and straight, pressed hard against the ground. In the pale green and unreal light of the moon, it seemed enormous. So huge a dog was surely never seen on earth. It was thick and fat, the black spot which began at the head and stretched in uneven strands down the entire spine seemed like a woman's loosened hair. No tail was visible, presumably it was turned under. The fur on the body was so short that in the distance the dog seemed wholly naked, and its hide shone dimly in the moonlight, so that altogether it resembled the body of a nude woman who lay in the grass and bayed at the moon. The man with the black beard took aim. The curly-haired lad crossed himself and mumbled something. The discharge of a rifle sounded in the night air. The dog gave a groan, jumped up on its hind legs, became a naked woman who, her body covered with blood, started to run, all the while groaning, weeping, and raising cries of distress. The black-bearded one and the curly-haired one threw themselves in the grass and began to moan in wild terror. End of the White Dog by Fyodor Sologub, translated by John Kurnos. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.